Good morning, members, officers, and also members of the public who may be viewing this on the live stream. Welcome to this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. I'm Councillor Peter Fane, and I'm chair of the committee. Um, I'm just going to go through what you might call the small print, so bear with me. Um, just to point out that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, uh, may be broadcast at some point, so you might bear that in mind. The camera follows the microphone being switched on. So, uh, councillors and officers, if you would wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. Obviously, if the fire alarm sounds, please leave the chamber, make your way down the stairs, not the lift, and the safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite halfway along the business park. Um, for those participating in the meeting via the live stream, uh, please could you indicate if you wish to speak via the chat column. Please don't use the chat column for other purposes. Um, obviously make sure your device is fully charged. Switch your microphone and camera off unless you're invited to do otherwise. Um, and make sure you've switched off or silenced any other devices. Um, you may like to use a headset, a headset if available. Um, when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. And when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Uh, obviously, speak slowly and clearly. And please do not talk over or interrupt anyone else. Um, note that if we need to vote on any item, we'll do so via the electronic voting system. Um, using the, uh, the button on your microphones. Um, only those present in the chamber can vote, um, and similarly only members present can propose or second recommendations. Um, for those present in the chamber, I'll now invite each of you to introduce yourselves. So members, after I call your name, please. Uh, for those at home, turn on your camera and microphone. Uh, as I said earlier, my name Peter Fane. I'm member for Shelford Ward. Uh, my vice chair is Councillor Henry Batchelor. Morning, chair. Morning, everyone. Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for Linton and vice chair of the committee. Uh, and then other members, if you would just introduce yourselves, Councillor Anna Bradnam. Good morning. Um, I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam, and I'm one of the three um, members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Uh, um, full stop here as a substitute for, and Eileen, for Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you. And Councillor Dr Martin Kahn. Um, hello, I'm Councillor Martin Kahn. I'm one of the three members for Hisson, Impington and Orchard Park. Councillor Joes Hales. Good morning, Chair. Yeah, Councillor Joes Hales, uh, one of the councillors from Melbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr Jimmy Hawkins. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Jimmy Hawkins, Caldicott Ward. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Morning, everyone. I'm Councillor Jeff Harvey, and I'm the member for Borsham Ward. Uh, Councillor Brian Milnes. Good morning, Chair. Suspiciously loud Brian Milnes from Swordston. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, Foxton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Morning, Heather Williams. I represent the Mordens Ward. And Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I represent uh, Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton. And just in case it wasn't obvious, I was inviting members to introduce themselves in alphabetical order, not in any other order. Uh, are there any other members present, please, or present online? And I can confirm the meeting is quorate. Um, we also have three officers in the chamber. Stephen Kelly. Uh, good morning, everyone. Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development. Stephen Reed, our senior planning lawyer. Morning, Chair. Morning, members and Michael Sexton, Area Development Manager. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. And our Democratic Services Officer is here in the building, but is joining us virtually. Lawrence, uh, please introduce yourself. 
Chair, good morning, everyone. Yeah, Lawrence Damari Hoban, Democratic Services Officer. Thank you. Now, if at any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make that known to me, or my Vice Chair, so that can be recorded in the minutes? I intend that we should break for 15 minutes at um, 11.45, uh, and if the meeting is still going on, uh, break again this afternoon at 3.45, and we have a, a 45-minute break for lunch at about 1.30, if that would be convenient for members. Um, hopefully, members will have the main agenda pack dated 5th of April and the online agenda supplements. Uh, that should include the, the plans pack supplement dated 6th of April and a supplement also for item 5 as listed Sawston, um, also dated 6th of April. Members should also have received two documents from Linton Parish Council. Uh, if you haven't received these various documents, uh, do indicate and uh, printed copies will be available. And officers and uh, officers will introduce those in their in introducing the items later. Um, members, we have a, a big agenda today, and I propose to um, alter the the running order of today's meeting. Um, what I'm going to propose is that we hear items 12 and 13, which are the two Linton applications, immediately after we've dealt with item six. Um, so items 12 and 13 in our agendas would become seven and eight. Uh, that's for the convenience of uh, a lot of people who are following or contributing to our, uh, to our work today. Do I have a seconder for that, please? Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Henry Batchelor seconded that. Can we agree that by affirmation or do members? Thank you very much. Right. Um, apologies. Uh, apologies for absence. Uh, Lawrence, um, are there any apologies for absence today, please? Yes, Chair, we have three apologies for absence today. Uh, apologies have been received from Councillors Pippa Halings, Eileen Wilson, and Judith Ripper with Councillors Hales, Bradnam and Milnes kindly substituting for us today. Thank you. And then declarations of interest. Do any members have any interest to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? Um, Councillor Hales. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah it's uh, agenda item number nine. And um, having taken advice, I will be leaving the chamber. Right. Um, I think Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. Though I'm the member for Borsham Ward, I'm actually a resident of Abington, so um, in relation to item six, but I've had no discussions on that. And I come to the matter of fresh. That's a declaration of interest. Councillor Martin Khan. Um, in regard to the uh, Item eight, former bishop's site. My wife is on the parish council in um, in his tenure in Pinkton. Um, uh, she may have been involved in the planning committee. I don't know, but there have been no discussions on this, and I come to the matter afresh. I'm just going around the room in that order, sir. Councillor Brown Mills. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, in reference to um, item five, um, Lambda uh, Playground Road, Salston. I'm a parish councillor um, for Salston. Um, and local member for Salton, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I would just like to state that I come to this matter afresh this morning. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm local member for some of the um, applications or the appeals on item 15, of which I have had conversations with officers with, but it's not a decision-making um, item. And I think, Councillor Toomey Hawkins, were you indicating? Thank you, Chair. Just a clarification, item seven, uh, the Childelia estate applicant is Mr. Hawkins. No represent, no relationship whatsoever. Just clarifying. And I think Councillor Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. Item number six, Grant of Park in Great Abington. I'm the local member and have had uh, visits to Grant of Park as local member, but that will in no way affect my decision today. Thank you. Right. Thank you, members. 
Oh, one more, sorry, missed you. Just to clarify, my wife is on a trip, a coach at the moment, coming back from Poland. I've clarified with her she was not on the planning committee to deal with this, uh, this particular application when it came to. Thank you. Right, uh, minutes of previous meetings. We have a number of minutes um, to deal with today. Starting with our meeting on 28th of January. Um, Yes, we'll start with the 19th of January, quite right, which is on page one of your agenda. Uh, do members agree that that is a correct record of the meeting? Agreed? Thank you. Um, and then we'll move on to the minutes of the meeting on 28th of January, um, on page nine of your agendas. Uh, has everyone agreed that is a correct record? Councillor Bradnam. I will, uh, so, Chair, I will abstain because okay. I didn't attend that meeting. But otherwise, can we take that by affirmation? Thank you. Uh, then, 9th of February, on page 15 of your agendas, your papers. Um, Does everyone agree that that is a correct record? Councillor Bradman. Understood. Um, with the exception of Councillor Bradman, can we take that by affirmation? Those minutes are approved. Um, and then we come, I think, to the minutes of the meeting on 9th of March on page 27 of your agenda. Um, I think I may have missed some, have I? 28th of February, yes. 28. Page 21, quite right, thank you. Um, yes, so the minutes of the meeting on 28th of February on page 21 of your agendas. Agreed. Agreed? Councillor. Thank, thank you, Chair. It's just, just uh, a point relating to um, item 12, which is the, uh, the one that was done in the closed session. Just in the interest of uh, sorry, so can I just clarify that the minutes of the meeting held in closed session... I'm not going to mention anything. We're going to come yeah, to those yeah. at the end of it. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, sorry, carry on. All oh, right, yeah, I wasn't going to mention anything about that. I was just going to mention the, the public part of the minutes. Um, Which date? It's this 9th of March, last right. one we did. Uh, we're just doing 28th February, I think, at the moment. Can you come to the moment? Oh, sorry, I thought we were on March. Well, let's do 28th February again if we haven't already done it. Oh, sorry. Take the my, my apologies, Chair, my apologies. I'm too far ahead. You're usually ahead of us, that's all right. Um, so, can I take the that we approve the minutes of the meeting on 28th of March? Are we all Agreed. happy to agree that? Thank you. And now we come to the minutes of the meeting on 9th of March. Councillor Richard Williams, yes. Yes, sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, just on item 12, um, I wanted to propose really to see how the committee would feel about putting the reference um, for the planning appeal that we were talking about in the public part of the minutes. Because when we go into closed session in other committees, we do usually give some indication of the nature of the business to be transacted. Um, so I wondered if, in the interest of some transparency, we could just put the reference number for the planning application um, under item 12 in the public part. Because I understand that the yes, details have already been publicly disclosed. I haven't seen it myself. But so I'm, the point you're making is, can we at least say in what, relation to which case yeah. we agreed to... Um, yeah, well, the director says there's no problem with that. So shall we, can we all agree, Dr. Hawkins? Chair, I was not at that meeting, so right. I'm abstaining. Right. And I was not at that meeting, so I'll We seem to have uh, lots of abstentions in relation to past minutes coming, meetings coming up. Councillor, uh, Councillor Harvey. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I do think it's recorded here that I had to leave um, at short notice at lunchtime um, on page 32, um, at the bottom of the first section, it says Councillor Jeff Harvey did not vote. Um, so it's actually technically incorrect because I wasn't any longer in the meeting. Do you want the minutes to be correct to reflect that, or are you happy that that fact is, is, is actually recorded in sufficient detail here? Um, yeah, I think I'm happy with that. So everyone else is. Right. 
Having taken those uh, points into account, uh, can we all agree to the proposal by Dr. Richard Williams? Do we need a second? Uh, from, uh, yeah, there we are. Um, can we take that by affirmation? Good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sorry, Chair, but with the abstentions of myself and my group, thank We've you. We've noted that, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you. And it, this might need to be checked, but just to, um, in the interest of um, Councillor Claire, Dr. Claire Daunton, I believe she didn't vote as opposed to abstained. Um, oh. That might need to be checked. Okay, well, I'm sure that the committee would agree to that being corrected if necessary, uh, or left as it is if, if Councillor Daunton. Thank you for that suggestion. Right. Okay, I think we're now in a position to move on to the main body of the meeting. Um, so that brings us to item five on your agendas, which is on page 33 onwards, uh, land south of Babram Road in Sawston, uh, reference 2103955 for application. Um, this is a proposal for the erection of 280 dwellings, including the 72 affordable dwellings and other matters. Um, applicant is Red Row Homes. The key material considerations are set out on your agenda. And the decision is due by 15th of April. There is, in fact, a, an extension if that were needed. Um, so on this, the uh, case officer is... Michael Sexton, am I right? Right. Mr. Sexton, please uh, lead us through this if you would. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's no updates on this application, so I'll fly straight into the presentation. Excellent. So, yes, this is a full planning application for the erection of 280 dwellings, um, including 72 affordable units, um, associated uh, accesses pedestrian and cycle access, open space, uh, landscaping, um, service water drainage and infrastructure, land south of Baven Road in Sawston. Um, this is uh, the site location plan, so we're on the eastern edge um, of Sawston, and the site is one of the council's housing allocations in the local plan. It is uh, H1C um, to the south of Baven Road, and as you can see from the aerial photograph, um, you've got H1B to the north, which is currently under development. Um, the housing allocation for H1C was to 260 dwellings. The developer has come forward with 280 dwellings, but there's, there's absolutely no issues in that increase, um, particularly noting that H1B to the north was allocated for 80 and, in fact, delivered um, 158 dwellings. Um, just for context, that is the approved site layout plan for land to the north, um, with the application site before members uh, to the south. For a bit of context, um, a few Google Street views. This is uh, Baven Road looking towards and across the existing site towards the existing village edge here. Um, and then this is the junction of at Dales Manor Business Park looking down towards Linton Way. And you have the application site sitting in this part of land here. Um, and Linton Way Recreation Grounds um, to the right hand side. Um, this is a view from Stanley Webb Close, which is some of the existing development to the west of the site. Um, the former development around the area is typically two-storey detached and semi-detached and terrace properties. Um, and there's a view through to the application site, and this is one of the potential points of connection um, from the site. And again, to the, the so, uh, image on the bottom is a view along Plantation Road looking across to the site beyond, and you can see the prevailing form of development. Um, so the site plan, um, so there are 280 dwellings laid out. Um, the site comprises three character areas which help add um, identity to the site and seeks to respond to the source and village design guide. Um, we've been through extensive engagement with the developer and, and the parish council and a range of amendments and um, satisfied that the, the layout is responsive to the village design guide and there is a condition for materials which will further enhance that response. In terms of the indicative tenure of affordable housing, there are going to be 72 affordable houses delivered as part of this site, which is a 26% provision. That is obviously less than the 40% that is required by local plan policy. But there are material planning reasons for that, which I've set out in the report in a sort of complicated mathematical 
formula because the previous exception sites um, to the west here, there was a section 106 that said if any of this land here comes forward for housing, then these are counted towards the affordable contribution. So there's a material reason, um, and officers are satisfied that the 72 affordable units um, are the appropriate number to come forward. Um, this is a, a master plan just to show how it responds. There are some key assets out in the re report, some key parts of housing allocation that the site had to have a strong eastern landscape buffer to obviously soften the impact of development on the edge of the village, which has been incorporated. The vehicular accesses are, are solely from Bayburn Road with pedestrian and uh, cycle accesses to the west to add connectivity to the site. Um, you can see the existing public rights of way denoted in, in the blue line and how the site seeks to connect into those through the new and enhanced routes, again, secured by condition in consultation with the County Council. Um, we have a central leap area um, you know, towards the north of the site and a, a lap towards the south. Um, because the site is over 200 dwellings, uh, it's technically required to provide um, a NEEP, a neighbourhood equipped area of play, but because such an area already exists on Linton Way Recreation Ground, um, we are looking at an off-site contribution to enhance that area because it is within the guided walking distances that was agreed with Sawston Parish Council. Um, again, this just shows a landscape strategy, which I've already touched on. You have the strong um, eastern and southern boundaries to the site, um, some attenuation basins with strong landscaping around, and as you can see, a range of trees planted down the key avenues of the site, so a lot of additional planting going in. Um, just a few house type examples, just to show the prevailing scale is, is a two story development with the, uh, a three or four, two and a half story and some single story ancillary buildings. Um, unfortunately, these are in black and white, but clearly there will be a mixture of materials, a palette of materials of brick and render and slates, etc., coming forward, which we will have secured through condition to be submitted. Um, but it's really just to give you a, a context of the house types. There's a range of house types on the site, as you'd expect for 280 dwellings. Um, and there are some maze nets as well. Um, so key material considerations are as set out in the report, so I won't spend too long. Officers are satisfied that the proposal um, is acceptable in principle and it accords with the specific um, development requirements set out in the policy. Um, housing provision, um, we, we have the appropriate mix of market housing um, and affordable housing on the sites. Character landscape is, is responsive and in line with the village design guide of Sawston. Biodiversity, there will be a net gain of 4.65% delivered on the site uh, with some off-site enhancements around the edge. Um, as we noted, block trees being planted. Uh, flood risk and drainage is all agreed with the lead local flood authority and secured by condition. Highway safety, uh, again, all the, in consultation with the technical quantities is being satisfied. Um, residential immunity um, is appropriate for the future occupiers and the existing occupiers adjacent to the site. Uh, renewables, again, secured by condition. Open space provision is in line with policy. There are a raft of developer contributions which are set out in paragraphs 280 to 296 of the report, and that covers contributions towards education, highways, um, infrastructure, community facilities, um, and they will all be secured by way of a section 106, which would um, sit alongside any consent. Um, that's it from me, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members, because of the nature of some of the um, proposals we will be discussing today, I'm proposing a slight change in procedure within Chairman's discretion. We normally take any questions to case officers later at the start of the debate, but I think um, it would be helpful today if we could take them while the slides are up and so on, not so much in relation to this application, you'll see the purpose of this later, that may encourage us all to um, separate out the, the questions from the debate, so that when we get to the debate we will be quite clear. Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chair. I have three. Um, one is uh, at page one hundred and uh, page 49, paragraph 106, we have four separate groups of affordable units. And I note that the officers say that they feel this is appropriate dispersion, but it looks quite closely clustered to me. And I wondered what discussions had been had with the developers about possibly diffusing those clusters a bit more. 
through the site and is there any room to do that? The second question is um, about the area of clay, uh, which was up on the slide, the southern area, and it appeared to be a link to, because the off-site provision was going, going to be provided at Linton Recreation Ground, and I wanted to ask what the walking route to that would be, because it looked as if there was a spur path through, but I think that's actually into the back of the school. So I just wanted to be sure there was a short link and they didn't have to go all the way up around the top and then back. Uh, and the other thing, sorry, on the affordable housing was which house types are the affordable housing so that we, if we could be shown that, that would be useful because that would give us an idea of whether if all the house types are very similar, then it won't make any odds that they're together, but we need to be tenure blind. Um, and also, if they, it was a fourth point, and it again relates to the affordable housing, is um, could we just have some narrative around the less than 40% provision and, and why that was deemed okay? Thank you. Michael, are you able to perhaps helpful to bring up a slide in relation to the leak if you can? Yes, I will reshare my Thank presentation. You. So taking the issues in turn, the clustering of affordable housing, that has been subject to extensive discussions with the council's affordable housing team. You'll notice that the key has got John Huntington Charity. That's a, a local provider within the village. They have been involved in those discussions as well. Clearly, there's a need to balance um, dispersing with management. Um, the council's affordable housing team and the John Huntington Charity are, are happy with the layout that has been provided. It is in line with the council's Greater Cambridge Housing Strategy. Um, and the annex that the appendix that looks particularly at the groups of clustering that is appropriate. So officers are fully satisfied that the layout is acceptable. There is a mix of, of tenures. This is an indicative mix. It will be a tenure, sorry. We will be delivering the 70-30 split, but there's ongoing discussions with, again, with the John Huntington's charity about which units they will take. Those discussions are continuing with the affordable housing team. Um, the house types, there is a, a mix of house types. It will be tenure blind. They're built to the same. Um, architectural quality as the rest of the site. So um, obviously it's much more evident when you display a map that, that singles out the affordable units, but in reality, um, they won't be distinguishable, um, notably between them. Um, then you asked about the NEEP. Uh, sorry, uh, um, Councillor Richard. Yeah, sorry, it may be that I'm colorblind, um, but I was just wondering if the officer could indicate with a pointer where the intermediate, the green houses are, because I'm really struggling to see where they are. And, and, and yeah. Um, so there's some green uh, intermediate units in in all the cluster, uh, all the groupings. So in the in the western, there's uh, one unit and two maize nets. Um, then you have uh, potential. I mean, this is indicative. Of, uh, there are still discussions going on with the John Huntington's charity, um, but indicatively, you've got a mix of. Um, intermediate and rented, um, all within the same, uh, each individual clusters. They are dispersed and mixed. Um, apologies, it's, it's an awkward shape of sight to display on the screen for you. Um, that's why I need to be zoomed out. But yes, there's, there's a mixture in, in each of the four groups. The, the point about the justification for going less than 40%. Yes, so that is set out in the report. And I'm not going to try and do that off the cuff because it's quite complicated. We did have pre-application discussions um, and we agreed the methodology with the housing team and the developer and we have and our legal team. We have secured sort of the maximum percentage that can be secured. Um, essentially, and it's in appendix one, um, these existing properties to the west of the site were delivered as rural exception sites back in 2003 and 2004. Within those 106 agreements, um, this sort of southern two-thirds of the site um, was included within the 106 agreement, uh, which stipulated that should any of this land that we're looking at today come forward for housing, then the council would be required to count the provision of the rural exception sites towards the calculation of the affordable housing to be delivered on this site, which is why we have the 26% rather than the 40, but there is, um, you know, material planning reasons and a section 106 agreement that requires that and, and we're all happy officers that, that it's in line with 
What's required by the 106. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. That's very clear. Uh, Councillor Mills, before you ask your question, can I just clarify? I think as local member, you'll be speaking in the debate uh, rather than a separate presentation. Is that right? Thank you for that. Uh, with Councillor Mills at the moment, I think. You have a further question? Uh, no, uh, my question about the leak hasn't yet been answered. Yes, okay. Thank Quite you. right. Uh, can we just see that on the screen here? Yeah. yeah, so hopefully this will help with some clarity. So the LEAP um, locally equipped area play is being provided in the northern parcel. Um, developments of over 200 houses are technically required to provide a neighbourhood equipped area of play, which is aimed at the older. Um, not the older, but the sort of eight to fourteen year old, the, the upper age group of children. There is an existing leap on Linton Way recreation ground. So through pre app discussions with the developer and the parish council, I think the parish council expressed concerns about having two neaps in such close proximity because the walking distance uh, required in our SPD for for a neap is to be within a thousand meters or a fifteen minute walk. So it wasn't deemed appropriate to have two neaps in such close proximity. All of these properties are within that 15 meter walking route. Um, there is a potential route across um, the site at this point here, so people can walk through. There's also potentially, yeah, there will be connections here and to the south. So there's multiple ways um, that residents could go through the western site, or indeed, if you're living up here, you may go up to Faber Road and then across. So it's all within a distance, reasonable distance. And that's why we were satisfied an offsite contribution was appropriate to enhance the existing. Thank you, Mr. Sexton. That, that, seeing that um, connection in the middle makes sense, and, and I was concerned that the other connection appeared to go through the, the school. And I take it that deals with the full range of your questions. Are you right, Councillor Mills? Um, just a couple of questions uh, on housing density. Uh, obviously, slightly more than was originally anticipated. But um, have you got a figure for the housing density? Uh, handy, please. Uh, and the other thing, uh, very cognizant of, at Full Council um, in the last couple of weeks, we've had a um, motion put forward by Councillor Sue Ellington um, about looking after trees. Uh, it's very important to this development to um, maintain a, a barrier or a uh, landscaping with the trees that the officer already mentioned. So I just wondered whether there was any provision in, in the or conditions um, for managing the trees after they're planted so that they can become well established and don't uh, something like the A14 where a lot of the trees that are planted have died doesn't happen here. Thank you. Thank you and through you chair. Uh, in terms of density that's set out in paragraph 73 of the report. Um, 280 dwellings across the 12 hectare site is, is 23 dwellings per hectare, which is obviously slightly lower than our requirement of 30. Once you take out the fact that the site will be providing 2.47 hectares of uh, public accessible open space, um, 280 dwellings across the remaining area is 29 dwellings per hectare. So it's fully in line with the council's policy in that regard. Um, in terms of the management of the trees, there are a, a range of landscape and ecological conditions, um, including landscape management plans, recommended as part of this uh, consent. If the landscape buffer along the eastern edge of the site was a particular concern, we, we could also look at the wording within the 106 agreement um, just to draw that particular element out further if that's something that you would want us to take away. Uh, thank you. And, and just one question to you, Chair. Are the developers here? Are we going to be able to ask the questions of them? Uh, yes, I think the developers will be speaking shortly. I think we have... Um, Alice Kirkham, I'm not sure yeah. in the room or online. Yes. Um, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, through yourself, is it possible to see the affordable housing sort of um, colour coordinated map? And then could I see the area, you have to indicate the area that it was falls within this clause eight and the area that isn't, please? Sorry, three years, yeah. I'm just going to bring up Appendix 1 because that shows the, the area clearer than that plan does.
So this is the plan from the 2004 Section 106 agreement. The application site, and that is, you can see the cursor moving slowly. So the southern boundary of the application site follows this, this line here. The eastern boundary follows conveniently the line of the 106 agreement. Um, and then jars off the northeast because this area to the top right is included in the application site. So it's only, and again, as set out in the report, it's only technically the land that is within this area of the application site that is liable for the reduced contribution. So we've done quite a cal complicated calculation that the number of dwellings delivered in the top third of the site is liable for the full 40%. The bottom two thirds of the site is 40% less what's already been provided. So it's all sort of set out in the report and I'll probably struggle to articulate it any better without reading that word for word. Chair, if I can, my what I'm trying to ascertain that might help is whether, and that's why I was asking to have that sort of line drawn, sort of overlaid onto the affordable housing, is whether the affordable housing in relation to the non-clause 8 area is actually within that site or whether it has been put into other parts of the site. So I'm trying to map that onto the affordable housing um, no, I know, but I'm looking for the disbursement through the site, how much is in that I top think area. Mr Sexton has got the gist of the question. So I'll reshare this plan. So the section 106 line effectively cuts across there. So that northern section uh, isn't, isn't relevant, uh, isn't uh, affected by the section 106 agreement. Um, clearly, uh, while that 106 agreement affects the amount of affordable housing to come forward. The dispersion is across the site as a whole. Um, so there are there is affordable housing being delivered in the northern parcel that's not subject to the 106, but I wouldn't say that's sort of directly relevant in that regard. Um, the 106 affects the number that has to be delivered across the site as a whole. And then clearly the layout should disperse those um, affordable houses across all areas of the site as has been shown there. So these two Clusters to the north are outside of that section 106 area, and then you have two further groups that are within that 106 area. If that's helped, Council. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my own view is that that's a very clear answer. Are you happy that you've had the, the answer you needed? I'm happy I've had an answer to my question. Not particularly happy with Maybe that plan. We can hope for. Uh, members, we have got a lot of business to get through today, so I'm hoping that we can keep our questions. Uh, not only essential, uh, bearing in mind we have all the papers in front of us, but also short and direct. And I'm sure Mr Sexton will uh, bear that in mind in relation to his answers too. So, uh, Councillor Dr Tumi Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'll be very brief. Um, one of my questions was to do with the um, affordable housing, but that's been clear now and I understand exactly um, why it's the way it is. I noted that there wasn't any one beds uh, in the market housing. I wonder why that is. It's just two beds, two to five beds. Um, it's proposed to have cycle parking in the garages. Now, the question is, are the garages big enough for cycle parking and cars? And I don't know why uh, we are proposing to have cycle parking in garages, please, because we know what tends to happen. Um, in terms of uh, heating, there's proposal for gas boilers for those that built up to 2025 um, and then heat pumps after but surely we should be looking at heat pumps going forward anyway um, i just wanted to understand why we've agreed to that and in terms of design um, i think it's paragraph 229 talks about one of the two windows being um, the obscure glaze, but it's a bedroom window. Why is the design such that we have to obscure glaze a bedroom window? Thank you. Thank you. And through you, Chair, in the cycle provision, um, condition 23 uh, requires the developer to provide um, details of secure and covered cycle parking to meet our policy requirements. Um, there was an indication in the design and access statement that it wasn't quite up to our policy standards. So. Um, obviously satisfied that that condition would address your concern about making sure there's adequate space for the parking, whether that's in a garage or in a separate but shared beach unit, would need to provide X amount of parking, you know, one, one space per bedroom, so we can make sure that comes through the condition. 
Uh, in terms of the boiler question, um, unfortunately, we can't at this stage say no, because the, the change hasn't come in. There is a, a, an energy statement that's been submitted that's been looked at by our uh, sustainability officer who's satisfied with the details. Um, clearly, you may wish to ask that question of the developer when they come forward shortly. Um, and paragraph 229 in the obscure glazed window, it's a secondary bedroom window, so it's a dual aspect bedroom. The southwestern aspect looks towards a neighbouring property, so because the bedroom is a habitable room, to safeguard the amenities of the existing property to the southwest, we have added a condition that that window be obscure glazed. But the occupants would have a northwest aspect that's not obscure glazed. Um, it's acceptable to obscure glaze a, a secondary bedroom window. If it was the only bedroom window, then we would have had to look at a design change because of the impact. But because it's secondary, that's why the condition is imposed. Sorry, yes. Um, the council's policy requires 30% uh, one or two beds, 30% uh, three and then 30% four or more. Um, so, albeit there are no one bed market properties, there are um, over 30% two bed properties, so it complies with policy. It's my short answer, Councillor. Right. Um, we're going to take Councillor Richard Williams' question next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just got a couple of questions about this um, 106 agreement, which I would imagine none of us like. Um, can I just clarify, what would the total affordable housing provision then be if you unite that site with the site that's subject to the 106? So what would we get overall? It is 40% overall. Okay, that, that's useful. Um, can I just get a clarification that the land is still, this land is still in the ownership of the parties who signed the 106 because the 106 says should the owner seek to develop it will be counted towards now the applicant's obviously different here because it's a different housing company but can we just get clarification that it's still the same owner and that 106 uh, is still relevant and if you wouldn't mind just formally for the record answering the first question even if uh, councillor williams may have been satisfied by indications from elsewhere in the room Okay, thank you. If I could come back to the first question, so I just have to, um, actually no, isn't the report bear with me, I can do some quick maths. Um, in terms of the second point about land ownership, I believe that there's multiple landowners involved in the site, and as far as I am aware, um, the ones that are relevant to the 106 that you've referenced still own this, this site. Um, the agent may be in a better position to clarify that, but my understanding is, is yes, that ownership is still applicable. Um, just scrolling through the planning history, bear with me. You're so, bringing up more information on that point, or...? Oh, I'm just doing some maths on the calculators okay. to not embarrass my mental arithmetic. Um, so this site will deliver 72 units, then the two exception sites are 30 and 36, which gives a total of 138 affordable units when you include the two rural exception sites to the west. And, and that, that will be out of, just to make it add up, yeah. before, you really, before we do the math. Yeah, I think Council Williams is asking for a slightly different calculation to the one I've set out in the report. Um, one, two, eight. Hmm. So if I understand the question correctly, uh, there are 138 affordable units when you include the two existing rural exception sites. Um, when you take that for, uh, 66 and add it to the 280 dwellings, um, yeah, it's 40%, because we have 138 affordable overall across 346, which is 39.8%. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> if we could try to avoid challenging our case officers' um, mental arithmetic too far, I think that's a very satisfactory response. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. I'll try to be very short. It's one question only. Can I have a look again, please, Chairman? Or can we all have a look again at the, um, the map that shows the open green spaces? Uh, because my concern is that given the amount of housing that we have got here, um, I find uh, it a little bit uh, 
short in my opinion. Um, why is it that we, we haven't pressed for more open spaces? Because to be quite honest, I bet the houses are going to have pocket handkerchief sized gardens and there's an awful lot of them. And really, why are we not pressing for a much more open space on there. I mean, um, there's a lot of the areas on the edge that are not going to be any use other than a visual uh, benefit, but actually for use of the people. I mean, is the amount of land that we've been given, which I think is about 2.5 hectares of green, is that really uh, what we would have really been expecting on a site of this size? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor, through you, Chair. The amount of open space that's been provided on site is in line with our policy requirements in conjunction with the off site contributions that are set out in the report. Um, the eastern boundary is quite a sizable boundary. It's not just there for a landscape buffer, <clears throat> it is a functional area. Um, it will be a multi purpose recreational route. So people will be able to you know, get out and walk around that, hopefully, quite attractive route, which may be more beneficial to having small pockets of. Um, you know, areas of open space within the site which aren't perhaps as as usable. So, you know, this was looked at again through pre-app with our landscape officer and urban design officer um, in the parish, and this was the design that came forward. It is policy compliant. Thank you for that answer. I suspect that's a matter we may come back to in debate later on. Yes. Um, Councillor Harvey. Yes, I, I was looking at... Um, Abraham Parish Council comments uh, on page 36 and their concern about additional traffic and I just um, and that's covered um, I think there's an analysis of the traffic impact um, in paragraph 197 on page 60 um, and uh, also addressed in paragraph 204 I wanted to make sure that those analyses take into account the fact that at the end of um, uh, Abraham High Street um, you can no longer turn right um, in the direction of Haverhill. You have to have a, a two-mile detour via the research park roundabout. And if you Google map, for example, how, how you would get to Norwich from the siting of the proposed development, it actually takes you uh, the, the, the other way. In other words, um, you would go towards Babraham, turn right, and then have to negotiate a rather awkward kind of reverse turning left onto the A505 um, and as they state, that, that particular piece of road is very narrow. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that that's all been taken into account. So, um, have we taken into account how you would get to Norwich? Uh, short answer, yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Councillor Martin Khan. <coughs> uh, many years ago, 45 years ago, I actually lived in Salston for a couple of years. So, it's an area I do know. Um, one of the things, um, I'll come back to Councillor Roberts' comments about the lack of open space, which it does seem to strike me. Um, uh, this has been countered by provision of, of support to Wombley. Dr. Khan, is this a question? No, you will be, yeah. Um, so, uh, to Wombley, which is some distance. Um, it's, there is, I found when living there that there was very little accessible open space uh, for informal recreation in, in the vicinity. Uh, Wombley is some way away. Um, because there's a limit to the amount of land you can provide, one of the things you have got around there is footpaths uh, redeeming from the site. Has any consideration been given to improving the uh, footpath access uh, to the, uh, and improvements to footpaths in the surrounding area, which is the main access, informal access that you've got in the area, rather than uh, in addition to the support from Wanderbury? Thank you to you, Chair. Uh, as set out in the report, there are uh, contributions um, and there is... Uh, requirement for the footpath to be upgraded along uh, Baven Road, so there will be improvements in the immediate vicinity. There are also enhancements being made to the existing public rights of way um, that are going to be integrated in and around the site, so the development will be um, enhancing certainly footpaths and public footpaths in the immediate vicinity. Right. I'm very keen to move on to our witnesses who have been very patient with us. We have a number of prepared to present, but Councillor Bradham, I think you had a further question you wanted to ask. Dude, very quick one, please, and that is... Um, Councillor Toomey Hawkins raised the issue of windows. And I just wanted uh, to ask, at paragraph 231 on page 64, it refers to plot 86. And I'm really sorry, uh, and I, please can we change this if it's at all possible. It refers to 86 um, 
does not result in significant loss of privacy to number 66 and 68 Plantation Road and a condition that restricts the first floor window to be obscure glaze and fixed shut is considered appropriate. Now this is a bathroom, fine to have it obscure glaze, but please can we not have it required to be fixed shut? That's horrid in a bathroom and I'd rather we didn't do that if we can possibly avoid it, please. Certainly, we can look at that that condition. It, um, if it doesn't already, we can say apart from any top hung vent yes, is sir. sort of the standard wording. So, uh, if members are minded to approve, then perhaps we could have that delegated to agree with chair. We can also chair. condemn people to damp dampness in their houses, please. Thank you. Right. Thank you, members. I think we now move on to public speakers. Our first public speaker on this one, I think, is online. Paul Shelford, are you with us? Hi. Good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, I think you know the, the rules. We will give you three minutes. If you would stand by in case any members have any brief questions or clarification on what you're actually going to say. But um, yes, please, we can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, so we, will, we live on the, the very end, number 58, Stanley Webb Close. There's a small section of land between us and the existing primary school. Now, Big, big concern is that they're going to try and put two um, houses on that piece of land. Now, that's extremely small, to be fair. Uh, the problems we're going to have is that they're literally going to barricade our back garden in, which in itself, serious lack of privacy, um, a lot of overshadowing. Um, so our concern, because we're going to have a house right up the back of our, our rear garden and also two to the side. Um, Obviously, this piece of land, if you really look at it, it's they're trying to obviously trying to squeeze as many houses in as possible. Um, and plus it's so very close, the privet is close to the um, the school itself, the playground. So there's a big concern there that really, in all honesty, we, we can't understand why they we're trying to put two homes in between us and that school. Now, obviously listening to you guys this morning. Um, me and my partner really think that in itself could be used as a, a green space. It's, it's quite a large area for a piece of green space or even maybe a cycle path or a through path through to where we, we live at the present moment. So there's a good access, um, something really, really worth thinking about because at this present moment, if they build what they're intending to build, we are literally going to be barricaded in from all sides. Um, and it's, we just think it's just not good enough anyway. They're not, there's no consideration whatsoever to the occupants, especially of us and our existing neighbour and to the uh, existing primary school. So I think this piece, this particular piece of land really needs to be looked at. Um, is there anything you want to add? No, I think that's, yeah. But then, you know, because of the way they're, considering building the two homes and actually turning them around. And we've, we've we had an extension literally less than a year and a half ago. We didn't know this was going, going to happen. And it, it, it's not on your plans anyway. So the, the actual perimeter of our building to the perimeter of the, the proposed buildings are far too close in our minds. Um, but as I say, I think it'd be better looked at as maybe a through through walkway or cycleway, which is badly needed because there's a lot of existing occupants that often come to our end of our cul-de-sac thinking there is a walk or through through road to Plantation Road. So it's something really seriously worth considering uh, to add to the link between the existing properties and the new. Mr. Shelford, thank you very much for that okay. point, which okay, I know thank you. will be taken into account. Right? Thank you, Mr. Shelford. Okay, we'll take into you. account by members and uh, may well come back to it in the debate. Uh, okay. Now, it may be that some members have brief questions on the basis of what you've said. I think Councillor Bradnam wanted to ask you a question if you have a moment with us. Thank you very much, Chair. Is, is Mr Shelford still there? Are you still, still with us, yep. Mr Shelford? Yes, I am, yes. 
Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, could you just describe to us, Mr. Shelford, where where you are? Are you at the southern end of Stanley Webb Close? Um, yes, we are. There's a small section of the land. And if 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 you see the, could, can you see the primary school? We're going to bring up the plan. So on the plan, see. please. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Okay. So there's two. Yeah, there's a section there to the exactly where Mr. Sexton is now. There's two homes being proposed to be built. If you look at the, 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 the existing plan of our house, those two houses will literally almost be built in our back garden. So you, you can understand the lack of privacy we're going to have with those two. You know, they're not, they're not going to be low-rise buildings, which in itself maybe would help. Um, however, the land, the, the drawing doesn't really show the, the, the scale of what you know, it needs looking at because the land... It's gobsmacked me, to be fair, that they're considering even putting two buildings in this space um, because it's going to be wedged in between us and the primary school, which isn't shown on there. But their playground will be exactly side by side to those two homes, which, you know, in this day and age, I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but the, the privacy for us in general is going to be lost because, as you can see, we're going to have a home at the rear of our garden as well. And if you were to actually come and have a look and see what I'm talking about, we are literally going to be barricaded in by huge yes. gable ends of brickwork. Thank you, Mr. Shelford. Um, we take your point. Um, as I said, that may be raised by members in debate. I would emphasise that at the end of the day, we will be considering the application as submitted. And that is yes. the basis on which we will be determining this in due course. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Shelford, for your time and, and your okay. contribution. Very helpful. Okay, thank you. I'd now, I'd like to call on uh, Alice Kirkham, who is, I think, the speaking for the agents, Redrow, who I think is online. Are you with us, uh, Mrs. Kirkham? Yes, can you hear me okay? We can hear you clearly. Uh, you know the rules, you have the usual three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person with you today. We've got um, COVID in the family, unfortunately, so I thought it was safer to stay away. Um, I'm Alice Kirkham, a Senior Planning Manager at Red Row Homes and speaking in support of the application. The full planning application relates to an allocated site and will deliver 280 new homes, including affordable housing as agreed with officers and set out in detail within the report. The scheme also makes provision for a local charity to take on the management of some of the affordable homes, which would ensure they were available to local people with a connection to the village. At Red Row, we're really proud of the homes we build and have a strong focus on placemaking and architectural quality. The design of this development focuses on delivering a well-connected neighbourhood, which will successfully integrate with the adjacent existing development and the wider village of Sawston. We've carefully considered the Sawston Village Design Guide in drawing up the proposals, and the scheme positively responds to the guidance contained within it in all aspects, including building heights, character areas, connectivity, landscaping and materials. The provision for pedestrians and cyclists has been designed so that it can be integrated into the wider network and provide links to the existing village and its amenities. It's worth noting that the existing public right of way that crosses the site is proposed to be redirected on the advice of the county foot pass officer rather than being lost altogether. There's a significant amount of public open space proposed, including, including two children's play areas. A number of financial contributions will also be provided, including to improve the facilities at the existing Linton Way Recreation Ground, which is in close proximity to the site. A wide range of biodiversity enhancements, such as a new orchard and a swift tower, are proposed on site. And in combination with a range of measures proposed on the adjacent agricultural field to the south, the proposal will result in a net gain in habitat and hedgerow units in line with local policy. We've engaged with local stakeholders throughout the process, including attending parish council meetings, participating in the council's design enabling panel and a youth engagement workshop with the local school. The proposals have been amended as a result of the comments and Sawston Parish Council have now confirmed their support for the application. The proposals have been discussed in detail with officers and statutory consultees at both pre-application and application stage, with the result being that officers consider the proposal would provide a high quality scheme that would make a strong and positive contribution to the local and wider context of the site and to the character of the area. The principle of the site for residential development has been tested through the examination of the local plan and found to be acceptable. The scheme positively addresses all of the allocation policy criteria and there are now outstanding objections from any statutory consultees. On this basis, I would respectfully request that the committee resolve to grant planning permission in line with your planning officer's recommendation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Kirk. I think we have, if you would vote, there's a question from Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. And through yourself, you um, reference the support from Source and Parish Council. I just want to quote what we have in our agenda, paragraph 17, page 37. The houses had no character. Um, and you're you're talking about the um, efforts on design and things. Is there a way that you can argue your, argue your case, as it were, of good quality design in the face of that? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as I say, we're, we're actually really proud at Red Road that we, we do pay a lot of attention to detail um, in terms of the design quality of our homes. Um, I think, I'm not sure if the Parish Council um, spokesperson is, is due on later, but I think in honesty, they were perhaps hoping for a, a bespoke design um, across the, the site, um, which in honesty for a, for a scheme of 280 um, dwellings in this case, um, it's, it's not really feasible or practical. Um, there, there's a strong housing need both within the district and as we know nationally, and um, those sorts of housing numbers will not be delivered through um, bespoke design on every site. What we have done is ensured that the, the scheme design here um, really draws upon and reflects the provisions of the village design guide. Um, so we've got um, a lot of linear terrace runs, um, which is, is um, noted within the village design guide as being characteristic of, of this village particularly. Um, so that's particularly within the central orchards um, character area, which is closest to the, the existing development to the west. Um, the, in terms of sort of detailing and materials, we're also looking at um, drawing upon uh, the, the same sort of palette of materials as, as can be found in the village already. Um, so, for example, the use of red and buff brick and render um, and design detailing like um, sort of brick detailing in runs and brick, brick plinths, all of which draw upon um, the existing character uh, and ensure that um, this development will sort of seamlessly sit alongside uh, the, existing, uh, the, the existing village edge. Thank you, Chair. Um, so how many how many different types of design will be used? You said it's not bespoke, but how many variations of design will be using? Sorry, I'm not sure I um, completely understand the question. Um, do you mean how many different house types or? Um, well, you you've referenced reference some of the things are all houses going to be identical or have you got different variations? How many types of design will there be for these houses? Yeah, as I say, um, I think as referenced within the officer's report, um, there are uh, three character areas proposed on the scheme. So the Northern Avenues is a perhaps a more formal arrangement with um, formal tree, um, street trees. Um, and it, it seeks to have a sort of reasonably low density along the countryside edges and along the approach uh, along Baberham Road into the village. Uh, and then we come to the Central Orchards character area, which um, sits alongside the existing village to the west. And as I say, that's characterised by um, a higher number of these linear, simple terraced runs, both in affordable and market housing. Um, and then we've also got the, the Eastern Greenway character area, where again, we're looking for more low density more detached style um, form of dwellings uh, in order to provide that softer edge to the countryside. Um, so, it, I mean, as I say, it has been carefully considered um, through pre-app and, and through the application in terms of how we can make sure that this, this scheme sits uh, comfortably alongside the existing village, but also um, brings a, a, a distinct character of its own. Uh, Councillor Brown Milnes wanted to ask you a question, I think. Thank you, yes. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, Alice, who has uh, made uh, several visits to the village in the past, I note, and uh, has made some uh, accommodations to issues already raised, raised today. Uh, but I'd like to ask how many of the properties come with uh, mechanical uh, ventilation and heat recovery systems? Uh, how many come with solar panels? How many come with air or ground source? heat pumps and how many are fitted as standard with gas central heating. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you. And um, we've we've given a lot of thought to this as well in terms of the um, the application. So there is an energy strategy that's been submitted as part of the application documentation. That strategy outlines um, two options essentially um, based on the changing nature of um, energy provision for new housing. Um, I mean, the, the application was submitted back in August last year and things have already moved on a pace since then. So the options um, that are currently being considered um, and sort of going through feasibility testing are um, the first option being the, the homes being provided with high efficiency uh, gas boilers and photovoltaics to the roofs. Um, and then the second option would be for the units to be provided with air source heat pumps for their heating and hot water. Both options um, would achieve in excess of the 10% um, carbon emission reductions required by local policy. Um, it's fair to say we are currently favouring option B, so the uh, rolling out of air source heat pumps to all of the units. Um, but it is, as I say, going through feasibility testing because uh, the, the technology is reasonably new to us um, as sort of uh, national house builders. Um, and we also have to check the sort of electricity load in the area and that sort of thing, whether whether it can work. But certainly that's our preferred option at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. Uh, good morning. I I've got two questions really to ask you, because I don't think you answered Councillor Heather Williams. I think she asked you a very straightforward and easy question. How many designs are you going to put onto this site? Because we all know you have, you know, you have houses with ridiculous names that make them sound like palaces. Um, but you, you must know how many actual design names you have in mind for this site, and therefore how many different designs of properties you are going to have. So I, I'd like a proper answer on that. And I would like... You've talked about strategy and objectives. It looks to me as though the strategy and the objective is to fill the site to the gunnels. And I, I am very concerned at what appears to me to be a lack of forethought for the quality of life for the people in that area in the future, because there really is very little open space when you think of 280 odd houses. So have you not at any time felt conscience driven to give a site for so many people to live on more open space? Thank you. Yep, thank you. So I think that's um, two questions. Firstly, on um, house types. And if it's the number of different house types we're proposing, then yes, there is a simple answer to that. Um, it's 18. Um, and then secondly, in terms of open space provision, um, we are currently showing that our scheme shows uh, an amount of open space that's in excess of, of your policy standards. Um, 2.47 hectares as proposed, um, I believe when it's totaled up, the, the policy standard would amount to um, 2.08 hectares. So we are in excess of it. Um, and as I say, we, we as a house builder are, are um, very focused on providing um, sort of high quality places um, and communities. And a lot of that comes down to, to making sure that the landscaping is of high quality and sort of sets the scene from the outset. Um, so we put a lot of attention to, to that um, in our designs and in setting out the site. Um, so there's, there's a large amount of landscaping proposed. Um, as I say, it does, does meet policy standards and, and we're quite comfortable that it will create a, a lovely place to live. Thank you very much. Uh if you can bear with us, we have three more questions, and I stress they will be questions. We're not attempting to enter into debate with you here. That will come later. Uh, Dr. Richard Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just following up on the point I made earlier, uh, could you confirm to me in whose ownership the southern part of the site is vested? Yes, uh, Red Row Homes have an, uh, an um, uh, sorry, contractual agreement with uh, the existing landowners. So the landowners do remain the same as those um, who signed up to the original Section 106s in relation to the, um, the neighbouring rural exception schemes. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Anna Bradman. Thank you, Chair. To you. Two questions to you. Um, uh, 
could you confirm, I notice at um, in various sections that the local highways authority has no objection, but could you confirm that the internal roads will be built to adoptable standards? Uh, and secondly, without prejudging our decision, if we as a committee were to be minded to approve this, would you consider removing the two dwellings at your plots 72 and 73 um, and making an access through to improve the site permeability with Stanley Webb Close? Um, just before you answer that, I think uh, we can't really enter into negotiations with our witnesses. Uh, that is something which we would have to I'm enter. I'm just simply asking uh, whether Councillor Bradden, I'm sorry. Just saying that uh, the advice from the director is that is a matter on which we would have to consult if it were to be considered. Uh, this is the proposal before us today. Yes, but, yes but I'm simply to that, Mrs. asking Kirkham, if the developer would be minded to consider that. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Bradden. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the first question on um, highway standards, I think. Um, yeah, we've uh, we've liaised closely with the uh, the highways authority in bringing forward the scheme, um, and all of the sort of key spine roads um, are all um, proposed to be uh, publicly adopted. Um, in consultation with them, we have um, submitted a plan that that shows um, the proposed adoption arrangements, which they are content with. Um, there are a, a range of sort of um, technical approvals that, has, that will still have to be gone through post planning, um, as, as is the case for um, development. Um, on the matter of um, connectivity and permeability, um, I think the case officer did uh, note that there, were, there is an existing access proposed into Stanley Web Place, um, which uh, personally I think is in a more appropriate uh, position for permeability. Um, rather than right down the end of the, the cul-de-sac. Um, and, and again, there are further connections proposed into Plantation Road and again onto Church Lane, as well as uh, at the top of Abram Road. Um, so the, the scheme really does uh, um, concentrate on making sure that, that existing and new residents alike can move um, freely and easily between our scheme and the, uh, the existing village edge of Sawston. Thank you for that. And last question, I think, from Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins for you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, two questions, if I may. Uh, on the cycle parking uh, storage issues, you are proposing to have some cycle parking inside garages for the houses that have garages and in sheds for those that don't. Are your proposed Garages actually even large enough for cars to go in and the doors to open and then add cycle storage in it <laughs> or not because we know there are some houses that are like that and would you consider having cycle parking not in garages second thing is to do with the heating system how many houses do you propose to build by 2025 that will have gas boilers in them? And why are you not using, I know you mentioned something about that before, but why aren't you actually just considering putting um, uh, air source heat pumps in them or for the future? Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Kirkham, you did give us uh, your explanation on those points earlier, but if you'd like to elaborate on that in response to Hawkins question that'd be helpful. Yes, certainly. Um, so on the first question of uh, cycle parking, um, yes, cycle parking is proposed within garages. Uh, we're actually not proposing um, that the car parking allocation is provided within gar garages um, for the simple fact that we are aware that in reality, um, garages very often don't get used for car parking um, and more often for storage. So um, there is sufficient car parking provided uh, outside of garages um, and then in that instance we're proposing that the cycle parking would naturally be within the garage um, and as I say we've got um, sheds proposed in gardens of properties that don't have garages. Um, I think Michael Sexton um, mentioned that there is a condition proposed that would uh, allow further approval of cycle parking arrangements so if, if, it, if the case is that um, all units need sheds then, then that can be um, be looked at through that condition approval um, but our view is that that's not required. Um, the matter of gas boilers and how many might be um, provided on this scheme um, 
as I say, uh, uh, my um, comments earlier are that our preferred option would be to um, uh, roll out air source heat pumps for all of the units on this scheme, um, but it is just subject to that feasibility testing at the moment. So ideally, uh, there will be no gas boilers um, provided on the scheme, and that's that's the solution that we're looking at at the moment. Um, but a fallback is, um, if if required for feasibility reasons, uh, that that we would implement gas boilers in combination with photovoltaics um, if necessary. But as I say, uh, first and foremost, our um, attentions are on seeking to roll out air source heat pumps across across the scheme. Um, I'll bear with us. I think Dr. Hawking would to come back to you. Thank you, point. Chair. Uh, through you, if I understand your answer to the cycle storage first, what you're saying is you don't expect garages to be used for storing or parking cars. That seems to be what you're saying. So why are you actually bringing to us a design that includes garages? What's the point? Um, sorry, um, yeah, am I okay to um, answer? Um, yes, uh, the truth is garages are a very marketable um, asset. To, to any home. So despite people not necessarily using them for parking, um, they are never, nevertheless um, a key element of, of housing that people are looking for when they come to, to buy a new house. Um, that's, that's, I suppose, the, the simple answer. <laughs> right. Mrs Kirkham, thank you very much, not only for your presentation, but for dealing in such detail with a number of, uh, let's call them questions or concerns. Um, just before you go, so Dr. Khan, did you really have another question? Yes, if you would bear with us, one more question. It's a very brief one, but uh, basically uh, the provisions for uh, work on footpaths, like you referred to earlier on, is basically just to cover on the existing footpaths uh, increased wear. Uh, did you consider looking at your footpath improvements? Because I explained the, there's poor access to the open informal space in Sawston. Uh, it would have been an opportunity to improve for access to the countryside uh, by looking at doing more than just replace it, uh, repairing the footpaths, but uh, improving and providing improvement to the network in the vicinity. Yes, thank you. Um, we have currently got an application in with the County Council um, regarding footpaths, which includes the creation of a new public right-of-way, as well as um, the improvement and upgrade of existing rights-of-way. Um, so what we're trying to do is make sure that there's a, a complete link uh, which would um, be situated on the eastern and southern edges of our site um, that allows people to easily get between Baybrum Road and um, Church Lane and, and would provide a sort of attractive um, recreational route as well. Um, and then that route also will then link into the existing rights of way that spurs, spur off to the east into the fields um, beyond we're not proposing upgrading those um, footpaths in, in sort of surfacing or anything like that, um, uh, largely because people who like to use um, footpaths uh, through fields are generally sort of recreational walkers and, and don't necessarily need it to be a paved surface. Um, but those within the site will be upgraded so that they can be um, used by cyclists, uh, pedestrians and also equestrians as well. We're looking at suitable surfacing for all users. Mrs. Kirkham, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we all end that session there, and we have further witnesses to consider. But thank you for your contribution. Thank you. We then move to the parish council, and I think we have uh, Councillor David Bard online. Can you hear us, David? Are you with us, David Bard? We'll just give Mr. Bard a, a moment or two to catch. Can you hear us, David Bard? Um, yes, we've established that David Bard is in the meeting. I think there may be a problem with your microphone, David. Um, Any means of communicating with Mr. Bard? No. Mm. Um, 
David, if you can hear me, the suggestion is it might help if you were to leave the meeting and come back in again, um, and then we might be able to hear you. So we'll just give you a few moments to try that. Sorry, I, I, yeah, sorry, sorry the, the unmute symbol's just come up. Am I unmuted now? Am I unmuted? We can hear you clearly. Good, okay, David, fine. you may like to activate your um, camera if you would like us to see you. Yes, Not essential. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Can I just um, confirm? I think I suspect you probably know the rules quite well, but can, <laughs> can you just confirm that you have the consent of the parish council to speak on their behalf? I do indeed. Yes. I thought yes. So. Thank yes, you. please. The uh, the floor, if you can call it that, is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, Sawston Parish Council recognises the extensive discussions and hard work which has gone into making this mediocre development just about acceptable. We particularly appreciate the work of the urban design team in getting as much compliance with the adopted source and design guide as they're able to within the severe constraints of an architectural approach to the standard house type, which appears to be informed by interwar metro land with a nod to the last gasp of the arts and crafts movement. We recognise that probably as much has been achieved as can reasonably be asked for, and for that reason have withdrawn our objection. We do still, however, have concerns about access to the site and request that some provision can be made via S106 and minor highways improvements, and in particular traffic calming measurements in Church Lane, which is proposed to become a major cycle and pedestrian route between the site and the centre of the village. Church Lane is poorly lit and narrows to just over three metres on the 200 metre section approaching the High Street and lacks a clear pedestrian walkway. There are two access points onto this site, St Mary's Church and the car park at the rear of Church Court have limited visibility displays. And further to the east, the Church Hall entrance also has limited visibility displays. And the hall is used almost continuously, including evenings. And uh, the second uh, request is the introduction of a 40 mile an hour speed limit on Sorcerer Road between the end of the built up area and the junction with Babram High Street. Uh, this proposal has the support of both Babram and Pampisford Parish Councils. Uh, we assume that uh, that um, since the work in uh, the traffic calming work in in Bayram High Street has already been completed, that the request in paragraph two hundred and three to four for an S one hundred six contribution towards that falls away. Is that correct? Uh, we also have concerns about the very limited thought which seems to be given to access to public transport. If um, CSET, uh, Cambridge South East Transport, goes ahead, the problem disappears, but at present the nearest bus stop for the northbound Cambridge City 7 service is some 900 metres from the site. The transport assessment team comments uh, dated the 18th of October of 21 refer to a 20 minute service it has since January reduced to two buses per hour, 30 minute service. Uh, we don't consider a minuscule bus shelter 900 metres from the site an acceptable sustainable transport solution and have asked in the event of CSET not proceeding for a tapered subsidy to support an extension of the City, city 7 service to the end of Babram Road. I fear that otherwise would have created a highly car dependent edge of town estate more typical of the 1960s. This so is tacitly admitted by the relatively high number of predicted traffic. Uh, peak hour traffic movements in the um, uh, page paragraph 196 of the officer report. Having said that, we accept that the development will provide much needed affordable housing and hope that not too much of the market housing will go to buy to let investment. We'd like to request that the parish councillors consulted over the lighting scheme, landscaping scheme, drainage scheme, and the construction environmental management plan before they're finally improved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before we get into questions, I think we might speed things up. Can I ask uh, Mr Sexton, who, there was a question there in relation to the Section 106 part of it falling away. Is that correct? I don't believe so, no. The, the no. 20,000 contribution is requested as a result, direct result of this development, so I don't believe that would fall away. That would be carried forward for further improvements in paper. Mm -hmm. um, well, so yes. That's not really a question, that's just the, the officer's response. But before we get into questions from others here, um, I think you confirmed that you have withdrawn, the parish council has withdrawn its objection. So these are questions that might possibly be dealt with at the conditions or at uh, yes. reserve matter stages, which we will come to later rather than today, if you'll forgive us. I think we then had a question from 
Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair, and through yourself to Councillor Bard. Um, it was just on a, a comment you made in your representation about mediocre just about passing. And I'm just going to read the words of Policy HQ1. All new development must be of high quality design with a clear vision as to the positive contribution the development will make to its local and wider context. I'm just wondering, in light of your comments, Councillor Bard, whether you would believe this complies with that high quality design or merely the best of a bad lot? I think given the, uh, given the constraints uh, outlined by the developer, they're having to work with standard house types, which are not characteristic of the area. As I said, I think they're more characteristic of 1920s metro land. But uh, have, given that, I think they've done probably about as best as they can within, the, within that constraint. Right. Uh, I have no further questions for you, so thank you very much for your presentation and for dealing with those, that comment or question. Thank you. Uh, I think we're now ready to move on to the next stage, which is the debate um, on this. Um, Councillor Milnes, as a local member, do you want to go first on this? Or? You'll reserve your comments then. Okay. Right. So, who do we have? Can I just say that in um, debating this, I hope that members who have made points of debate during the questions, whether to officers or to witnesses, will be able as a result to keep their contribution on those points relatively short. And I think it would be helpful if we could all relate any comments in this debate to the key material considerations as set out on page 33. So with that, I think we start with uh, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. And through you, Chairman, then I will try and keep it brief because I'm quite clear in my own mind where I'm going. What a disappointment. Um, where there is a will, there is a way, but I'm afraid the developer hasn't got a will, so therefore isn't going to give us a way. 280-odd um, houses. It's, very, it's a very great deal of new development there. And when you look at the site layout, I'm afraid we see the ghettos of the future being built. We have a policy, and surely it's upon us to make sure that we comply with that policy, that we, in our decision-making, we, we take it seriously. And when a parish council says an estate, that's what it's going to be. It's not going to be a community. It's going to be a great big estate. It has no character and the design is mediocre. And didn't I have a hard job getting out of the uh, applicant exactly how many designs? Um, it could, of course, still be designed in a pleasurable, useful, uh, empowering, all those words that we use nowadays, manner, but they just haven't wanted to do it because it's all about profit and uh, take a design off a shelf and bang it up, um, it's a, a quicker profit and a bigger profit than um, having to work a little bit harder. So this is exactly the sort of thing that we should be refusing. Um, quality of life in the future there is going to be abysmal. There is no real open space. If you looked at that picture at the start, the green area map, you could quite clearly see where with a little bit of consideration and a little bit less greed, you could have had a really nice open space on that top quarter. But instead, they put a housing block, literally four sides of housing, with three sides of uh, roadway around it. My goodness, that's going to be pleasant living, isn't it? It's, it's a disaster. This design for Sawston is the disaster of the future. It's going to be an appalling quality of life. It's going to have tinky tiny gardens that nobody will be able to actually play in, but they won't have a lovely big open space where the children can go and kick a ball. Yeah, if they want to walk around the edge of the uh, estate, they might be able to do that. But, you know, small children don't want to just walk around the edge of the estate. They want somewhere that they can go and use their energy up. And as I say, especially if they've gardens aren't big enough to um, throw a cat around, 
So I will not be going along with this. It's time that we told these developers that we are the rule makers and they will not be allowed to be the rule breakers. It's time to say enough is enough. Um, they haven't done a good job and I'm not going along with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say that I have been concerned about um, some of the representations that have been made to us. Mediocre isn't what any of us should be should be striving for, I don't think. And this brings me back to this policy HQ1. And there's a, a few areas where, for me, this, this proposed development doesn't fit. I don't believe it pre uh, preserves or enhances the character of the area. But looking more to actually... 1D in there. It must be compatible with its location and appropriate in terms of scale, density, mass form, siting, design, proportion, materials, texture and colour in relation to the surrounding areas. And we were shown um, a layout of the site which showed the surrounding areas and the surrounding houses which are actually much more spread out than what is proposed in the site that we've got today. So for myself, it doesn't seem in keeping with the houses in the surrounding area. I, I do have real concerns about the two houses that have been put between the school, as was made in the objectors' remarks. It does feel that, that actually those two houses will not be part of that development or part of site. It's, it's an odd thing to just sort of cram those houses in that way, and I think has an impact on on as well the location and the street scene from the other side of the road. So um, I'm not, I understand that what's been said about the constraints, but they do feel self-imposed constraints by the wishes of the developer for their own internal issues yes. as opposed, and their own internal designs and um, off the shelf, you know, easy, easy going um, arrangements as opposed to actually getting the right design and layout there are no site constrictions in my mind to why we could not achieve um, what our policy says of high quality design. We only have the constraints that the developer is putting on this and it's their duty to comply with our policies, not vice versa. So I won't be supporting it, Chair. Thank you. And lastly, I think Councillor Brian Milnes is also the local member. Thank you, Chair. So mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, zero. Ground source heat pumps, zero. A possibility of uh, solar panels combined with uh, air source heat pumps. I just hope that the commercial realities that are now existing around the uh, utility market, and particularly the cost of gas and electricity, uh, will coerce the developers into providing sustainable uh, uh, power uh, to this development. It's really disappointing that they didn't do this as standard in anticipation of the ban on use of gas. I'll reuse that um, term mediocre um, because the nature of the problem with 280 houses, even if you've got a dozen uh, different um, house types, is that it will become uh, relatively unexciting. This will, it's almost impossible to build a housing estate with, you know, so many variations of uh, design types that it becomes inherently interesting. It's a relatively, I asked the density question, it's a relatively, relatively dense uh, um, development, 29 uh, houses dwelling units per hectare. But we're desperate for housing. Um, Sorsum is effectively a dormitory town uh, for the many uh, science parks are around. And um, we need to have people located close to where they work. This will provide that. And um, the developers have made 
uh, significant efforts to adjust uh, their design to meet with the uh, village design guide. So with reservations, uh, I've got to say, and despite uh, the sound bites from our colleague uh, in, in the meeting, um, I th think the uh, answer is that we need this development and uh, as a local member, I'm um, happy to support it. Thank you. Right. Uh, I don't think we have any further contributions to the... Oh, Dr. Khan. I must keep a closer eye on you, Dr. Yeah, no, I'll be not spotting you again. Please. We'll make a comment. No, it's a, um, uh, I, I sympathise with the uh, comments of council, um, both Councillor Roberts and Councillor Milnes, in a sense, which is a complicated situation. Um, the, I think the, uh, as, as, as you said, I think the development is uninspiring and the improvements have been made. Um, but the question is whether this is sufficient that we should refuse the development. Um, that, that's the key issue. The, the, I, I'm unhappy about the amount of open space. I think there could be more, and I think that I'm glad to hear there are some improvements getting made to the, um, the footpath system. Um, I think that is necessary. That's a reassuring thing. But uh, there is a lack of informal open space near, uh, near two. The existing Linton Way recreation ground is basically open, flat, green area. It's not really got any particular interest in it itself for informal recreation, it's for formal recreation. So uh, uh, the, the existing adjoining development is uninspiring. You know, the old Linton Way area is not exactly a particularly interesting area at all. In fact, the new development, I think, would be an improvement on, on the adjoining area. So that's one context to think in terms of. Um, and there is a need for housing, uh, perhaps more dense than one would have desired might have produced a, a low density might have produced a, a, a better landscaped area but we do need housing and it's within the approved density that one expect in that sort of area so I, I don't think if it went to appeal if we were opposed to it that we would have sufficient grounds to, to, to refuse it and therefore uh, on the balance I, I'm going to be in favour of, of supporting it. Councillor Bradman. Thank you. Um, my feeling is that, yes, this isn't a perfect development, but we understand the developers have made changes to the plans. As to the designs, yes, they are rather retro, as it were, but many people live happily in such houses, and um, they are going to be providing much-needed affordable housing on the site. Um, and so my feeling is there is insufficient grounds to refuse this application, so I shall be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Dr. Tuvi Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the, we don't have any major objections from any of our um, um, major consultees, and I take the point uh, by Councillor about that, um, you know, the Parish Council had withdrawn its um, objections. In terms of the design, it's not great, but uh, there's, um, there's no objection really. I mean, our urban design team does support it. It's not what we would like, but it's what we've got, and there are reasons for that. Um, one thing that still concerns me is this thing with trying to put cycles in garages. It just doesn't work. Is it possible? to look at condition 23 um, and make that a bit more, uh, I don't know, specific in that the cycle storage should be provided covered outside and not try and determine how people use their garages even before the things have been built. Um, yes, I will be supporting this. Uh, we do have a need for housing, as the um, local member has um, explained. But not ideal, it's the best we can do at this point in time. But if we can look at Condition 23, please, if there's any way that we can make this um, a bit more specific. So I think that is a proposal that we amend um, Condition 23. Can you just help us out by pointing out where we find that same time? Page 86, thank you. So, do you have a revised wording in mind for Condition 23? 
Yeah, I think it'd be helpful to have a comment from the director on this, please. Um, it, it, I understand the sentiments that Councillor Hawkins uh, highlighting, um, mm -hmm. but I think it would be unreasonable for the planning authority to seek to prevent people putting bicycles in garages. That would seem to go far beyond the extent of our lawful powers in terms of uh, enforcement and so on. So I think, um, I think it, the applicants have heard, and obviously officers understand their sentiments and concerns about it. Um, but, uh, but I think we're, we're starting to intervene in, in areas of, of controlling people's lifestyles that I think probably uh, planning is not intended to cover. I think the condition um, 23, which requires uh, details for cycle parking and will no doubt make distinctions potentially between those houses that have double garages, for example, and those that have single garages where there may well be greater constraints is, is probably sufficient. But, um, That's Hawkins, do you have... Are you prepared to allow this matter to be dealt with at reserve matter stage if you don't have any specific wording? It's full it's full okay. Sorry, it's full application. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but the, the, sorry, the point is the details are still to be submitted. Mm -hmm. um, so there is scope for a certain amount of... Because I'm not sure that we have an exact wording that we could place as a condition. Um, I appreciate that and thank you. But the thing is, I mean, just looking at the size of the single garage, it's about, what, three metres wide or three and a half metres mm -hmm. wide, you drive a car in and that's you can't even get out of the car. Yes. There might be people who want to use the garage for cars. So where are they going to put their bikes? Yes. Well, I'm sure that's a matter that can be taken into account in these discussions that are outlined in the existing para, uh, condition 23. And the only reason I'm emphasizing this is because we're trying to get people out of their cars, out of bikes, and you know, active yes. travel and stuff like that. But let's do it correct. Anyway. Okay, I'm not me. sure we can progress that point any further at this stage. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. Um, officers kindly pointed out that they were happy to accept the change to the wording at paragraph 231 about the top hung vent. Is it, can we just confirm that that will be taken on board? In the bathroom. It was about the bathroom window that shouldn't have to be fixed shut. Yep, uh, perhaps I'll ask Michael Sexton to comment on this. Uh, through you, Chair. Yes, that would um, re uh, involve a slight tweak to uh, condition 26, which we can certainly make sure that wording makes its way in if, if that would form part of the delegation of powers and members. Okay. That would be great. And now I think, um, Councillor. Deborah Roberts and Councillor Heather Williams both wanted to make a further contribution. Yeah. Can I just say that um, perhaps I could ask you in doing this, I, I can appreciate that there is some feeling that this should be uh, turned out, refused, and I don't want to go into a detailed debate on grounds for refusal, but it would be helpful to just say uh, the exact basis on which that might be proposed. Chairman, uh, I've got a I, I, I must pull this one out. Um, we had an objector, a gentleman who actually lives there mm. in that area now, right at the start. And Councillor Bradenham did ask the developer whether they would be willing to um, take those uh, houses out. Clearly, the answer was no. Um, and we, I think we need to actually... Can you clarify? I uh, am very concerned that we don't appear to be taking any notice of what somebody who bothered to come on to uh, talk to us um, brought to our attention. Um, is there any way that in giving, if you give approval, and by the number counts, it looks as though that's going to be the case, that that gentleman is not going to um, be uh, having the disbenefit of being surrounded? Can those houses be taken out or... Um, are we giving approval for anything and everything here, including destroying somebody's quality of life who came and asked us not to? Mm. Just before, I'm going to refer that to officers. I'm not sure whether this is for the director or for Officer Sexton. Before we do that, I think it's just fair to Mrs Kirkham. She didn't actually say no to that. But understandably, she was not in a position no, to no. negotiate with us during the committee session. I don't know if the director would like to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, the application in front of you is, is, is the proposal that you're required to vote, to vote upon. Um, in certain circumstances, and you can see um, there, are, there is a condition concerning elements of the garage, but 
Um, the number of dwellings is at the centre of the planning commission in terms of the description, and it includes those two properties. I think there was also a suggestion that it might be replaced by a right of way, um, and that clearly would have implications that you would need to consult upon as well. So I think it's safest, um, given the nature of the potential change that was being advocated for you to consider the application in front of you, if that is acceptable, um, then obviously the matter is, is uh, determined in that way. Uh, if it's not acceptable, then clearly uh, it would be a matter for Red Rose and the um, uh, Planning Authority to consider further um, uh, as a part of a resubmitted application. But um, because the, the, it's a full application and the description is for 280 homes or so, uh, I think you're bound to determine the application submitted. I think we're coming to a conclusion on this, but I'm still not quite clear on what basis those who would wish to refuse the application would make that case. Can we just, which particular policy do you, do you feel is not compliant with? Uh, Councillor Heather, would you please? Chair, so just a couple of things. For my, um, I did quote HQ1 yes. as the policy um, earlier, but I, I won't re go through that. It was the issue with the windows. Now, my understanding from reading this was the reason the windows was fixed was for a privacy issue. Um, and neighbour amenity. I understand the issues of damp, but there, there are ways of having bathrooms without opening a window to resolve that issue. There's, you can ensure there's good ventilation, the lights, which building quality, I'm sure, would understand. I do not support the changes of not having fixed windows without that being consulted with those, with those neighbours, because... They, that might have been a determining factor for them that actually, yes, there was a window that was facing them, but it was going to be glazed and it was, it was going to be fixed. As soon as you allow a window to be opened, you are removing the purpose of the fixed glazing. There can be top vents, which can be slid. There are lots of ways. You, know, you, you go to a hotel, all the bathrooms are in the middle. There are no, bar, there are no windows. It can be achieved. So I was just saying on the proposal that Councillor Bradnam made, I do not support that because I think there would have been a, a reason why they have been asked to be um, fixed. And without knowing that, yes. we should not be making that change. I, I see your point, and there will clearly be need for further consultation, but I don't think we're going to be determining this application today on the basis of whether uh, some of the windows are fixed or not. That can be resolved at a later stage if there is good work. Directly, yes, please. Can I just, to assist the, perhaps to assist the, meet, uh, the meeting, um, uh, Condition 26, uh, I think Council Williams is quite right. The building regulations require no window, uh, don't make provision or require any windows in bathrooms because there is a requirement for mechanical ventilation um, in accordance with building regulations. Condition 26 uh, talks about uh, the requirement for um, uh, submission of, of, of uh, uh, for certain, certain properties uh, on their elevations uh, to be fitted with obscure glazing uh, and shall be fixed shut or have restrictors to ensure the windows cannot be opened more than 45 degrees beyond the plane of the adjacent wall. So the, um, the objective is to ensure that those, uh, even if they are openable windows, uh, are restricted in terms of the plane of, of, of opening. Uh, I think um, the... Uh, I think the condition doesn't itself require further submissions, um, but if you were if you were seeking to um, uh, have greater assurance about that, uh, you could specify that, that details were provided because clearly, in some circumstances, um, uh, the fixing of window uh, the opening of windows to restrictors would not represent an impact on amenity or privacy, uh, and uh, it may well be appropriate. Um, to uh, to require those details to be submitted rather than necessarily uh, because uh, in thank you for that director that with that having been said I would request members that we focus on the principle of development because I think we're ready now to determine this one way or the other Councillor Bradnam if you would like thank you very much chair I just wanted to clarify so we're saying that we're not talking about internal bathrooms we're talking about where there are already windows and we're saying where possible if they've got top hung vents, they can be opened to the maximum of 45 degrees. Um, and I would be happy if that also that does actually cover 86, because in 86 it's also specified that okay. it should be fixed shut. So where it's possible and courteous and not overlooking up, you know, not causing 
disruption to other neighbours, I would appreciate if we could ensure there are top rung vents so, so that people can. Can we then move to, back to the principal yes, as well? I think I'm not seeking to take further contributions at this stage. I think everyone's had an opportunity to contribute to the debate. I'm just going to very briefly remind us of the um, officer's recommendation on the planning balance and conclusion that this is a site already allocated for development. Uh, I think the officer and others have dealt in some detail with the question of affordable housing. Um, I think there was a fair bit of debate about the number of design styles. I think 16 different styles on three character areas within the estate. I think Councillor Milnes uh, stressed the amount of consultation that has gone on. Um, I would just remind you that the principal parish council involved, two parish councils involved here, one has a number of comments, uh, but Sawston Parish Council state that they support this application uh, and appreciate the effort to referring to the village design guide. So, Taking all of that into account, we, we come to paragraph 318 on page 75. Officers recommend that the Planning Committee grants delegated approval subject to prior completion of section 106 agreement and the conditions and informatives set out on which we have had a fair bit of discussion today. So I would now like to move to a vote and I think we do need to do this on the basis of a, uh, on, our, on our machines if I could put it that way. Um, are we ready to take a vote? So if we press the, uh, the blue button before voting. I think that is... That's the wrong application. Yes, perhaps we, can, perhaps we could take down the screen for a minute. Um, <laughs> but ignoring... Ignoring what was on the screen, I think we we have eleven present in the room. Okay. Oh, we're going to. What's happened to our votes? They, I was just about to read them out, and they've gone. <laughs> Do we need to take the vote again? Or yes. So cancel out the the vote that is in front of us, and if we would all start again, please. Um, We now have only nine in the room voting, is that right? I have two minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay, I think we now have 11 voting and that will probably do us. Uh, on that basis, we have eight in favor, two against and one abstention. So that is agreed, delegated approval. Uh, on that. Now, I said we'd have a break at uh, 11.45, but I was keen to conclude that matter. So, can I suggest we come back into the room for 12.15, um, if we may? So, the meeting is adjourned for 15 minutes.
We're now live. Uh, so we're resuming the uh, meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. I think you know who we all are. Um, we have resolved item five, and we're now moving on to item six, which is uh, phase two land in zone two at Granter Park, Great Abington, reserved matters application for research and development buildings and associated car parking. Um, yes, Councillor Hawkins. Sorry. I thought we were going to do the LinkedIn ones. No, we're going to come to those after this item. What we oh, agreed was to... Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll switch off. I think that's what we uh, proposed and voted on. Yes. Uh, so, um, and this is application 21.05165 REM uh, on pages 91 onwards in your papers today. Um, I would just say in considering this that whilst most of us have gone into this in some detail on previous occasions, we are considering this anew today. Um, so I think our, here we are, the key material considerations are set out on page 91. Um, and the officer's recommendation is approval. Presenting officer, Michael Sexton. Michael. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one brief update on this application. We have received a representation of objection following publication of the committee report. Uh, raises concerns of heritage impact, landscape impact, including from the wider surroundings, um, the extra vehicles that will be visiting the site. Uh, references a 2004 outline for phase two development, um, just on that point. Uh, to say that this application is pursuant to a 2015 outline application that's now in the report. Um, and the injection concludes that the development will be contrary to policies HQ1 and E15 of the local plan, design guide and master plans. Um, but most, I think most points are all covered in the report. So I'll move to my presentation. Thank you very much. Now, I did say earlier that we were allowing questions to officers at this stage. I just want to emphasize, in case there's any doubt about it, that it is not compulsory. Uh, particularly for those who have read the papers and uh, may be aware of the circumstances. Oh, we appear to have no questions to officers. Right, we'll then move on to uh, our public speakers. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I go too right. fast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, presentation is a reserve matters application at Phase 2 Land Zone 2 in Granter Park. Uh, it relates to research and development buildings, uh, landscaping, car park. Uh, the reserve matters being layout, scale, appearance of the buildings and the landscaping associated to those buildings. So this is the site, this is Grants Park as a whole. Uh, phase two land is in the southeast corner. Um, any members who attended the site visit uh, last month for the application on is the entrance of the site will recall that we bought this area. So this is currently an undeveloped parcel of land. Chair, could Mr. Sexton perhaps change his pointer to the laser oh, yes, so sorry. we can see him? Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you. There we go. Yeah, sorry. So just to repeat, I don't think Councillor Brandon was on the site visit, but we did have a site last month that was deferred. Uh, the entrance of the site, we did walk the, the site, so members may recall, we did um, walk past this area of the site as well. Um, that's just an aerial view of the existing park, and again, phase two land relates to this large parcel. The reserve matters application before members today is in this undeveloped area that you can see in there with the Illuminar Centre to the south. There is outline planning permission um, for the development of the site. It's quite a detailed outline consent um, condition for listed a number of approved plans, which I've set out in the report, um, which in effect do include layout um, and scale of buildings because these are parameter plans that have to be followed through into the reserve matter stage. So there's just an example of an approved uh, master, master plan site layout in the bottom left um, and the approved vertical parameter sections of the five buildings that you'll see later on. So quite a lot of detail was approved at outline stage. So this is the proposed site plan. You have the five main research and development buildings, the central area of landscaping um, with some of the attenuation works and the car park to the east, with, again, with then extended landscaping um, to the east of the site as you head out to the, the villages, which are over to the far right. 
Um, this is an example of elevations of buildings A and B, um, with the recessed plants above to reduce mass and scale of the buildings. Um, as you'll see when we come to some of the visuals, the, the design and architectural qualities of these buildings is fantastic, and it's a very high quality scheme. Um, a section plan through buildings A and B to show that these are three-story buildings with, with the plants above, fully in line with these section plans approved at outline stage. Um, building G, again, these all sort of follow a, a similar uh, design theme, three stories of plant above. Building H, which is the northernmost building and the closest building to Abington Hall, which is a grade two star uh, listed building, is uh, a two story plus plant that was reduced uh, in scale in response to that heritage setting. And again, just to emphasize the landscape strategy, there's a large amount of landscaping going on to the east of the site, significant amounts of landscaping going on in and around the buildings. Um, very positive contribution towards the scheme. Um, and then some visuals of how this uh, will sit within the park with the central landscape open space. Uh, the three, three buildings, this, this building here is the shorter one. This is looking south out of the park. Um, again, just a visual within the park and that central open space, which is intended as a, a communal area as much as anything else. People will be able to spill out and interact and, and how we like to see these things on business parks. And again, just another visual, as you can see, a lot of new planting going in. It's obviously not currently there uh, to integrate the building with the surroundings. Um, and the buildings have these terraced areas that sit above, uh, above the plant, which again provide extra amenity space for the occupiers of the buildings. Um, so key material considerations, compliance with the outline permission as set out in the report, obviously satisfies it, so it's fully compliant with the outline permission. The key matters before members today are the reserve matters of layout, scale, appearance of landscaping, although a lot of that information was secured at the outline approved plans. There will be a 40, 42% net gain in biodiversity as part of this development. There are conditions on the outline consent, but they are sort of, of their time being five years old, but the developer is seeking to aspire to greater than the conditions necessarily require. Um, blood risk and drainage, uh, again, it's reserve matters, but the LFA is satisfied with the details we have, and there are conditions on the outline consent. Highway safety, highway network and parking were largely dealt with, or effectively dealt with at outline stage. Um, access was covered at that point, and, uh, as was the traffic transport implication of the site. And there are section 106 contributions tied to that outline consent. Heritage impact is considered acceptable. It's in line with the considerations of the outline. Um, renewables and climate change, uh, again, the conditions on the outline are of their time, but the developer is seeking BRIAM excellence on all of these buildings. Um, Matters of noise, lighting, residential and meeting, other matters are all considered acceptable as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologise for mishearing you earlier on. I think, thought you said that concludes your presentation when you said you would move to your presentation. So, a significant difference. Um, do any uh, councillors want to ask any points of clarification based on that presentation? Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and through you, it's about trees. Um, one of the uh, points in the parish council objection was about 47 individual trees and one group of trees to be removed. And that also goes into paragraph 102 on page 108. It's just I have a big thing that says, please clarify what exactly is going on with um, the trees, please. Thank you, Councillor, through you, Chair. Um, I believe it is set out in my report. There are some existing trees within the site that are to be removed. Um, I think it's paragraph 102, as you referenced. Um, the trees to be removed are sort of the lower quality tree. Um, there's no objections to their removal from the council's landscape officer or, or trees officer. Um, and hopefully, as you appreciate it from the visuals, um, you, there's, a, there's a significant amount of planting that's going in. Um, so the loss of the you know, number lost is negligible compared to the number that are going in. But those that are lost um, have been identified as being moderate quality at best, and the majority of category C trees and of very low quality. And if that answers the question. Yeah. Kind of. Um, I think it, the thing is, when people look at this, oh, they're removing all these trees. And, um, 
but I know there's going to be more planted. However, it's whether or not those really have to go, I think. I don't know where they are. Yeah, I can, if it helps, I can bring up the arbicultural report, but I think some of those trees have to be removed to accommodate the footprint of the building. So there, there is a necessity. It's not removal for the sake of it. It's, it's necessary to accommodate the development. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradman. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about, sorry, I can't find it, the, the um, heritage impact, because I know we had, when we looked at this in outline, there were concerns related to protection of the historic building which is on the site. Could you just, just explain to us what's, what has happened there? Yes, I can. Let me um, share my screen again just to show. And, and one of the things was, uh, sorry, just thinking about it was, I remember it was to do with um, the vista both to and from the building. Thank you. Yeah, so Abington Hall um, is located to the north of the application site. Um, which is the Grade 2 star listed building. Um, these are the details approved outline stage. The response to the proximity of the northernmost building to the setting of the hall was that uh, the building would be uh, of a reduced scale, which is identified in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so there's a detailed heritage, heritage assessment submitted at outline stage, um, which considered the impacts. The response was that the northernmost building would be reduced in scale. That has been approved at outline, and that has been taken forward to reserve matters stage. So I think the heritage impact was largely dealt with at the outline stage of course these parameters. Um, nothing has really changed in that regard. So in terms of heritage impact, we're satisfied there's no, um, no further harm. Those have already been accepted. Sorry, and there was another You question. had a further question? Yes, I do. Yes. Thank you. And that was to do with the, the arrangement of the car parking on the eastern side. And I think some of that, there was a suggestion that some of that car parking would be also in set or with banks protect the view um, towards fr from the village towards the site. Is, is that correct? Or yes, that is on? correct. Um, again, I can open up a more detailed uh, picture if necessary, but there are a significant amount of earthworks that are being done over here to reshape the land, so it sort of gradually rises to conceal this area of parking. This is a decked car park, but it's just a, a two-layer sort of recessed into the ground, so um, I can pull up a more detailed plan if you'd like to see how that earth is shaped, but I just might need a minute to do that. That's fine, just to be reassured that it, the ground is being reprofiled to protect, to, to obscure the view, to shield yes, the view. Yes, it might not be clear, but these uh, sort of grey blue lines just to show the contour so it will rise up yeah. um, it, you know, towards the car park, so that will be screened. Yeah. Right, and I think we had a question from uh, Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just a very quick one, um, just to clarify a point. Uh, page 98, um, it says sustainable drainage, drainage engineer objection. And um, we've got some text below, which looks more like a, a condition than an objection. Um, but uh, apologies, Michael, if I've missed it, but I, I couldn't find any specific reference to that in the flood and drainage section. So has that issue that the sustainable drainage engineer raised been dealt with? Because um, it's still listed as an objection. It, it has been, yes. So the lead local flood authority did originally raise objection to the application as well. Both consultees did. The developer submitted further drainage information that, that came in and satisfied the objection of the lead local flood authority. Unfortunately, we didn't get a response from our drainage officer. But as this is a major scheme, um, the lead drainage consultant um, is the lead local flood authority. So I have um, absolute confidence that as the LFA is satisfied, the council's drainage engineer would have been as well, um, and just to highlight members, there are, there are conditions attached to the outline consent that require those, those details. Okay, thank you. Okay, councillors, I'd like to now move on to the presentations. Uh, firstly, we have um, Isabel Smith, who's also, I think, a member of Little Abington Parish Council, uh, I think online. Are you there? Hello, yes, I'm here. Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, three minutes when you're ready. I do have a, some slides. I don't know if uh, Lawrence has those ready. Thank you. Um, Little Abington Parish Council agrees with Great Abington Parish Council's objections to the proposed phase two developments, which you will hear shortly. We also objected the proposals as the Grant Park travel plan 
has not been updated since 2018 and therefore the application cannot be decided. For example, there is no new delivery date for the on-road cycle lanes along Newmarket Road, despite the 2018 plan stating they were to be implemented, implemented at the earliest opportunity. There is no update on what were called future initiatives, which included a three metre wide access point for pedestrians and cyclists at the main entrance to occur when site one is developed. We would like the travel plan to accurately reflect the state of access to the site. It does not mention that in May 2017, TWI and Biomed Realty decided to stop residents of the Abingtons from walking across Granter Park. This fundamental change to pedestrian access has never been included in any of the Granter Park travel documents. The government's guidance for travel plans states that they should address the transport impacts of development, promote sustainable travel, including walking, and mitigate the negative impacts of development. Yet the Granter Park travel plan does not address the harm to the community of withdrawing access to the site. Next slide, please. Granter Park is built on the parkland around Abington Hall. Abington is an estate village and the northern and southern access routes are the old estate roads that led to Abington Hall. Residents of the Abingtons had walked these roads for over 150 years. They had also used the path from the High Street. Despite appeals from the village, access to Granter Park along these paths has remained closed since 2017. Next slide, please. Villagers and visitors now have to walk along the rough road verges on Pampersford Road, Newmarket Road and Bournebridge Road. There are no tarmac footways and no street lighting on these roads and in many places traffic passes at 50 miles an hour. The removal of walking routes across Granter Park has affected children walking to Abington School from the land settlements and has impacted residents who enjoy walking and running around the village. In the future, it will make it difficult for residents to walk to the CSET 2 park and ride bus services leaving from Babraham. We are asking for today's decision to at least be deferred so that the travel plan can be updated and we would like planning conditions added that address the negative consequences of blocking access to the site to the community. Thank you. Uh, we on? Yes, thank you for that presentation. Um, if you hold on a moment, we may just possibly have a short question of clarification from Councillor. We have Councillor Heather Williams. Sorry, Chair. It was actually, I, I can't remember if I declared an interest as a member of the Grace Cambridge Partnership Assembly, which I don't think I did at the start and I should have done. Um, so I'm just raising Thank that. And then I would like some clarification from officers around this 2018 um, issue. So apologies, not, not a direct question. So not the, a question um, to uh, Will Smith. Um, officer, are you happy to take a question for Heather Williams at this stage or would you rather when we get to the debate later? Yes, please um, go ahead. Sorry, I did wonder whether it would be better suited for the debate because I think there will be other speakers who will talk about um, highways and access. Is that all right? So, we come back to your question later. I assure you we will do that. And I think also Councillor Jones Hales. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a, uh, Isabel Smith mentioned a footpath that used to go through the site which has been shut since 2017. I just wonder whether through you, um, Mr. Sexton could actually if he has that information, show us where it ran in conjunction to the roads that are marked in red that don't have footpaths now. Is that another one that would be usefully come to at a later stage? I, I think so. Yes, I don't have that to hand, but I will do some digging for yes. you. <laughs> Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Oh, okay. Just ask the question, but the supplement to that is, did Little Abingdon, or who did they talk to about getting this path back? available to them? Did they talk to sorry, anyone? Is that a question to Isabel Smith? Yes. Yes. So I'm did sorry, just say council, that again. Did I'm the parish sure council entirely. talk to the authorities responsible for the path to get it back? So, um, uh, yeah, you have, can I just answer that? Um, yeah, so uh, both the Little and Great Abington Parish Council um, regularly meet with Biomed Realty and we have had um, public meetings with uh, both uh, Biomed and TWI about the state of, the f of access um, and unfortunately we have had no progress on those issues so 
the three entrances remained closed off to, to residents of the village. Right, thank you for that. I think I next have Councillor Martin Khan. It's, it's, it's linked to the previous thing. How many, you state that the uh, piles have been used for, for very, very many years. Have you considered putting, making an application for the definitive map, uh, have it put on the definitive map? Yes, I have spoken to the footpath officer about um, having them designated as rights of way, but unfortunately, if Grant Park do not do not want that to go ahead, they can apply to have the footpaths blocked up whilst we're applying to have them opened. Um, so unless there is a will, I don't think that's a possibility. I'm Councillor Alan Bratton. Thank you, Chair. My question was to the officer on the same point, and it was, what was the previous designation of those footpaths before, uh, in other words, were they informal or were they public rights of way before um, the development at Abington sort of proceeded? Right. Well, if I may, we'll come back to that question also when we get to the debate. It may be covered by other um, public speakers. We'll see. Um, Councillor Brown Mills. Yes, could I just ask Isabel, on what grounds TWI gave for removing the permissive pathways across their land? Um, so I, I wasn't actually sort of privy to most of those discussions, so this is all sort of what I've heard. So uh, what happened is there was, um, there was burglary at TWI. Uh, as I understand it, the, the, the robbers actually cut the fencing on the perimeter and um, broke into the TWI buildings and this happened on two consecutive nights and the insurance uh, company then recommended that access to the site was restricted. This may be a matter on which it would be helpful. The next speaker may choose to deal with this, in which case I'd be happy to grant a little bit of extra time. Um, so I think that covers the questions from the room. Um, no further questions. Isabel Smith, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Right, our next uh, speaker is Arrestis Georgia Glue um, for Biomed Realty. Um, welcome. Um, you know the rules. Um, three minutes, and as I say, if you choose to address the issues which have just been raised, we have to give you a little bit of extra time to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Sorry, Chairman. Um, yes, I'll get you back to some of the presentation and then I'll come back, you know, as a separate matter to, to address the, the issue of the footpaths. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Members. Uh, Granta Park has been a scientific centre for, excellent, uh, for excellence for international significance for more than 20 years. The proposals before you today represent the culmination of extensive design, engagement and consultation with statutory consultees, our tenant base and the local community, and the valuable constructive feedback and input into this process has helped shape the scheme. Granta Park has played an active role within the local community, regularly hosting events such as the 10K Great Abington Run, use of the cricket field by Linton and Abington teams, access to the site nursery and state-of-the-art gym, and a close link with Great Abington Primary School. The reserve matters application is in full compliance with the parameters agreed and set out under the original Outland Planning Commission granted in 2015. In working closely with officers and consultees, our design team has managed to substantially exceed targets set out under the original parameters and introduce additional scope uh, that materially improves sustainability and biodiversity metrics, which demonstrate the firm commitment of Biomed Realty in delivering truly sustainable buildings of the highest quality that bring about positive change. In summary, the scheme will deliver over 34,200 meters squared of laboratory and office accommodation across five buildings with associated car and cycle parking set out within a beautiful, beautifully curated landscape. The development will in addition provide a BRIAM rating of excellent across all buildings, a well rating of gold, a wide score rating of gold. Um, it'll be an electric only scheme, so no gas here. Uh, the, uh, Introduction of on-site renewable technologies will help reduce the carbon emission reductions by 32.7%, which is significantly in excess of the uh, planning policy. And uh, there is a net gain in biodiversity, as the case officer mentioned earlier, well in excess of 40%, 40. Uh, there is also introduction of EV charging stations, 10% active, 40% passive, and 264 cycle parking spaces with associated facilities. 
The Cambridge market is experiencing significant shortfall in supply of laboratory accommodation. There is currently no available space at Granta Park, and Cambridge has zero vacancy as a whole. We are tracking in excess of 800,000 square feet of pent-up demand and are in, in ongoing discussions with a number of tenants that are expressing interest in these buildings. This follows the most recent delivery of the Port Bay building at Granta Park, where we had experienced in excess of 300% uh, uh, demand on the space available. Um, we held a design uh, enabling panel meeting on the 16th of September 2021, and I wanted to quote specifically from the response that this is a large and significant site within an extensive campus. The design presented at the meeting reflected the detail and historic knowledge of the architects. The proposals have the potential to be of worthy and positive addition to Granta Park. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank all uh, officers and consultees that have helped shape uh, this world-class new setting uh, for Granta Park. Uh, that concludes my speak, Mr. Chairman. I'm very happy to pick up on the point about the footpaths, Please. Uh, very briefly on that. Um, so yes, indeed, the footpaths that um, uh, have been in use for a number of years were closed in 2017. Um, as a point of order, the, the footpaths don't sit within the ownership um, of, of Biomed Realty. Um, they, sh they sit within the ownership of our adjoining owners, uh, the Welding Institute that have been on site since 1947, I believe. Um, it follows a, an event. I think the previous uh, speaker made a comment about a break-in that happened in 2017. On the back of that, the insurers visited the site. They went through a number of records of extensive CCTV footage that was available. Um, and they found that um, in the weeks leading up, if you like, uh, to the event, uh, unrelated to the event itself, um, there were some residents coming in from the footpaths, you know, and climbing up some of the staircases, looking at some of the noise, you know, supposedly the noise that's coming out of some of the equipment, chillers and fans of the site. Now, that is an issue from the insurer's standpoint that relates to the public liability cover. You know, if someone climbs up on a tall building and sort of falls or trips or, or you know, it's, it's a hazardous matter, so the a recommendation thereafter from the insurance was that they need to take better security around the footpaths to manage public access on site, uh, given you know, the impact that may have on the cover. Um, we are trying, uh, as an adjoining owner, to help mitigate the issue. Um, we have been uh, in extensive discussions in recent times with TWI to see if there is a way of finding a solution that addresses the concerns of the insurance company, but at the same time allows some level of controlled access. I don't think we'll be able to be able to go back to the, you know, f fully open accessibility as well, but we are hoping that we'll be able to come up to a conclusion that allows some level back to the site in a controlled and ordinary way. Thank you for dealing with that. Um, do I have any questions? We have a question from Brian Milnes first, Councillor Brian Milnes first, and then I'll come to you after that, Councillor Bradley. Uh, thank you. It's just to um, pick up on this uh, question of security and the insurers uh, suggesting that they need to close the public footpaths. And I think it's something that uh, uh, I would like to see pursued uh, as clearly access through this uh, very um, uh, much improved uh, environment would be uh, beneficial to the local residents. Councillor Madden. I don't think that was a question, was it? No. Uh, Councillor Bradley. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, I, I appreciate um, Mr. Sogloo has said that the footpaths are not in the ownership of the current applicant for this site. But I wonder they were if I could interrupt you, Councillor Bradley. I have a suggestion to make here, which is Wait, I don't can, I, think... can I just ask a question? May I? What I wanted to check was, does he know, were they permissive or were they public rights of way before? Uh, before you answer that, um, I don't think this is the basis on which this application is going to be determined. Clearly, there is a feeling in the room that it would be helpful if the issues raised by were pursued further. We're all aware, because you've stressed it, of your community relations, your willingness to address these issues. And I think it would reassure the committee if you were to say that you intend to pursue those discussions. However, I do not want to see the debate focus solely about this issue when there are other issues on which we need to be determined. Is that acceptable, Councillor Brandon? No, no, Chairman. I just wanted to ask, does he know whether they were 
public rights of way or were they permitted? Do you, would you like to answer that or should we come? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, the, they, we had checked that with our legal team and the answer is no, there weren't, there weren't any um, you know, rights. I think it's the 1833 Act that relates to easements in general. And yeah, there, there was no um, permissive you know, uh, uh, matter under, under that Act arising. Um, Sorry, do you, with your permission. Not a matter which is going to be resolved in just, this chamber sorry, today. I just didn't understand. Did you, did, was, Mr., uh, was this gentleman saying that there were no public rights of way and no permissive rights of way? Because they're two different things? Yeah, so in terms of the, the, the first part, you know, the uh, rights, registered rights, if you like, under the Act, there weren't any. Uh, the permissive ones, I can't answer that question. I'm not, I'm not aware of the, the point. Um, thank, thank you very much. If I could, thank you. Um, yes, please. Mr. Chairman, sorry. Uh, one more point I wanted to raise on an earlier matter that um, uh, Councillor Hawkins raised about the trees, just to be yes. uh, clear on that one. So, y yes, some of these trees uh, will be removed from the current position, which is a nursery to the rear of the site. Um, I've got a letter here which I can make available to the uh, members to review by an arboriculturalist that we've employed to look at that. And our intention is to translocate the vast majority of the trees that are fit for translocation on other locations around the campus. You know, so it's not a matter of removing, I believe, destroying the trees, it's more about removing them to another location within the campus. That's Thank the you. intention at the moment. And again, the letter is available for members. Thank you for that and for mention of the letter, but I won't seek to put that into circulation today. I think we have plenty of information before us. Um, I think you've helped us with questions, including on other issues. Um, I think we'll um, thank you for your time and move on. And next we have, sorry, too late. Uh, next we have Councillor Tony Orgy. Uh, who is Chair of Great Abington Parish Council. Um, Councillor Orgy, you're speaking, I think, on behalf of the Parish Council, and I'm sure you can confirm mm -hmm. that you have their consent to do so. Yeah. Yes. yes, I can. Yes, please. Yes, I can. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the Parish Council is concerned about the statement and the response from the urban design team that officers are generally supportive of the proposals in urban planning terms. Granter Park is not situated in an urban area or environment, and developments on the Granter Park site need to reflect its rural setting in design terms. Initial buildings on the site were limited to two storeys, and the existing buildings on Granter Park mostly fit reasonably into the rural landscape. However, the cumulative massing and proximity of the proposed buildings to one another will, in the Paris Council's view, lead to structures that increasingly dominate their setting. The Parish Council notes that it is proposed that 47 individual trees and one group of trees would be removed, with a group of trees being presumably that group covering an area of one hectare. The Parish Council is very much opposed to the loss of existing trees, and especially on such a scale as is proposed. The Parish Council is also concerned about traffic. Pre-pandemic, there were already problems with the existing traffic uh, to Granter Park using the site, with traffic in the morning peak particularly queuing back as far as the A505 in both directions. This congestion not only caused delays into the site, but also the associated tailback caused, caused delays to traffic on Newmarket Road, both to local traffic and to traffic, traffic exiting south from the four Wentways service area. In living with a pandemic, as traffic levels to existing uh, uh, businesses fell very considerably, but if they regain their pre-pandemic levels, then it's likely that congestion problems to Granter Park entrance will re-emerge. And that's before the addition of the additional over 1,000 uh, car parking spaces that are proposed as part of this scheme. However, if traffic levels do not return to pre-pandemic levels from existing businesses, then is there really a need for as much as over a thousand new car parking spaces? Mitigation of traffic movements is necessary, and the Parish Council's view is that there should be substantially improved active travel means of travel between Granter Park 
and Linton, Sawston and Cambridge not building more car parks. Finally, we are aware of the presentation by Little Abington Parish Council that you've heard from Isabel Smith and share their concerns about this reserved matters application. So, Granter, but also uh, Great Abington Parish Council does not support this planning application. Thank you. Do we have any questions, Councillor Hoggy? We have a question from Councillor Jim Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and for you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Orji, for your presentation. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I think you have heard that the 47 trees uh, were being moved from where they are now elsewhere on the site. Um, will that uh, confirmation be sufficient to remove that objection from the Parish Council? Well, what I've heard this morning is the first time I've heard about trees being moved. I thought the original documentation suggested that the trees weren't of very good quality and would be taken out. Uh, okay, but well, you have... I mean, I, I, do, have... I do accept that uh, the planning application that's in front of you does include the provision of, of a substantial number of new trees mm -hmm. um, and uh, probably more than the trees that will be moved out. But on the other hand, is there a need to take these trees out as well? Right. Okay. Well, at least hopefully that kind of addresses that, that specific issue. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to clarify with you, if I may, Chair, through you, um, is on your comment about the design. Um, obviously, we have uh, urban design officers, and the idea is that they look at the design of buildings. Um, but the design here, if you look at paragraph 92, talks about design of appropriate quality, um, which follows some of the what is already on the site anyway. Again, um, I mean, would that address what the parish council thinks should be um, a, an objection, really? I, I think the parish council's view was... was summarized by the second visual that was shown. The first visual, if you remember looking at these sites, was an aerial view looking down. The second visual was at human height. And I think the, the feeling is that these buildings are closely clustered, particularly buildings A and B, which are close together, uh, in a sense gave a massing and a dominance in that part of the development. So um, the quality of the individual buildings is one issue. The, the, the impact of them as they're situated, I think, is what the parish council is concerned about. Right. I see no further questions. Councillor Orji, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now we have two local members, one of whom, of course, is present in the room, but the other one, Councillor John Batchelor, I hope he's going to join us online. Are you there, John? I'm here, yes. Right. Please. Good afternoon, Please. members. We can hear you very good just now. Yep, yeah. okay. So, first thing to say is that uh, Granted Park is a world class research facility which we're very proud to have in our ward uh, so um, I'm very supportive of the work that goes on there and it's important work but it's also important that uh, any new development there actually meets the requirements of the planning policy so the first thing to say I would agree with greater um, Abingdon Parish Council that the size of this building is massing um, and its influence on a very sensitive area is actually not acceptable. The, this is sitting right on the edge of the um, development. Uh, it's well above the tree line and will be very intrusive um, in terms of the view from outside of 
um, the research area. So there's that element, um, which I think in planning terms would mean that it doesn't meet the requirements of HQ1. Landscaping, uh, we've already heard a number of comments about the trees. I mean, there's a further complication here, as you recall from the, uh, the last meeting, that the previous owner of, of the site believes that he has a covenant that the current owners agreed to uh, that would mean that it would be impossible to actually remove these trees. Um, I understand you've had legal uh, advice that this isn't material to this particular planning application, but it's worth bearing in mind that it may, it could possibly prevent this project from going forward. So trees are still an issue. Um, and there's also been uh, mentioned is the car parking and this proposal and an associated one is likely to produce something in the order of a further 1300 uh, car movements into the site. 1300, that's a significant number. And in those terms, I don't believe it actually meets the requirements of TI stroke two, which is for sustainable travel. Uh, I think much more effort should be made to reduce uh, the car use. So cumulatively, I believe that it doesn't actually meet three of our main um, policies. And on that basis, I think it should be rejected. Thank you. Any questions to Councillor Batchelor? Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Councillor Batchelor. Which building were you referring to that was close to the edge of the development? It's the one that you were discussing. The largest one, which is effectively four storeys. That's, are, that's there right. Are, Five or six buildings, aren't there? Is it H you're talking about that's closest to the? I, I don't know. And it is, but it's the, it's the one, the one that actually on the board the, is. Uh, the plan one. up again. Yes, please. Could could um, perhaps Mr. Sexton could show us? <clears throat> it's not numbered on there. Does that help you to? Yes. Is Mr. Sexton pointing out which one he thinks is? Because, sorry, Councillor Batchelor, you said there was one close to the perimeter of the site. And actually, my observation is that the one um, on the top right of the three buildings, on the right of the um, sustainable drainage ponds, where you've got your cursor, was actually the one where the height was being reduced to avoid, to reduce the impact on Abington Hall. Whereas the other four, so I think that one is two storey, whereas the four buildings to the south are three storey. But never, notwithstanding that, they're all within the body of the site. They're not near the edge of it, as far as I can make out, unless somebody could explain. Uh, Councillor Batchelor, I think you're muted. I can't place myself on this at the moment. Where's the actual the way into the site? Right. So we've got this roundabout here, haven't we? Okay. And the proposed area is immediately to the left of it as you come in, isn't it? Councillor Batchelor, that's why I asked the question. The, the site that we're talking about is in the southeastern corner, in other words, at the opposite end of the site from where you enter. And it's an area I remember seeing on a site visit some years ago when we were first looking at the outline. And I, that's why I couldn't understand why you mentioned it being on the edge of the site, because none of these buildings, to my understanding, are actually in the sense of being on the edge of a site and therefore intrusive to... The, the amenity of the neighbouring Councillor Batchelor, would you prefer that we put that back to the case officer? 
that yeah, clarify. please. If you recall that we did see some um, mock-ups which showed uh, the tree line and and how the the building would would uh, appear from outside of the site. Councillor John Batchelor is referring to an application of the four members um, last month for site one for Hunter Park, which is where I'm indicating now of the entrance to the site. There were visuals shown of how that would sit from outside of the site. That is not the application that is before you now. The application before you is, is in the southeast corner. It's an entirely separate application. That's helpful. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Mm. Right. Uh, any more questions to Councillor Batchelor? I think not. Thank you. Okay. So that ends our public speakers, and we can now move to the debate. Um, yes, before we do that, I'd, but perhaps you would come in on the debate in a minute, Councillor Khan. Uh, uh, Councillor Batchelor, would you take one more question, please? No, no, I wanted to ask a question of officers about yes, clarification. We'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so before we start the debate, I'd just like to ask the director to comment on some of the... I think there's been some misunderstandings yeah. here that perhaps could clarify. I think it's probably helpful just to, just to make a, a, a kind of broad comment because you've heard a number of, of speakers refer to planning application. This, of course, is not a planning application. Um, and the planning permission for this development has already been granted. Uh, and the terms of that planning permission, including the quantum of car parking spaces, the means of access, the heights of buildings, the siting of the buildings by and large, the disposition of the buildings uh, and their uh, width and so on, are approved. Uh, they were approved in 2015 as part of that outline planning permission. Um, uh, and the approval of the reserve matters in this case, as Mr Sexton highlighted, relates to the details of the rendering of that planning permission. You're not granting a new planning permission, and understandably, uh, there continue to be concerns about transport and traffic and so on. Uh, but the consideration of the transport effects of the development uh, was part of the planning permission, and it's not a matter that you can effectively reconsider uh, at this stage, provided that the uh, submissions before you correspond uh, and fall within, uh, and as they say legally, within the ambit of the outline planning permission. And you might have heard that term before. Um, and my understanding is that in terms of the car parking numbers, for example, uh, and in terms of the um, fundamental layout built for heights, and therefore the relationship with the historic building, the grade two star uh, listed building, uh, those matters are beyond your consideration at this point. The matters that you're considering are landscaping arrangements, the elevational form disposition. Uh, yes, scale and um, uh, layout are part of the considerations in front of you, but you have to constrain yourselves to within the parameter plans that the planning permission has set. Uh, so you cannot de the applicants indeed cannot deviate from those plan parameter plans in terms of siting, um, and there was a lot of consideration given uh, to building heights, visibility, and indeed landforms at that outline stage uh, that resulted in those, in those parameters. So it's really just to kind of caution the committee in terms of the extent to which they can stray into some of those issues, uh, given that um, the outline planning commission, as Mr. Sexton identified, is, is actually incredibly rigid in terms of the um, parameters before you today. I think, Councillor Khan, did you want to ask a question or does that answer it? Uh, right. Well, before we get to the debate, then, uh, we will take a few more questions to officers, starting with Councillor Khan, if you may. Uh, it's basically about the concern about access to the site and the, and the footpaths and so on. Um, I was wondering how much this is a material con uh, consideration because uh, I, I, I would have thought that the, it would only be a consideration to the extent that the actual development constrains access that there is. And I'm wondering wherefore, where it is actually beyond consideration in terms of dealing with this particular planning application. Could we have some clarification? Thank you. Um, in paragraph 130 of my report, um, I have gone into a bit more highway and transport detail than I perhaps would have done, so I suppose it would come up. 
it does highlight that there are three Section 106 agreements associated to the outline permission that do require uh, various financial contributions and the provision of new footway and cycleways. Uh, within the wording of one of the 106 agreements, it requires an initial payment to be made to the County Council prior to commencement of development. Um, it then requires to construct a pedestrian and cycle routes within the development linked to ex existing Grants Park, um, carries on, um, prior to first occupation. So there are going to be a raft of additional um, accessibility measures to come forward. They are secured through the Section 106 agreements as part of the outline consent, but as Mr. Kelly just highlighted, it's not a matter really before members today. But just to assure you, that was thoroughly considered, and the, and the 106 secures funds and timescales for when funds have to be paid and works have to be carried out to improve in the accessibility. Right, Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Um, as a matter of clarification on what um, Stephen Kelly has told us, I recall there being very strict requirements around the number of total number of car parking spaces on the site and also very strict travel plan arrangements which are already in place on the site. So what I wanted to clarify is there is a perception, as expressed in the concerns, that there's an additional 1,300 car parking spaces. Can you confirm because we have a paragraph 135 on page 113 reference to the approved outline consent identified a total number of 1,018 car parking spaces, etc. So is this really an extra 1,300 car parking spaces or is this part of the original outline plan? Was it covered by the original travel plan or is this additional provision? Through you, Chair, the car parking proposed within the reserve matters layout is the quantum of parking that was agreed at outline stage. Thank you very much. Right. I think that deals with all the questions of clarification. Uh, I beg your pardon. One more. Councillor Joe Sales. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> through you, and I, I could do with some advice here, Chair, um, as to whether this is the appropriate point to ask the question. Um, it's to do with the access across the site. Ask, ask it anyway, and we'll tell you afterwards whether it was appropriate or not. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's to do with the access across the site that the parish councillor uh, raised that had been shut off since 2017, and then the applicant made the statement with regards to the burglaries and what have you and people accessing the building. And I just wonder whether or not there was any leeway within the decision-making that we do today for requests for additional security measures for the buildings themselves to be put in place. I mean, if you, if you um, cast your mind to this building alone at the back, we have a fire escape which is secured from the inside. So you, it's secure from the outside, but you can still use the fire escape. So I'm assuming that could be um, put onto the buildings here. So that then essentially secures from the public access. That would then allow the public access back across the site with the security for the, the buildings themselves. Um, either that, uh, or if the site was to remain shut to public access, the parish council put up um, a map of the red lines and it said, right, red lines where the roads have no footpaths. I would, I would imagine <clears throat> that it would be a big stretch to ask the developer to put in footpaths all the way around to allow access around the site, if you like, and leave it shut. So there is a question in there for the officers, um, if you understand what I'm getting at here. There's a kind of a, a, an either or in my, in my book. One is a damn sight cheaper than the other. Yep, yeah, so through you, Chair. Um, I don't think it is within the gift of this application to, to do that, unfortunately. Um, clearly, it can be noted in the minutes following the meeting and. Um, the applicant is here and the meeting is, is broadcast. So I think the concerns of members is, is quite evident. Um, but I don't think there's any mechanism, certainly within the Reserve Matters application before you, to, to seek any of that, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a question from me, if I may, to officers. Uh, as was clear earlier on, this is a different application. Some of us visited the site in relation to Site 1. Uh, on a previous occasion. Um, could we just have for the record what is the 
uh, the situation in relation to the master plan for the overall site. Yes, Therese, I thought you'd ask me that question, so I have it prepared. Um, I was going to bring up one of the pages from the 98 design guide. So this is uh, figure one from the 1998 Grants Park design guide. Um, sort of the phase one of Grants Park is this, I can't do my point, I don't think, but is this sort of western area. So the design, 1998 design guide relates to the development of phase one. Phase two that's before you today is, is this green area um, to the east, uh, southeast of the site. So there's, there's no guidance within this 1998 design guide that I would say is directly applicable to the, uh, the applications before you today, which has clearly been very well set out in the outline permission. Thank um, you. If it also helps in terms of the restrictive covenants that was mentioned, just mm -hmm. for clarity, that was brought up with, in relation to site one and the trees that are around the western edge of the site. Um, the, uh, the finalised, there's no covenants, no similar covenants um, on this part of land. So again, that, that reference is relevant to the site one application, not the application for four members at this That's point. Very helpful to the extent that the master plan is relevant. It's not to this site, and it's the 1998 master plan that right. we were looking at then. So, uh, Mr. Reid would like to contribute. Thank you. Uh, Chair, just to say that uh, Burkitts, who wrote the letter about the covenants, are taking instructions with a view to withdrawing uh, that part of the letter that referred to the covenants, it not being a material planning consideration. Thank you, that's helpful. Shall we then start the debate? And as before, I think it would be helpful if we could address ourselves to the key material considerations as on page 91. Who wants to uh, lead off? Councillor Brown, Brown, Brown Just a quick comment, really. As we're being uh, directed to restrict ourselves to uh, the matters uh, in, reserve ma in reserve matters context, um, I've not seen this before at all, um, and um, I'm struck by what were described as architecturally uh, significant uh, developments, but thinking they look very concretey uh, and obelisk-like. And I'm just uh, minded that when we see such imagination as Bosco Verticale in Milan, where um, the greenery uh, uh, flows down from uh, the balconies of every apartment. Uh, if we did more of that more widely, and here specifically, it might just address some of the concerns that local residents have, uh, because clearly the massing that they referred to is significant, and although there are um, screening uh, by use of uh, the land uh, and contouring the land, uh, it will still add to a significant impact onto the, uh, this formerly rural uh, surrounds, but which is now clearly a commercial business park of some repute. Uh, and it seems to me that it was always intended that this uh, site could grow in the manner that we're considering now. Thank you. Can I just check, did you use the word obelisky? Was that the word you intended? Perhaps we have a different well, understanding right. of an obelisk. I could do some wordling on uh, the use of my uh, okay. vocabulary. I'm sure flat, we'll flat what you concrete meant. edifice, perhaps. Right. Is that better? Thank you, that's much clearer. Right. Okay. Um, I think in that case we'll go to our other local member, uh, Henry Ratchel. Thank you, Chair. Um, a bit confused now um, as my main concerns I was going to voice in the meeting uh, mainly revolved around level of parking the possible impact upon the listed building on the site and also the access to the site as we've gone through the uh, the presentation I understand now those are now no longer issues that we can discuss at the reserved matter stage because they've already been agreed at outline albeit they are listed as key material considerations within our um, within our agendas. So I, think, I feel we're actually quite blinkered as a committee into what we can and actually can't discuss because it looks like 90% of it has already been agreed. So we're pretty much talking about how the building looks and, uh, and whether we feel that is appropriate or not. 
Um, and given I feel no concerns around the appearance of the building have been raised by anyone so far, as far as I can see, um, I feel in a position where my concerns that I have, you know, regretfully aren't really relevant at this stage because as we've heard from officers, they've already been agreed. So, I mean, with some regret that I can't talk about them now, I mean, I feel I, I'm not in a position to refuse this, so we'll likely be voting to approve, Chair. Thank you. Um, yes, we, we did have guidance on that. As you say, some of these matters are listed amongst the key material considerations. I think possibly if we look to the planning balance on page 117, that may be helpful to... Uh, the director's going to clarify. Just, just to um, just to clarify, particularly around the issue of um, setting on historic buildings and and, and so on, um, it's not that you're not entitled to consider those matters, but you have to consider them in the context of the parameter plans that have been determined acceptable. So you'll you'll notice that the um, so, so the impact on the historic building of the details submitted is a material planning consideration. Uh, and the um, Historic England, you'll notice, and uh, the uh, Conservation Officer have commented on that and, and deemed it to be acceptable. The point I was trying to stress was um, that in considering the uh, merits of the proposal, you, in a sense, need to need to have regard to what's gone before in terms of that analysis. Uh, and, um, and certainly from an officer perspective, um, uh, those fundamental elements of impacts and so on, particularly in relation to, to transport, which um, I think Mr Sexton's also clarified, you need to see the whole of the planning permission and its mitigations rather than just um, uh, the uh, particular matters before you, before you today. But it's in that context that um, you're entitled to consider the impact of the historic building, but you would need to do so having regard to the parameters that have been determined previously, which we've obviously sought to outline. Right. Uh, we have the three councillor Anna Bradman next. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, so I might be, I was thinking about it, I might be one of the few people who did actually take part in the consideration of the outline plan. So I'm, I've um, witnessed this from the start, yes, as it were. Thank you. Sorry, Carrie. Okay. Um, so, and also I have looked at this application when this. Um, section segment was considered because I remember, you know, hence the comment about the car parking. What so one of the things, as I understand it, that we can comment on is the appearance of the buildings, mm -hmm. because um, what slightly alarms me. I mean, actually, I think the layout. I remember we worked quite hard to ensure that the suds were um, going to be, uh, you know, acceptable within the location. What strikes me about the building in the design and access statement section one just as an example um i actually think well i, I sort of have some sympathy with what with, with what councillor milne said about um, the appearance of the buildings i find them very white and very striking and very square and um and very uncompromising in their shape and I, I know it's too late to sort of do anything about that, but what slightly concerns me is that the, the, hot, the overall appearance isn't very attractive. And I just notice if that's to do with, and I would quote you from our op officer report at paragraph 89, perhaps that is because the material palette includes twice-fired, two-coloured, white-glazed ceramic baguettes and window head profile. And I'm not being, I'm, and I'm sure that's appropriate wording for what it is. I'm just trying to work out what a ceramic baguette is. Um, but I suspect it means it's something white anyway, which is what I'm sort of objecting to in this. There's no um, attempt to try and let the buildings, you know, they're working really hard in this visualisation with this lovely pond, uh, ponds and uh, and open water occupied space but there's really not much in the way of compromise on the structure of the buildings to make them blend in with that green um that green environment you know what i'm talking about here and 
I just I'm a bit disappointed that there's not more effort to make these look a bit less white. Is there any way we can do anything about that? Is there anything we can do about the surface treatments, the materials? To you know, I don't you know, appreciate that they want to. This, as Councillor John Bachelor pointed out, this is a an excellent. A, this is a centre of excellence, and I appreciate there's a wish to make this this um, like one coherent design, but it's very harsh. And I just wondered if there's some way it could be softened. Thank you. Okay. Yes, perhaps the director would like to comment on that. I think I think it might be helpful for Michael to share the slides. I mean, I think I think the the ambition and the use of tiles, uh, or effectively these um, ceramic um, uh, tiles on the building, will actually give it a more textured look than perhaps is is becoming apparent from some of the uh, imagery. Uh, and I think it's a deliberate attempt, quite probably, to introduce a degree more texture than large single flat. Uh, planar panels uh, which characterize much of um, what we might have considered in the past to be kind of office archi you know office park architecture uh, and I think the design review panels um, comments and, and and their view about that response in terms of the materials uh, and the uh, and the landscaping in combination you know led their conclusion to be that, that it's a very positive I absolutely understand and indeed, uh, I think Councillor, um, uh, Parish Councillor Overy's comments around urban design, I wouldn't say it's necessarily uh, purely urban in terms of its form, you have to see it in context, but these are quite large structures. Uh, and I think it's probably the renderings and so on are not particularly effective at trying to give some sense of that uh, uh, texture, as opposed to the very crisp and clean lines that we've seen. Um, Could but I mean, it's a matter for members to consider whether it's unacceptable as a white uh, uh, tile building uh, rather than um, uh, I'm not sure that colour would make a dramatic difference to it to be honest with you. Could Mr Sexton show that picture? It's, the, it's one of the first ones, thank you. Uh, it, um, if you notice the building in the background, I don't know if it's greyed out deliberately, but it just hides itself a bit more and these look very shiny white, and I think they're going to be visible from a very long way away. I think the point about the parameter plans, though, is that there were um, view impact assessments undertaken, um, uh, which determined those parameters so that the visibility of the building was limited. Not objecting was, was to the scale beyond or, the, or the massing. I'm just objecting to the materials used because it's very white. Uh, you know, even if some of the buildings had a different surface treatment that might be might make it less um or overbearing can i ask councillor bradman whether you've i'm sure you have considered the urban design officer's comments on those points paragraph 92 and particularly the end of that paragraph I did, I did see that, and I recognise that this is, whilst it's a rural location, the park itself is, is quite urban. But um, I just felt it was rather uncompromising, and given that they're doing such a good job, I mean, if it does work out like that, it'll be great. Um, but I just thought the buildings within that are, A, very samey, which is probably deliberate, but I don't like, and B, very... Um, white. <laughs> I quite like it if right. some of them were a different colour. <laughs> I think I, I need to ask the case officer just to put this in context of earlier decisions. Um, Sexton, yeah, it was just to, to draw members' attention, uh, condition five of the outline consent does actually require the submission of materials um, prior to works above ground level. Um, I don't imagine that they would seek to vary too much from what's before you Today, because it is, it is whilst creating its own identity, it is reflective and responsive of some of the other buildings within the park. Um, but just to draw your attention, there is a condition, condition five, that would need to be discharged in terms of the materials. So we can take some of the concerns away um, if, it, if it's a consensus view, whether it's just Councillor Bradnam's. I quite like the materials and the appearance, but that's where design is 
mm -hmm. subjective and some of us would like it and some of us won't but there is a condition for materials on um, on the outline consent and we can take concerns away in response to that, if, through you, Chair, I, I just noticed that um, paragraph 89 refers to twice-fired, two-coloured, white, glazed, ceramic, and a baguettes, I assume, means tiles, um, and, and a reflective glazed base set behind exposed columns, blah, blah, blah. All of that talks about white, and I just wondered... Do all the buildings have to be the same white? I, I know that there's a re reference to the, the palette drawing it in part from existing buildings within Grand Park, while also establishing a distinctive identity and language to the buildings in this phase. So I sort of understand that they want to make this bit distinctive in its own right, but I just find it a bit... Um, it's kind of oppressive in white in the same way that black would be. You know, do, do, it would be quite... But anyway... That's my view. I'm not, I'm not okay, going to vote against your view it. For the, I just think for the it debate. would be nice if it was um, a bit I less oppressive. Councillor Milnes wants to come back and then Councillor Khan after that. Yes, because I think um, Councillor Budman and myself are, are sharing the reservation about a large number of large buildings with uh, large faces of principally white and how that sits. Uh, in context of the business park, of the commercial park, uh, and its impact on neighbouring um, villages particularly, and its, um, its aspect. And it's why I mentioned Bosco Verticalis, because that uh, in impact lessens the uh, dramatic uh, nature of all these white surfaces. Yes. Okay, before we have further discussion on this point, I, I just want to emphasise that we are not a design panel. This has been referred to a design panel, and there's a limited amount to it, the extent to which we can impose our own, uh, what must inevitably be subjective rather than objective views on, on that. Councillor Khan. Well, just to show that it's subjective, uh, I take actually a rather opposite view. I think the bright white uh, is actually quite nice in terms of inter integrating into the Park. I think it creates a, a, a distinctive feature which will be interesting in visiting. I'm not so worried about the massing from viewed from the surrounding villages. I think that it's something new which is probably worrying people, but I think people will, it, it's a sufficient, sufficient distance to become part of the landscape in time uh, with the extensive landscaping that's discovered. I think modern buildings which are simple in design like this, Basically, their features are determined by the setting and the way that they're arranged in the landscape and the landscaping around them. That's what makes them. Otherwise, it's a, if it's just concrete and urban, it, it really does look awful. But in this case, I don't think it will. I think actually it would be something, a place that people would want to visit. And in this sense, I, I rather, I don't, I don't agree with this concern about the white. I actually rather like it. So, and this is a subjective. I agree it's a subjective view, but that's the way I feel. Thank you. Thanks for Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. And an attempt to, to move us slightly away from the, the colour of the buildings, Chair. Um, from the advice that we've had from Mr Kelly, it's very much on a lot of these. Yes, we consider them, but we consider them as to whether they're compliant to the outline as opposed to any changes or anything. So on that basis, Chair, I can't see anything that I think does not fit with the Outline Planning Commission. I, I might, as others, have reservations and disagreements, but... But on a matching cross-cast cross exercise, it, it fits um, with the, the requirements. When it comes to the, the scale and the massing, I, I won't linger, Chair, on the, on the colours of the buildings. I think whether we, it's our preference or not, I think there is an argument for them being the way they are. And obviously, it's gone through those panels. Um, one thing that when we had the site visit that I was particularly impressed by was with the car parks, their living walls, and the way that did help things blend in. Um, but we know that they require a lot of work um, to have, you know, vertical growing of, of plants. So I just would like some reassurance, Chair, before we go to the vote, and I, I think we're getting to that point soon, um, that there is some maintenance because given that obviously that does require um, significant maintenance, that there is that in the conditioning um, that, that we can... Um, because I think that would have a significant impact, obviously, 
having luscious mm. plant, um, plants and landscaping is great so long as it stays that way because then the impact would be changed. Mm. Thank you, Chair. Perhaps we could ask. Certainly, yeah. Through you, Chair. Um, just for clarification, it's not a car park in, in the same manner as the ones you saw on the site visit. This isn't three or four story car park, it's, it's, it's just a simple one deck car park that is built in, the earth is being, oh, the landscape as a whole is certainly covered by Sorry, conditions. what I'm saying is there are lots of things like this on site. Are we ensuring that these things as a whole, our landscaping is maintained going forward? And I just use that as a reference point um, as to, you know, there's a lot of landscaping commitment on site. How sure are we that this can be managed and continued? Sorry if I wasn't clear, Chair. That's right, through you, Chair. I think it is set out in the report, but there are a number of landscape and um, ecological conditions on the outline, which would include details of, of management and maintenance. So that is that is covered, yes. Right. Uh, perhaps I would, if I may just comment in passing, that when we made that site visit, I think some of us were impressed with the extent to which those had been maintained. Not that that's a relevant factor here. I think Councillor Jess Hales wanted to contribute to the debate. Thank you, Chair. You're going to be delighted that I'm going to stick my oar in on this one but I've been listening intently whilst Googling. And many, many years ago, I had the privilege of working on an award-winning building in Basingstoke. And this is just a point for the future, okay? Because all the things that have been said with how a building looks from a distance and what have you, Mountbatten House in Basingstoke has just been listed by English Heritage. And it was the one that I helped to refurbish. It is essentially green on every single level. It looks gorgeous. So you could have a look at that and then that might be something that future developers of these types of um, uh, sites might want to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful contribution. I would urge members to have a look at that after rather than before we come to our decision on this. As Councillor Heather Williams just said, I think we're approaching the point where we are able to come to a view. Um, before we go to a vote if necessary. Is anyone proposing to oppose the recommendation on page 118? Uh, officers recommend that the Planning Committee approves the application subject to the conditions as set out. Is this something we can, I don't see anyone, is this something we can approve by, uh, Councillor Hales is about to, uh, to propose that we oppose it, is that right? Absolutely not. No. It was just one thing I was gonna say, if I may, Taking in what Mr. Kelly said about, um, and Mr. Sexton, that reserved matters, the, the pits I, ra I raised about access through the site, perhaps it might be that officers could mention what was said, and that can be given some consideration from their perspective rather than from our perspective to reopen that access for the, the, the community as was for the last hundred and odd years. That's the only thing I'd like to say. Subject to that suggestion, which I think we have to understand cannot be a condition, um, does anyone wish to... I'm moving to the vote. Does anyone wish to... I'm proposing to move to the vote. Would you wish to postpone the vote so that you can make a further comment? Please. Um, it's clearly we can't uh, affect the number of car parking spaces. That's fixed, that's numbered. Uh, but clear, uh, there isn't any really good, effective, sustainable transport for me at the moment, but some is proposed in the, fuse, uh, in the future. Um, I would uh, suggest that maybe some comment uh, in the informative is that one would hope that um, the uh, provision might be revised, reviewed in, uh, in, in accordance with future development of sustainable transport. Well, uh, that's just a comment, whether, whether it's feasible, whether you think it's common. Something like that. I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that actually you could construct a condition around that because obviously you'd have to have regard to circumstances at that time and uh, both the county, uh, you'll, be, you'll be aware that the combined authority are reviewing the uh, transport and connectivity plan which will um, help shape the county uh, highway team's responses um, and, and our local plan itself is going through a review process. So I think it's probably something that um, uh, the applicants will have heard. Obviously we're very acutely conscious of uh, the ambitions around that and the importance of um, more sustainable means and of course uh, the Greater Cambridge Partnership are also looking to uh, try and affect change in that in that space because I can't right. I don't think of uh, thank you for that Councillor Khan I'm now proposing to move to the vote 
Um, do I need a proposal to that effect? Or can we just move well, on? No, I was always just going to say, I wonder whether it could be put in the informative rather than in condition. Right. I propose now to move to the vote. Do I have a... Yes, I think I have a seconder for that. I'm therefore going to put the matter directly to the vote. Uh, in view of the further suggestions, I am going to go to a recorded vote straight away uh, rather than seeking to do this by affirmation. So uh, if you could press your blue button and then vote green in favour, red if you oppose. And we have, it would seem we're unanimous in approving the, accepting the officer's recommendation and approving the application subject to the conditions. Um, I said we'd break for lunch at 1.30. I'm sorry, we failed in that ambition, but um, I, I, I still suggest that um, if we could manage to come back at uh, 2.15, um, I hope that will allow members enough time for their, for their lunch. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone, to this meeting of the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. You know who we all are. Um, at this point, or quite shortly, I will need to get the authorisation agreement of the committee to continue over the four-hour deadline. Uh, my vice chair helpfully points out that um, we've already covered two of the nine issues on our agenda, so um, perhaps we won't need to, but I think we ought to just... Can I take it by affirmation that we may continue beyond four hours when we get to that point? Agreed. Yes, thank you. Can you not make an affirmation that we are ah. also as well? Uh, I think that should, each, should be a personal affirmation by each of us. <laughs> I think you ought to get a Oh, I'll take the recommendation. <laughs> yes. And would you kindly stop interrupting me, Councillor Roberts? <laughs> right, um, so we now move on to... Uh, what is listed here, you will recall we agreed to change the order of the agenda slightly, so listed here as being item 12, land off Horse Heath Road, Linton. Um, we have made a site visit, page 243 in your papers, um, and as I think some of us know, this is surface water drainage and flood risk. Um, uh, Data members, you know, decision due by May. Uh, and the presenting officer in this case is Stephen Kelly. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be, I'll be um, supported by uh, Karen Pell Coggins, who, who, who's the case officer. Um, uh, as, you, as you identified, this is an uh, application for approval of a condition requiring uh, details of the surface water drainage scheme. Members undertook a site visit uh, at them uh, on Monday. Uh, visiting both the application site and Lonsdale, um, the adjoining uh, area. Um, Karen, if we can have the next slide. Move By way of full screen. Um, and, and move into full screen, thank you. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, you thank you. Keep. By, by way of background, uh, as the report makes clear on, on page 244, this item was deferred from consideration at the meeting um, uh, last month uh, for a, a number of reasons. Um, the first was uh, for the Lead Local Flood Authority um, to publish their report uh, into a flood event that took place um, adjacent to this site but um, uh, uh, within um, Linton on the 20th of July. Uh, and that has now uh, happened. Um, to provide further details uh, of the drainage solution, particularly details of the exceedance flows from the drainage basin, which uh, I will um, uh, address shortly, uh, and to provide uh, clarification of the applicant's land ownership uh, and the ability to deliver elements of the proposed drainage strategy. And I'll, I'll deal with that as we um, progress um, through the, the presentation. Um, there have been a number of uh, late uh, or later representations um, uh, since the publication of, uh, of the report. Uh, I'll perhaps run through the presentation and come back to those, presentation, uh, those representations um, because uh, I suspect it may well make a degree of sense. But um, Karen, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, so the, um, surf sorry, the, the surface water drainage proposals uh, essentially comprise um, uh, four key elements uh, in line with um, uh, principles established at the outline stage and referenced in condition uh, 11. Uh, the, um, the main elements of those uh, proposals uh, can be found uh, in the report uh, and uh, are shown on the, uh, on the plan. Uh, and they essentially um, uh, are set out on page 257 uh, and 258. But the, uh, talking to the plan, the surface water drainage uh, measures will capture all of the uh, rainfall falling onto uh, roofs and roads. The pale blue areas that you can see are areas of, uh, of permeable paving. Uh, so, so the rainfall will fall onto uh, those and also be captured uh, and directed towards the infiltration basin uh, located at the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, of the site which corresponds with the lowest part of the site. At the site access with um, uh, Horse Heath Road, uh, a 1 in 40 gradient will be created um, for the first four metres, 
to create effectively a lip uh, at the site entrance way uh, to reduce uh, and prevent um, uh, surface water that currently uh, in high rainfall conditions passes along Horse Heath Road from entering into the site and then flowing down the hill uh, into the infiltration basin uh, and overwhelming it. Um, uh, there are also, uh, I think if you could move to the, the um, uh, next slide please, Karen. Uh, so this is the infiltration basin which includes, um, uh, it is dug to a depth to accommodate one in uh, 100 year plus 40% for climate change um, design standard uh, with two parts to it, what's called a four bay area uh, on the left at the top of the drawing, effectively where all of that surface water will travel to uh, and um, providing an opportunity for silt and so on in that to settle before it passes into uh, the larger basin area. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, the permeable paving uh, is essentially a contained system with a drain uh, that holds some of that surface water that falls onto, the, um, uh, onto those permeable paving areas uh, in essentially the um, materials uh, in the paving area itself before discharging into the infiltration basin through, through pipes. Next drawing, please. Uh, and then um, what are proposed to be um, uh, buns on the east and western boundaries and an element of the southern boundary. The one on the, uh, the image on the left-hand side is a bund uh, on the eastern side of the site. Um, the levels fall from the right-hand side of that image to uh, the bottom left-hand side. Uh, and the purpose of that bund is to um, intercept water that might flow from the adjoining uh, land Currently part of that land, as those that were on the site, is used as the site compound area um, onto the uh, application site itself. Uh, and then on the uh, right-hand image, uh, there is a, a small, effectively a, a, a lip uh, on the uh, western uh, edge of the site, shown in, in the sections, and in the southern part of the site, uh, that uh, contains surface water into the site uh, and prevents it in normal circumstances from flowing uh, beyond the site boundaries uh, so that it is contained within the infiltration uh, basin. If we go to the next image, please. Um, the uh, construction of the development means that on the eastern side particularly, there has been a concern expressed about the ability of the developer to contain within their application site, within land that they control, uh, the uh, eastern and southern bund. Um, uh, so uh, this drawing seeks to demonstrate uh, and the applicants seek to affirm uh, that they are able to construct the bund uh, in its entirety as, as detailed in the plans. And so it's one of the reasons for deferral. For members who were on site on Monday, they were able to see an indication of where that um, boundary is uh, and where uh, the extent of the bund uh, exists relative to the boundary fences of the properties that were constructed. If we move to the next slide. Uh, and then um, the other reason for re uh, deferral um, addressed this point. So the prevailing ground levels, as you can see, uh, are to the uh, bottom left of that image uh, with the contours that you can um, identify. Uh, the applicants have provided uh, details in this diagram of an exceedance flow rate that essentially follows that prevailing ground level. Um, now, if I can, apologies, I just need to uh, check back with the... the uh, drainage features. If you can go forward to two slides, please. That's right. Um, uh, the basin that is proposed in the bottom left-hand side and the exceedance flow, the arrangements um, that members were able to see on, on, on site uh, uh, during their site visit showed the partially completed basin uh, with a temporary bund around it. Uh, and then um, uh, you were able to witness by going into Lonsdale uh, the difference in levels between the properties to the south, um, referred to in a number of reports as being Martins Lane, but actually not 
Uh, Martins Lane isn't, doesn't exist at that point, so the immediate south of the site, but particularly to the uh, western side of that, of that basin. And we've got some photographs that we can show you um, shortly. Uh, but if you can go back up to the exceedance flow uh, slide, one more, thank you, you'll see that um, uh, in uh, an extreme event, in the event that the infiltration basin um, uh, proves to be overwhelmed, um, the exceedance flow, uh, the applicants are indicating, will take place to that bottom left-hand corner, which corresponds, for those who are on site, uh, with uh, the gardens of houses on Lonsdale. Now, the applicant has provided um, uh, information uh, which is contained in the report, which seeks to uh, justify not only the design parameters of a one in um, 100 years plus climate change event, uh, but also uh, has further uh, calculated the performance of the basin in more extreme rainfall events uh, based upon um, uh, uh, modelling uh, that they've done uh, up to one in a thousand year um, event. Uh, the um, Section 19 report published by the Lead Local Flood Authority suggests that circumstances in um, uh, Linton in, in uh, July 2021 amounted to, uh, I think, between one in uh, one in 250 and one in 600 year event. So, um, depending upon what data source you uh, you rely upon, um, but the applicants' uh, comments around that uh, are contained in the in the report and seek to suggest that uh, although the exceedance um, uh, would take place into properties in Lonsdale, and again we'll see the photographs about and members saw the way that that water. In, uh, is conveyed when it enters the gardens, um, the circumstances under which such exceedance happens uh, are in excess of the design parameters and the council and lead local flood authority design standards uh, for a um, surface water drainage scheme. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, suggest that that, um, uh, that uh, level of tolerance is, is, is um, uh, significant and, and sufficient to justify the scheme being an improvement over the uh, circumstances of a no development scenario. So if, if there was no development on the site. Um, the, uh, Karen, if you can just go down further in the um, presentation. Uh, as I said, the, the, the key parameters uh, I, of the uh, scheme are detailed in that slide, if you move to the next slide, uh, there are ma maintenance arrangements uh, set out on this slide. So the areas covered by the um, uh, blue will be adopted highway, including the uh, lip or the entrance, um, the, the, the grading of the entrance at the site uh, access point, uh, and the areas in brown uh, will be covered by the uh, management terms uh, set up for the site. Move to the next. Image, please. The um, development, as for, for those of you on site, and if you've read the report, um, is well underway. Uh, and um, as a consequence, uh, the measures that are proposed have not yet been fully implemented. Um, uh, what the um, uh, what the applicants have done uh, is to provide a program of implementation uh, detailed on this drawing which sets out uh, the phasing of the implementation of the drainage solution in the event that it's approved by uh, the council. Um, it's important to, to, to note that the existing circumstances on site, and indeed the conditions on the 20th of July, 2021, um, the drainage solution that was in place uh, was not the scheme that you're being asked to consider. It was not fully implemented uh, clearly at that point. Uh, including um, uh, key elements of the um, uh, access prevail water inundation um, uh, uh, measures to prevent inundation of the site from the east and from Horseheath Road, uh, and the infiltration basin at that time was at a um, lower, uh, did not have its uh, embankments fully uh, rendered in the way uh, shown on the submitted scheme. Um, so I think, uh, Karen, uh, 
you can, the next slide uh, should identify one of the other reasons why the application was deferred was there was a question about South Cam's land ownership interests. You can see in the right hand um, uh, image the uh, foul water connection to um, uh, and an easement that's granted over uh, South Cam's land uh, into uh, Lonsdale as part of a foul water connection. Um, but the uh, extent of South Cambridge's District Council's land uh, along that western boundary. I think, is there another slide? No, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, are there some photographs, I think, that we, we have received a number of photographs following um, Monday's site visit that we've sought to, um, uh, sought to try and uh, capture. Thank you. Uh, and this is for those of you who weren't able to, to visit the site. Hopefully this provides a degree of uh, context. Uh, so uh, this photograph, I think, is taken of the area of land behind uh, the gardens of properties on Lonsdale and at the southern boundary of the site, um, uh, beyond the southern boundary of the site, uh, in an area which uh, it, uh, is being marked at the moment by the cursor. Um, Karen, have you got another uh, image? You can scroll down. This is the uh, edge of the um, application site, is off to the left hand side. This is number 29 Lonsdale. Uh, and um, the uh, infiltration basin is to the immediate left of this uh, on that image uh, on the site. And what the, what the photograph and members saw on site uh, is the difference in levels um, and clearly uh, the difference between ground levels uh, that exists, uh, which dovetails with the uh, anticipated pathway of that exceedance flow uh, route. The next image. Uh, this is the view um, uh, beyond that, uh, the boundary of number 31, uh, which is the house next to number 29 that you've just seen, um, which points to the uh, congested nature and the overgrown nature of the site um, uh, uh, next door, which prevents water from flowing down uh, Martins Lane. Go to the next image. Uh, and uh, this is the, it's actually quite hard to see in some ways, but you can see the uh, infiltration basin in the um, mid-ground, the development to the rear, the boundary fence uh, of the garden uh, uh, number 29, uh, which, you've, which I think you've just, you've just seen, showing the relationship of the uh, infiltration basin uh, with the site uh, boundary and with the residential boundaries off to the left-hand side. Uh, it's important to make the point that the, um, the infiltration basin that uh, as constructed there, uh, effectively the embankment to that, the raised section, is temporary and would be taken um, off and rebuilt with a concrete core uh, as a um, piece of reinforcement uh, to that basin um, uh, and then uh, that core would be uh, backfilled with um, material uh, and planted um, uh, uh, and would naturally colonise with, with, with vegetation. We've got uh, another photograph. Um, I think that's, the, that's a similar image, but maybe gives you a greater sense of appreciation. The, the next photograph, please. Um, through that gap is the, um, you can see again the houses, but the infiltration basin is in the area uh, beyond that um, chain link fence that you can just about um, make out. I think this is taken on the boundary with number 31. Um, it shows the slope, absolutely. Uh, this is the garden of number 31, which is, um, and the uh, fence that you can see um, at the top of that photograph is approximately, I think, where the previous photo that you've just seen was taken. But clearly the continuation of the ground levels falling into those gardens in Lonsdale uh, is something that members were able to appreciate. Next photo, please. Um, one of the, one of the um, uh, elements uh, that uh, forms part of the existing fabric of properties in Lonsdale is that there is a substantial, and you can see it here in the photograph, uh, brick wall. The consequences of that, it's a continuous wall uh, along most of the southern part of Lonsdale. The consequences of that is that if water enters into the gardens of properties in Lonsdale, it's conveyed uh, westwards um, along that wall uh, and into neighbouring properties. That's what happened in July uh, 2021 um, and uh, ultimately ends up uh, at number 36 uh, where um, it passes through a gap in that wall 
uh, down to a property at number two Baker's, two Baker's Lane. Um, uh, and uh, so the concern of local residents uh, uh, around the um, application uh, articulated in some length in the uh, representations and through uh, correspondence uh, is around the um, risks to their property from uh, effectively a, um, uh, an overflow of that infiltration uh, basin. Um, and uh, a concern about the um, significant implications for property and, uh, and, and their well-being arising uh, fr from that. As the report sets uh, out, um, the flood event in 2021 uh, and the report on it uh, has now been uh, published. Uh, the, uh, we've provided details of uh, the easement. Uh, the applicants have provided um, confirmation that they are able to fully implement the scheme within their demise. Um, uh, it's fair to say that remains uh, contested. Uh, and um, the Lead Local Flood Authority uh, have confirmed that both through their technical assessment of the scheme, and we have a representative from, a, uh, from Capita who peer-reviewed on behalf of the Lead Local Flood Authority the technical assessment work done for the um, surface water drainage design, um, the Lead Local Flood Authority have confirmed that they're now satisfied, notwithstanding their earlier comments that you can see reported in the uh, report, uh, that the scheme um, put forward is, is acceptable uh, and satisfies their uh, requirements. Um, before I um, uh, finish, uh, however, I do need to update members to a number of further representations that we've received since the weekend. Um, uh, or just before the weekend uh, and uh, around the site visit. So from the applicants, we've received um, uh, emails on the 6th of April uh, and the 30th of March uh, addressing uh, matters of the Bund construction um, uh, and, in, uh, and revising the details of the concrete plug to be a more substantive reinforced um, piece of uh, 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 structure. On the 30th of March, they provided new sections for the infiltration basin uh, and um, identified, um, uh, uh, responded to points made by the parish council about exceedance flow. Uh, on the 12th of uh, April, uh, they provided a response to Linton Parish Council's um, uh, concerns uh, and they've also provided uh, on the 12th uh, structural calculations for the concrete bund itself, which was a matter that you'll see it has been raised in representations. The Lead Local Flood Authority provided further comments on the 11th of April, uh, on Monday, um, uh, confirming their position that they are satisfied uh, with the um, uh, assessment undertaken uh, and um, with the um, exceedance uh, flow uh, provisions and the applicant's calculations, uh, and making clear that they uh, continue to have no objection to the approval of the condition. Uh, we've also received a letter from a local MP on the 11th of April uh, raising concerns about um, the implementation of the development ahead of these works and the failure of the applicant to discharge the conditions in advance. Um, concerns about the, uh, noting the concerns about the parish councils uh, that you will hear from in terms of exceedance flow infiltration rates uh, and the performance of the uh, drainage scheme overall, um, uh, and um, asking members uh, to seek to ensure uh, that checks are carried out uh, on what has been built um, uh, ultimately, and that monitoring takes place should the conditions be discharged to ensure they're implemented as approved. Linton Parish Council, who you will um, uh, be hearing from, uh, have made comments on the 8th of April, as I said, the Applicants have responded to those, highlighting um, uh, concerns about the Section 19 report from the Lead Local Flood Authority, um, uh, expressing surprise about uh, Anglin Water and the Environment Agency's um, uh, view on that report, uh, querying calculations undertaken as part of the surface water drainage design process, um, uh, questioning why no comments from landscaping and highways uh, have been raised and expressing a concern about the impact of the scheme on the hedge, uh, questioning entrance levels um, and the arrangements of the site access, uh, and um, 
and making clear that the Parish Council continue to object to the proposals, but you'll hear from them. We've also had representations from uh, Baker's Lane uh, highlighting concerns about the flood report uh, and um, from uh, uh, Lonsdale, 36 Lonsdale, uh, querying whether a structural engineer's report has been um, secured regarding the stability of the Bund um, as recommended by the LLFA. As I said, we've also received um, photographs from number 31 Lonsdale and from uh, uh, Baker's Lane. Uh, Corrie Newell, I think, has written to all members uh, separately in a letter that um, uh, we're conscious uh, raises a number of points. Uh, and, um, Chair, that's, uh, that's probably all from me. Thank you. Uh, is that a point of clarification, Councillor uh, Roberts? Yes, it is. Yes, please. I am much concerned about how much extra information that there is. Um, and we're all pretty busy at the moment. And I've seen things coming in onto my laptop in the last sort of 24 hours. I just not, have not been able to read them. I just haven't got time. Um, and I think my fears are that uh, we, we're really making a decision here that could have could be good, but it could have horrendous consequences. And my own feeling is that um, this meeting actually should defer it um, until uh, ne the next month to give everybody an opportunity to really consider. Um, I honestly feel that if there was a flood, and I'm sorry I don't go along with all these 100 years, etc. nowadays, the, they, the weather is so... Um, changeable these days um, and we get um, more and more rain than, than we, you know I'm ancient as you all know and I can't remember whether um, quite as wild as it is and so much water when it does come down and, and I actually would move that we defer this chairman I just don't think we've got the we haven't got the knowledge we haven't been able to I think take in um, and I think it's premature and highly dangerous. And I actually think there would be a call on this council to uh, have responsibility if something were to happen in the next couple of years. Uh, and I don't think we ought to be putting ourselves in that sort of predicament. And I, I would move that we, we um, defer this. Right, so I take that as a proposal. Do you have a seconder for that? Right, so we now have a short debate on that motion that we defer. Um, does anyone want to speak for or against that? I will speak briefly on that then. Um, I am aware that there have been a lot of additional documents and also that there are parts of those documents and submissions that are directly relevant to the decision before us today. Assuming there are other parts which are not, which is why I asked, and indeed I'm sure it was in line this beginning, I asked the director, rather than circulating more documents, to summarise the relevance of the documents that have been received. And I think that was a clear summary. I think that in considering the question of deferral, we need to consider uh, uh, two other factors, really. One is that um, there are people waiting on this decision. Uh, it's not directly relevant as a as a planning consideration for us this afternoon, but there are people wanting to move into houses there. Uh, that, if you like, is the responsibility of the developers. The second question is that um, because the uh, amelioration works, the works that should prevent a future flood, uh, can't be completed until they have been approved, there is a continuing risk to neighbouring householders until such time as this matter is properly resolved. Now, I, I don't, well, it's also a risk to the, to the householders, the ones we met on, on site yesterday, um, which was acknowledged by one of them at a previous meeting. Um, now, I, I appreciate that Councillor Heather Williams wants to second that. Um, do you wish to second it now, or would you, would you like to hear uh, others on this point first? You go ahead and second the motion, so I don't see anyone else. I'm going to speak at the stage you said you were. And the vice chair would also like to speak on this, perhaps. Thank you, that's helpful. 
that's helpful. Yes. Councillor Mills. Thank, thank you, Chair. So I'm minded that uh, we have a development in Sawston um, of 48 houses by the same developer. And they have a uh, sub system in place of very similar design, percolating pipes underneath uh, permeable paving, uh, going off to a, a first of, uh, an attenuation base and then a, a tank underneath and so on. Um, I have photographs in front of me of ponding uh, on top of that permeable surface. That was immediately after the site was constructed. So I have some uh, hesitation uh, when uh, we're discussing such property developments and the, the nature of these uh, flood uh, defences. Um, I'm minded to agree with Councillor Roberts in terms of the additional information that we've got. When um, in December 2019, we had uh, a water event that was the highest uh, or the third highest in recorded history. Um, so we are getting these very uh, severe events more frequently. Now, I know, uh, and I noted that um, Stephen mentioned a thousand, one in a thousand year events. But it seems to me that uh, we're reliant on a system that is untested with severe um, rainfall events. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, situations where you've got quite a lot of high rainfall over a preceding period, and then get a large amount, so a month's worth in a few hours, which was the case in July 2021. 20, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm just expressing reservations about the information in front of us and the ability of, of this proposal uh, to cope. Right, I wonder if before you second the motion, I could ask uh, Henry Batchelor to, to speak on this. Sure, just um, again, whilst I agree with the two speakers before about lack of um, a full set of information in front of us, um, I also, on the other hand, I do agree with the chair that we, uh, we do have to come to a decision at some point on this uh, because, you know, this has been rolling on for a long time and there are people waiting, not including homeowners who have had houses ruined and are waiting for a conclusion on this matter to put in some kind of defence themselves. Um, but on the flip side, whilst I'm not against a deferral, I would like to hear from the public speakers before we make that decision, because including people such as Capita and, the, and I'm hoping the applicant themselves, um, they may answer some of the questions that we still think are outstanding. Um, and then uh, when we get to the debate, we may still feel that there is information missing that we would like to defer this application for. So I'm not against a deferral per se. I am just at this stage of the proceedings. Um, I see we're now gathering other speakers. Um, before we take other speakers, I wonder if you would agree to me inviting the director to, to comment on some of the implications of this, because I think that would be helpful to us. Yeah, OK. Would you mind holding on? Because it's your right to speak as a second to the motion. Thank you. Thank you, because there might be something that I say that Mr. Kelly then might want to um, advise us. So that was, that's my thinking, not trying to jump in front of you, Mr. Kelly. Um, so my, my reasons for seconding is we've had a lot of information there, and I do appreciate the summary um, and everything that everyone said. But also, we only have one chance at getting this right if we approve something. So yes, we need something to protect, and it was... The images and the images that we've been sent of the flooding is horrific. And I remember about um, someone saying about how quick it was. And if their child had been in the living room, you know, it would have been a very different... We could be talking about a very different situation here. So, um, yes, we need to get something done as quickly as possible to protect those residents. But also what we can't do is rush it and we have one chance and, and get it wrong. Now, this is a highly technical um, condition as well. So it's, you know, the beauty of the planning committee is that we're not professionals. That's, the, that's a democratic process. But equally, this is a very technical piece. But I, I do feel that perhaps a briefing to go through that technical detail, as we've had in other areas, 
would be a good idea on this item because we're being asked to make a decision today that literally could mean the, the difference of, of life and death to some people. So it is, I, I feel an immense pressure, I'm sure we all do, that we must get this right. Um, and on, based on a summary and information given, I don't feel that we're able to, and I appreciate what Councillor Batchelor has said about the other public speakers, but equally, I think in my mind, more support and briefing and more time to digest and get the information would help my decision making as opposed to responses that I may have in the next 10, 15 minutes. So that's my reason for deferral. And I would be happy if it, if it means we have to have another meeting following that briefing if, to make it work, to try and speed things up, you know, happy to, to go with that. But I, I, I do think that a lot of us are very concerned about the consequences if we get this wrong. So we want to be certain or as certain as we can possibly be. Thank you for that. I think if the committee would agree, it would be helpful at this point to hear from the director before others contribute. Yes, I think we agree to that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I absolutely understand the concerns about um, the level of information and the technical nature or, of it. And indeed, um, uh, there are conflicting views on that technical information. I think, however, it's probably important to and, and Councillor Williams made this, this exact point, is that the, the, the technical assessment of the scheme is not a matter for the planning committee to forensically undertake. That is the purpose of uh, consulting the statutory consultees, the lead local flood authority particularly, uh, and um, there has been a, uh, a fairly rigorous process uh, of um, challenge and examination both the lead local flood authority of the applicants and indeed um, uh, to address the very concerns that I know a number of members have highlighted, um, the lead local flood authority took the view of appointing uh, capita to peer review the proposals and draw conclusions on the technical assessment uh, because the calculations involved the assumptions about infiltration rates, the design parameters and the factors taken account of in those design parameters are matters that I would find difficulty, frankly, briefing the committee on uh, without necessarily giving um, a very, very extensive masterclass in drainage scheme design that I'm certainly not uh, qualified to give and which um, would involve uh, a great deal of, of kind of technical analysis and assessment uh, alongside the requirement for judgment, ultimately, by those technical specialists. Uh, and you'll, um, I do wonder whether or not, uh, recognising, nevertheless, uh, Councillor Roberts' concern about this, it might be helpful to, con to hear from the range of, of views, because uh, around the technical assessment and the scheme design, uh, there, are, um, uh, there are some areas of disagreement between, for example, the Parish Council uh, and the Lead Local Flood Authority, the Lead Local Flood Authority's consultants and the applicant. Um, that you need to consider. Um, but, uh, but there are now areas in which there is at least recognition and clarity uh, around what happens if the basin uh, overtops in terms of what that potentially means and members who were on the site visit would have been able to see that and heard from some of the local residents. Uh, and I think it might be useful to hear from all of the speakers in order to be able to determine how much more technical appraisal is, is required um, uh, by the committee as opposed to um, the views and technical appraisals that have been done by uh, okay. the lead local flood authority and others okay. before we reach a conclusion. Thank you for that. Um, before I take other speakers, uh, do you wish to press your proposal now or are you prepared to hear other speakers and then press it later if that's appropriate? Um, Chair, I mean, it's, it's Councillor Roberts' motion. My, my feeling is, though, that this is an application with, that's going to, should have a good deal of our time given to it because of the severity of it. It's three o'clock. We've already been going for five hours. Um, I don't, and we have a lot of other things on the agenda. So I do think, Chair, we do need to 
make a, a decision sooner rather than later, but equally I don't want anybody to be rushed in their representation. Mm -hmm. So mindful of, of the where we're at in proceedings as well here. So can I ask Councillor Roberts to confirm, do you wish to pre press this proposal now? You've got a I think there? we ought to We've do it now. I think we ought to do it now because I, right. I think my feelings are that uh, the, the I, I only need to know whether you're prepared to do it now. Uh, yes. I, I, forgive me, I, I've been advised I ought to assert myself more as chair, so. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I said that. Yes, Chairman, I, I think it, the time is now. Yes, OK. Thank so you. So let's move to a, a vote. Uh, sorry, I think we're going to do this um, on the system. Yes, um, point of information. If... if Given that we're being asked to take a vote on whether to defer now, yes. if we um, if that decision were overturned and we proceeded to discuss the application, that doesn't preclude us um, seeking a deferral once we've heard it, does it? Um, yes, I, to, I, had that that thought, discussion, I had that thought myself, could, but I we think we have still... to take the, the principle, do we defer this? to a future meeting, bearing in mind there will be no further meetings of this committee until sometime later in June, mm -hmm. new committee, um, or do we agree to discuss it? I think that if we, if, if we so reject the, point, the idea of deferring it, then we have rejected it for the whole of this meeting, in my view. Chairman, if um, we But I now want to proceed sorry, to sorry, the vote. Chair, I've had the proposal, I've had the me. seconder. Excuse so me, if you would like to, forgive me, Councillor Braddon, we're going to proceed to the vote now. And, and the vote is on. Uh, perhaps before we proceed to the vote, we should take advice from our legal advisor. Um, Chair, notwithstanding your view, my legal view is that there would be a second... If the motion was defeated now, um, and there was then a debate, and then a further motion was put to defer, I think members would be entitled to, to vote on that second motion. Right, so that's and very clear. If we, dis if we reject this motion now, we would still be able to consider the same issue at a later stage. Um, my view on that was practical, the legal one is what counts. So let's, um, let's now proceed to that vote if we're ready to. Thank you. So Green is in favour of deferring it now, and Red is in favour of hearing from the invited speakers. Uh, yes, so we have, uh, I think we have all voted now. Um, and the motion for immediate deferral is defeated. So we will now hear from the invited speakers. Uh, I, I see that Councillor Milne has a That sounds like a reasonable request. Everyone happy that we have a, a very short adjournment? Yes.
spaces, all, I think, virtual today. But can I just gently suggest from the chair that it would be helpful if we could just listen to them, uh, hear their presentations. Obviously, if anyone does insist on asking questions, um, then I, won't, uh, I wouldn't be able to stop that. I have indicated to other speakers who are waiting to speak on the next item that we will take the next item and have to then consider what we do about other items. So let's proceed. Um, item 12, our first speaker, virtual online, is James Fountain. Um, do we have Mr. Fountain? Oh, there you are. Uh, oh, there you James. I am here, yes. Thank you. So uh, I'll be two minutes around about. So first of all, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, the events of last year have had a kind of profound effect on and lasting effect on the residents of Lonsdale, Baker's Lane and beyond. And I think this topic has had a great deal of scrutiny and debate, certainly by technical people, but not necessarily by uh, the committee. The residents of Lonsdale did not live in an extreme flood risk area, but the crowdace development has now created this for us. The narrative, I think, that's been used to push the development from Crowdace homes has not been helpful. And I kind of totally reject the idea that the site is somehow saving us from mass flood events that aren't really supported by the facts. However, I think now we have to realise that the development is in place and we have to come up with solutions on how we can protect our homes for the future according to the planning procedures, etc. And these mustn't really raise the flood risks to our house, houses. So I've got two, three topics that I'd like you to consider really as part of the committee. So the first one is, is the structural integrity of the bund that surrounds the infiltration basin and really is it up to the job? So the LLFA have requested in their latest report that the design is reviewed and subsequently inspected by a structural engineer. So I know this hasn't been accepted by Crowdace to date, uh, and really failure of this particular structure is not an option because it's a major part of the design. So I really ask that the committee kind of require and request that this LLFA requirement is actually carried out. Secondly, uh, the residents of Lonsdale and beyond actually don't really have a huge amount of trust from Crowdace Homes. Uh, and I believe, really, if you look at the literature, that the council is currently being held to ransom. So this is quite clear from some of the wording that's on the submissions in the planning portal. And also, residents have had to track, amend many of the proposals that have come from Crowdace. Uh, throughout this whole sorry affair. Uh, none of us are flooding experts, uh, but, and this isn't really been a very simple or easy process to follow. So uh, a lot of us have had to become flooding experts and look at these designs. And, and sometimes we've been the only people, the residents, to actually come up with finding flaws in the design. So these have been, Residents have been the driving force, really, for finding these flaws in the design and highlighting them. And I think lastly, I want to say that I hope that the design that's been put together is actually built. So as people will realise when they came on Monday, 90% of the, of the houses have already been finished. And a great deal of the drainage solution is already in the ground. So can these be checked properly? I'm not sure they can be, but we hope that they will be. So this is really an paramount importance that they are. The other thing is... Wind up, if I may, that's three okay. minutes. So but I think we've got very clearly what you said, and we had the opportunity to see... Okay, see so one, so one, you. one more sentence to say. Okay, one more thing is about the infiltration basin. So we hope that the infiltration basin actually performs to the to the required amount. 
However, the the data that backs up this data uh, infiltration data is at best flaky. I have to say that when looking at the data as a career scientist, I don't think I would be able to use that data. It is very, very dodgy. Thank you for that, uh, that submission. Um, committee, I consciously gave Mr. Fountain slightly more time, aware of the fact that we were uh, not proposing to ask him any questions. Um, our next speaker is Matthew Harmsworth, um, agent for the, uh, the applicants of Barton Wilmore, I think. Mr. Harmsworth, are you with us? Hello. I, I am with you. You'll have to bear with my throat a little bit today. I'm recovering from COVID, um, but can you hear me okay? Coming. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'll start by commenting on the three matters relating to the three reasons for deferral from the previous meeting. The LOFA's flood investigation report into the July flood event defines the event as a 1 in 211 or 1 in 659 year event, depending on the rainfall data used. Crowdace have provided additional calculations to the authority, which show that the surface water drainage capacity for the scheme will be effective for over 1 in 1,000 year events, well over the capacity required even to mitigate events such as that observed last year and far beyond what is required by policy. Section 5.6 of the report highlights that developers should not increase flood risk at sites. Again, the surface water drainage scheme proposed does more than this. In fact, creating betterment to the drainage capacity of the site than that observed prior to construction. Regarding exceedance flows from the infiltration basin, the visual shared with the authority show that the, wa uh, the water would follow the natural topography of the site and slopes generally in a southwesterly direction as it did prior to development. Let me stress, however, that the calculations from the microdrainage model showed that even in the case of one in 1,000 year events, the surface water runoff would be contained within the infiltration basin and with over 100 millimeters freeboard to spare. Furthermore, the updated designs add a reinforced base for the bund further to the concrete core, which further improves its stability. Structural analysis demonstrates that the concrete core alone has sufficient strength to ask, act as a retaining wall, and providing this structure within the bund will further increase its strength and stability relative to the previous design. Regarding ownerships, it's been discussed with, acknowledged and confirmed with the authority that all land required to put in place the scheme is within the land, uh, applicant's land ownership or control. I trust that the site visit took, that took place last week and the presentation we've had was helpful in this regard. The drainage strategy also sets out the maintenance strategy and it, in again further expanding this on top of the measures previously proposed, the applicant has committed to fitting a depth gauge to the head wall of the inlet of the infiltration basin to help monitor the water level. Regular inspections and maintenance will be undertaken to ensure normal operation of the infiltration basin. The principles of the Thomas report of the outline application have been adhered to. The peer review of the technical details for the LLFA supports the LLFA conclusions that the proposed surface water drainage scheme is acceptable and the LLFA as the technical expert consultee have noted they are satisfied with all the latest information. There is a clear timetable set out for implementation of the scheme with the app which the applicant wishes to carry out as soon as possible in the event of the scheme being approved and the council is free to monitor the progress of this. The applicant also advises that this scheme has gone about as far as it can go, as have the calculations gone as far as they can reasonably go. Therefore, we respectfully request that the condition be discharged, allowing the developer to move closer towards delivering the scheme and thus appropriately mitigating against future events. Thank you. Um, we won't be asking you any questions today, so we'll proceed to our next Witness, um, thank you very much. Councillor Kate Kell of uh, Linton Parish Council. Um, and I think you have Corrie Newell there with you in support. Uh, Kate, you, you know we have uh, three minutes. Can we just confirm that you have the agreement of your parish council to, uh, to present the case this afternoon? Yes, I can confirm that I have their permission. Could I just before I start to speak, um, 
make a comment regarding whatever um, additional material has been submitted in response to us from the developer. Um, we in a moment. So when well, you're ready. We haven't had the opportunity to see it and it isn't on the website. Right. So that, that was that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, would you like to uh, make your submission then? You have, as usual, three minutes. You will have noticed, I'm sure, that I have shown a little bit of uh, discretion because we won't be asking you questions subsequently. But if you could possibly keep to three minutes, that would be appreciated. Certainly. And could the presentation be displayed, please? Thank you. Chair, councillors, thank you for inviting me to speak. Planning policy requires that no internal flooding should occur on a site in a one in 100 year event plus climate change. It also requires that the development does not increase the risk of flooding elsewhere, full stop. There is no limit to the event intensity in this statement. Current mechanisms that could cause flooding both on a site and to its surroundings should therefore be fully understood so that any changes to them do not alter the risk of flooding. Next slide, please. Our concerns are the Environment Agency surface water maps are inaccurate. Water entered the site via both the construction compound and main site entrances on July 20th last year. The volume of water that overtopped the infiltration basin exceeded its capacity many, many times over, flooding properties on Lonsdale, Baker's Lane, Bartlow Road and Fincham's Close in quick succession. Once the construction compound entrance is returned to Verge, it will direct flood water to the next opening, the main site entrance. Two, alterations to the already agreed site entrance have still not been consulted on by highways. What will happen if this scheme is not acceptable to them? The one in 40 rise was proposed by the 2017 flood strategy due to, and I quote, the small risk that flows along Horseheath Road may enter the site along the new access road. Evidence shows this risk is not small nor hypothetical. If overtopped, additional water will flow straight to the infiltration basin. We understand that the surface water scheme was not complete on July 20th. However, the extent of the surface water that would enter the site from Horseheath Road has not been considered in the design at all, with Crowdis arguing that only rain falling on the site itself has to be accounted for. We believe this is folly, as the site entrance changes the flooding mechanism. Next slide, please. Paragraph 60 doesn't include how the retesting of the infiltration pond will be controlled on completion and for the life of the development. The effects of the silt and compacting of the chalk cannot be undone by rotivating. Should the infiltration test fail, what then? Lessons from previous floods should be heeded before what water is piped into the village drains. Four, you have no information about the exceedance on the eastern side and the damage to hedges and trees and the landscape implications of the buns, ditches and concrete structures on both sides. The scheme is not deliverable because it replaces the landscape buffer approved under conditions one and nine. This is overdevelopment of the site. LPC understands the pressure that the occupation of this site developed at risk puts on members in their decision making. Approval of the details in this condition is based on too many unknowns and undeliverables. We therefore request refusal, as until these unknowns are known, the risk of development, increasing the risk of flooding elsewhere, remains. Thank you. You said you have not seen the reports which were not available to you so you've not seen the LNFA report or the capita review of that report um, we have seen uh, the latest things that are online on the 12th of April are the Linton Parish Council comments and which is also duplicated as our consultee comments submitted online um, there are no other documents that we've seen from the 12th of April okay. which I think was was the um, developers response to Understood. our comments or something? Thank you. Um, the, the committee has looked at those, we were sent a link to those documents which are online. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is to use Chairman's discretion to invite an additional speaker who can talk to the, the uh, cap we have online capita, 
I don't know whether anyone from Capita is present and listening to this, who can give us their assessment of the LLFA report, because I think it is very important that all parties, including uh, the Parish Council, should hear a brief summary of that. So I, don't, I think we have Mr. Jack Southern online. Uh, That's correct. Before you speak, Mr. Southern, I just have a, a councillor who wants to make a comment on this procedure. Thank you. Could you just explain to us what, the, what part Capita plays in this? Capita will explain that in a moment. Uh, Mr. Southern, I'm sorry to bring you in in this way, but I'm sure you've been listening to what's been said here, and I think it would be very helpful to hear from you. Uh, you will have heard not only what the Parish Council just said, but also what Mr. Harmsworth said about your assessment of the LF LLFA report on the events of last summer and the extent to which the proposals before us would uh, deal with that in normal certain well, the extent to which we would deal with it. And if you're able to comment on that, that would be very helpful to us. If you would also deal with Councillor Bradman's point about explaining your, your role in this, that would be very helpful. Certainly. Thank you, Chair and, and members for um, the invitation to speak today. So uh, my role, uh, my, uh, thank you for hearing me. My name is Jack Southern. I'm a flood risk uh, consultant. I've been working with Capita for the last five years and, and a previous consultant for 10 prior to that. My role uh, in this has been to provide an independent review of the uh, the drainage proposals, the sort of drainage proposals uh, for this application. We support the uh, LFFA, Cambridge County Council, on a number of their uh, statutory consultee responses. So um, either primarily or, or uh, as an independent review. Um, I haven't been involved in the section 19, the flood investigation report, um, that that was led by uh, the county council themselves, although I do have um, lots of experience of, of delivering those for other uh, other areas, but I, haven't, I can't speak to this specific section 19 report, although I've obviously have I've read it as part of our, our work. Um, so to, to address that first point, that that's, that has been my involvement. We've been undertaken an independent review and and, uh, with, and then reported back to um, the lead local flood authority with our our thoughts and our, our views. I've um, reviewed had the opportunity to review several revisions of um, of the submission for, for the discharge conditions and provided feedback at each stage, written feedback, um, noting a number of um, of points to review, including um, uh, emissions uh, and uh, uh, varying values used between calculations uh, and plans provided. Um, I've also questioned uh, various, various approaches and points within the report. Those have, over subsequent revisions, uh, all been addressed uh, to, to my satisfaction and in accordance with uh, the guidance documents that we have um, that, are, that apply to, to uh, drainage schemes of this type. Um, to summarise the most recent um, revision uh, submission by the LFFA, which I think was, was one of the questions. Um, there is a comment around the section 19, the flood investigation report, um, that quotes that the, the flood event that occurred um, that was subject to the report had a return period of between one in 200, uh, one in 211 and one in 659, depending on the measure. Um, I, I can go into the, to why there is a range in those things, but I think Hillary um, described that quite well last uh, last session. Um, we the standard for for design that we typically look for is the one in one hundred plus climate change. We allow forty percent increase to account for climate change over the lifetime of development. Um, we've also subsequently received um, and and reviewed um, and along with the LFFA. Uh, the submission from from Crowdex, which looks at different return periods, so larger events than that, to understand what the uh, upper limit of the designed uh, attenuation basin may provide. And based on the calculations, we can say that that would provide a present day um, store of a one in 1,000 year event. Uh, as I say, that's present day, so without climate change, so over the lifetime of development. Certainly, um, and then we've also the final. Some of the final comments were around the exceedance flow routes. Um, we wanted to, to see those documented appropriately. That that has been done, uh, and then then the details around the eastern boundary. Um, the final point I should just say is, um, as as was mentioned earlier in the day, we have reviewed the plans in front of us. Um, it is 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 the proposed design? Um, we have not been able to, um, and to to verify what has been built on the ground. So um, it is it is from a principal point of view that we're reviewing design drawings and design calculations 
um, and that is what our conclusions are based upon. Thank you very much. Okay, I would now like to ask one of our local members, uh, Councillor John Batchelor, um, if he's available to give us his views on this. Are you there, John? I, I'm here, Chair, but uh, all right, my camera's just been turned back on. I'd, I've been banned from <laughs> the camera arrangement. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll be brief, um, Chairman. Uh, we've heard all these numbers and all the rest of it, but uh, there's really one underlying problem in all of this. For, for um, this project to be acceptable, it has to meet the, uh, the authorities' standard, and that standard is 140 years, as we've heard a number of times. So they can, so their, their project can be acceptable, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. The problem is quite clear that it's, ex it's the exception, exceptional rainfall, which is the issue here. And I might say that we have had um, similar uh, downpours from as, as for July last year, at least four times in the last 50 or 60 years and at least one of them was much more serious. So it does happen, and it does happen uh, more regularly than these uh, random, the sort of measures, uh, numbers actually suggest. So there is no answer to this uh, until such time as there is actually a workable solution to how you deal with the um, uh, the basin should we have an extreme situation. In other words, somehow or other, you've got to stop it overflowing. And the only way to do that, I would, I'm no engineer, but I would assume there needs to be some sort of pumping system which would safely remove some of the water in order to protect um, the surrounding properties. Our concern is simply that uh, we need to protect the neighbours and the wider community. And at the moment, I'm afraid we do not have the answer to doing that. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, John. Um, right. The question is, do we now enter the debate with a view to uh, dis determining this? Um, and I'm just before we come to you in a moment, just going to remind us of the recommendation. Um, officers recommend that the Planning Committee accept the following surface water drainage details, but do not formally discharge the condition because the development has commenced. Uh, and that is the recommendation before us. Are we happy to debate that? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. I, I'm going to move a deferment again. I'm Having heard the different representations, um, there is absolutely nobody there that convinces me that they know that this isn't going to flood. And the last speaker clearly said he hasn't seen um, the site itself um, with what's happened there, and he can't give us a solution. All that's been repeated by the developer is the uh, one in what, every many years thing. Well, you know, we know that already. Um, and that would have been as it was before. But it happened, didn't it? It happened last year. So I, I think uh, we do need a deferment. And I would suggest that uh, we take actually further advice and uh, call a special meeting in May, a one-off, one-issue meeting, where we actually have a proper um, pre-briefing meeting, as we've done with um, different schemes over the years, where we can sit uh, and listen to people giving us information ad and advice so that we don't clog up the whole procedure when it gets into committee itself. But we get um, people, uh, and I would suggest from two sides, because there are two sides to this story, uh, and then we may be in a better position, but I just feel at the moment we are in no position whatsoever. And there are so many... Um, 
guidelines showing us that there is a serious danger here. And we have to be, as an authority, um, aware of that and, and not go down that sort of line. We cannot. OK, I think we've heard your proposal. You. We defer. Do you have a seconder? Dr Williams. Um, does anyone want to speak against that before I invite Dr Williams to second? Uh, Councillor Milnes. It's just a point of clarification. So what I think I've heard from uh, the witnesses and the neighbours particularly is they want work to go ahead because they want protecting mm. from a certain event that they had last year happening again. And if we defer, we risk, uh, run the risk of the developers pausing their work and therefore leaving their neighbours unprotected. Mm. So I, I'm just clarifying that that's the potential uh, implication of what we're doing. Yes. Um, okay, I'm now going to ask, I think, Councillor Joe's Hales, was it on this point that you wanted to speak, Councillor Hales? Thank you. <clears throat> right. I had points of clarification for Mr Kelly um, following the site visit on Monday, which was extremely illuminating. Um, you had to be there to see it, right? So this is, my points are from that experience. Um, the permeable surfaces, or rather, should I say, every single drop of surface water, Mr. Kelly, that Sorry, drops. Councillor, can I just clarify that we are debating the proposal which has been put to defer this? Oh, no, I don't want to do that. So, you, uh, okay, Councillor Bradnam. I um, think that one of the things that I would like further advice on is we know, do we not, that planning applications are not required to mitigate against, against water that's flood risk that comes from outside the site. And one of my concerns about this is that prior to the development, Obviously, the same amount of water fell on the site as falls now, except perhaps in recent years it has happened more suddenly. But the problem is that the introduction of hard surfaces and water management systems, so surface water runoff, has increased the speed with which that is recharged into the local existing flood risk flow pattern. As we witnessed from the photographs from Linton Parish Council, which we had sadly very little time to look at or and no explanation of which direction we were looking in, but we could see that there was a lot of water there. So um, I am mindful that if we defer this application, we um, defer the, the instigation of the system which in theory according to the Le local flood authority and their independent engineer would solve the problem but unfortunately we can't be sure as councillor bachelor said we can't be sure that, that would actually protect the people anyway so we're in a we're in a cleft stick and so uh, but i do feel that other people have referred to the fact of the very heavy rainfall on already recharged soil in December 2020, um, which I experienced in my division. And, you know, I do think we need to take into account the change in climate behaviour that has happened. Now, it's possible that people are telling us that the lead local flood authority, authority has taken that into account. And we're advised in the documents that actually the proposed strengthened and increased height bund around the um, infiltration pond that is proposed could protect the neighbours from the one in a thousand year incident. But there's lots of information that we've only received this morning and I, I am quite concerned. There is quite, um, I, I'm just wondering, is there any way we can require some works towards protecting the neighbours while we consider what 
the applications are? I mean, I know we've just got That's to say a, yes or no, but... a good question. Um, look, I could take that as a, a speech against deferring it, but... Well, it's, I may be wrong, it's but a you have asked a good question, which I think we all Sorry, want Chairman, to know the answer. And what I would like to do... That there is a balance, and, and, and I would just like advice from the director. Thank you. This is what I'm proposing, is that we invite the director to comment on that. Thank you. Uh, um, I think there's, there's a, a couple of points. You, there is no approved scheme um, in the absence of this um, uh, condition detail being approved. So there is, no, there is nothing for the developer to implement other than the approved, under the Excuse approved me. scheme. Excuse me, could Councillor Robert the, stop interrupting? I'm trying to listen to Mr Kelly. So the, so the, the, the approved scheme um, uh, is only a scheme that will be covered by conditions. There's no effective authority to implement anything else. The developer has implemented some temporary arrangements following the flood events in um, July last year to try and mitigate the vulnerabilities of the site as it currently stands for this construction site. Uh, and um, you saw some of those temporary arrangements uh, on site, but there isn't anything uh, other than the um, uh, approved scheme in front of you, uh, or indeed that I was advised that you could consider uh, as a kind of interim arrangement. I think in terms of the point around the technical advice or the further technical advice um, that uh, we could secure, I'm, I'm slightly struggling to know where to go to get that advice. The statutory consultee is the lead local flood authority. The lead local flood authority have also appointed an independent technical expert on drainage who has also given them advice. And so I'm not quite sure where, as a planning authority, as a planning committee, we go to secure any further technical advice on the assessment of the, of the scheme. Uh, thank you. Chair, could I come back briefly? Chair? Do members feel that we have heard enough Sorry, on could that? I, could I um, just seek clarification? Sorry, uh, I think you've had a say. Councillor Jimmy Hawkins wanted to... Did you have a proposal or did you want... Um, if I may, I yes. think it's, it's okay to hear the comeback from Councillor Bradham. It might have an impact Good. on okay. what Sorry, I wasn't sure. Councillor Bradham. Thank you. What I wanted to clarify was the, the point I was making was that all of the calculations, as far as we understood from both the lead local flood and independent uh, from, from James Sutherland, but also from the lead local flood authority themselves, was that the calculations add up for the rainfall on the site. But what I was saying was that, and indeed what the residents said was, the trouble is the existence of the site makes the pre-existing known risk worse. And, and I just wanted to get advice whether we can take a, get advice from the Lead Local Flood Authority about this the risk that it's not mitigating the existing risk of water that's falling on other land outside the site, which then runs down Horse Heath Road into the site, out through its normal natural route, which is at the southwestern corner, and whether we can get any advice from them about that. Because if a development increases a risk of flood to neighboring properties, that is in our local plan that we shouldn't allow that to be made worse. So that's my question. Thank you. Um, just a moment. I thought you were opposing this being deferred. It now seems you are proposing that it should be deferred so that we can seek further advice, which the director has advised us we, we cannot secure. As to the point which you raise, are you suggesting that the advice which we have had from both the LLFA as, I think, Peer reviewed by Capita, I wasn't clear about that, doesn't already deal with that. Um, certainly the, the, the Harmsworth, Mr. Harmsworth's assessment, and I have to say I agree with having read the report, was that the LLFA report suggests that the, uh, the measures now proposed would make things better. I think we may all doubt whether they would, uh, they would resolve it, but 
I would remind the committee we are currently debating whether we defer this matter. We are not debating the, the merits of the scheme or whether it would resolve all the problems. So I'm inclined to go back to, uh, forgive me, I know Councillor Williams wants to contribute, but we have a seconder here. Uh, do you want to speak before Dr. Richard Williams seconds the motion to defer? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just to say that I'll take advice as to my vote of it, so I had to take an urgent call. But I have heard the debate, all the debate on the deferral um, suggestion. And I can understand people's concerns, mm. Councillor Milne's raised about the existing properties and, and everything. But I would say that we only have one chance to get this right. So less haste, more speed. Or no, that might be frustrating mm. for today. But if, if we were to agree something today and it then has a, it doesn't do what it needs to do, um, we will have no ability to go, to go back. And I think members are actually just asking for time quite often to just digest everything that was summarised, actually see the documents. And we've heard others. So I'm just throwing out that caution. Mr. Reid will let me know if I can vote on the deferral or not, um, that we've got one chance at this. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, would you like to second your motion to defer? Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I really will keep it brief because I know one way or another we need, we need to get on with business today. Um, I'll just make two points. Uh, firstly, I think in relation to some of the points we made before, um, part of the case that uh, Councillor Roberts made for a deferral is that we could have a technical briefing where we could maybe we could explore these issues um, with the experts in, in more detail. I think that's a very good idea. I just note one other thing. Uh, the Parish Council said they hadn't seen the uh, LLFA report. Uh, the Parish Council also said that they hadn't seen some other documents, which concerns me and gives me other cause for deferral. I see there is a letter online which refers to the Parish Council having been sent the um, report into the 2021 flooding. Um, but there does seem to be some doubt now as to whether the Parish Council had that. Anyway, that would my, be my second reason for deferral. Okay. Thank you. Well, I now intend to move to a vote. Um, can I just ask Councillor Heather Williams whether you intend to take part in the vote? Okay, well, you are happy to accept uh, My advice, Chair, is that Councillor Heather Williams should not vote. Right. Uh, she did not hear all of the debate. And whilst um, she may feel confident, my advice would be that that uh, would be a ground on which the decision Thank you. could be Okay, so um, again, I'm going to take a, a vote on the machines. Um, if you can set that up for us, please. Uh, so again, press the blue button. If you wish to support the motion to defer, then you, pr you press green. If you wish to oppose the motion to defer, you press red. Uh, now, as chair, I will need to use my casting vote. And the convention is that I use my casting vote in support of the original position. Uh, I might need some legal advice on this, but my view would be that the original position is the one put before us in the papers. Uh, I'm not, I think... Um, in this position to support the proposal. I have to support the original motion. Uh, can I suggest a two minute adjournment, Chair, please? Yeah, okay. Sure, the status quo is that you don't vote to support it. Yes. That is the status quo. Right? That's what I'm about to take advice on. Um, that's not my view, but let's have a two minute uh, committee, if we may, have a two minute deferral to just make sure we get, get this right before I cast my casting vote. Sorry, you can adjourn to the screen, Yes, we better, I'm that's afraid. Okay. I'm sorry, please.
We're now live, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my apologies for that further short adjournment. Um, we now come back. We have a tied vote, and therefore, as Chair, I'm going to uh, use my casting vote. I've taken advice on that from officers, and the advice is that I am unfettered. Uh, my casting vote is that we should not defer this. We should continue the discussion, having heard from those involved. And I'm just going to give, give you a very brief explanation. The first is that, um, regardless of the conventions that one votes in favour of the status quo, I'm assured that my decision is un unfettered. I am concerned that if we fail to take a decision today, the improvements which are proposed, we cannot be sure will take place. I do not want a situation to occur in June or July, which is the soonest I'm advised we can consider this at a future planning committee, that we have another such flooding event, and because we have failed to resolve it, the improvements which were intended had not been carried out. That is not a responsibility, I believe. This, it's not a risk this committee should put on those who were so badly affected by the events of last July. We have a duty to decide whether the improvements proposed should now go ahead. And that is what is before us. So that is my reasoning. It's not really a matter for debate. I'm merely explaining my reasoning. You may or may not agree with it. Shall Sorry, then... Chairman, doesn't that mean that the only answer that we can give today is approval? And if that's the case, hmm? why are we making any further debate? Because you're saying, if we don't make a decision today, nothing will happen. Uh, and if it happens and it goes wrong, I, I think you are, you are tying this committee hand and foot to get, agreeing it today. And I can't take part in that. If that's what it's going to be, I'm going home now. I don't think that's what it's going to be. We have a decision before us, which is the same decision as we started in front of us at the beginning of the day, at the beginning of this item. That has not changed. Uh, I have merely used my casting vote to ensure that we continue to debate that option. We have the same options before us as we had when we first started discussing this. So, having said that, we've heard all the speakers. We've heard um, from experts. We've heard the assessment from our director. Does anyone want to uh, start the debate? on whether we should accept the recommendations before us. I think we have Councillor Bradnam again first. Uh, no, I, I gather, yes, I, I recall when I stopped Councillor Hales in midstream, would Councillor Bradnam allow me to restart uh, Councillor Hales and then come back to her? Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Councillor Hales. Thank you, Chair, before you change your mind. Okay. <laughs> Right, okay. I'll go back to where I started or where I was starting to say before because having been to the site and stood in the back garden of number 31 and looked at the levels and the flow that the water, the, the route the water took, right, that um, I remember asking Mr. Kelly that was this the actual extent of the, the raising of the edge uh, by 500 mil, I think it was, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't look enough. And it doesn't look like enough that the ring goes round enough, that raised ring goes round enough to actually say it will then hold back any waters of any kind of volume and um, severity. And another point was that Mr. Kelly made was that every single drop of water on that site that drops on that site goes into that pond because it's all permeable paving, all the roofs of the houses go into that pond, everything. So there is a vast amount of water, let alone anything that may or may not, with any kind of um, uh, rectification of road, road services and what have you, come off the Horseheath Road and come down onto the site by mistake or whatever. Right? So bearing in mind that others have said here today that our duty is to stop the impact of this development by flooding on somebody else. Right? So when that was a field, the, the neighbours said that it was a wet field, but it didn't come their way, it just stopped. So, as someone has said earlier, I think it was Councillor Bradman, that now we've got hard services, albeit that they're being sustainably drained, it has an effect. So, my belt and braces would be that we, we 
part of the debate, I suppose, is to say that we need to look at the height of that pond retaining wall that they've, they've, they've extended it up. They already knew that it was, it was low when they did it before, so they've extended it. There are gaps in it heading towards Martin Vane, I think it is, the south of it, if you look at it. Um, there was something that the Mr. Kelly mentioned about a ring, a concrete ring, was that, was that going to go in there, something like that. And so that can, needs to be about another 300 mil higher, and that would do a heck of a job. One glaring, Chair, one glaring thing was that Capita, who have reviewed the data from the LLPFA, right, is they haven't visited the site. They've done it a tabletop. One of the big recommendations I would say is if someone is going to peer review something, they go and actually visit and see this for, for themselves because that may well have changed that department's view of how they, how they review. So that's, that's what I would say. I said there are some glaring, to me, having worked with water for most of my working life, I know it has a mind of its own, right? And you need to keep it in check. And so for the small amount of capital outlay by the company to put an extra ring and move that ring and completely contain it, it's not a big ask. Thanks. Okay. There's a question there in relation to the technical specification of the ring on which I know the director has taken advice. So in a minute, I will, if I may, ask the director to comment on that, that point. But we have other speakers first, Councillor Bradnam and then Councillor Khan, I think. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, before we debate this any further, or at some point, I would find it really helpful if we could have a, just a look at those photographs from Linton Parish Council. That was the first time I'd seen them, and I would like to look at them and have them explained to me, because I wanted to see which way we were looking. There was one in particular that was labelled as Horseheath Road, and I couldn't see what it was. So that's one thing. And the second thing is, um, I would like... Somewhere along the line, and it's really sort of slightly along the lines of what Councillor Joyce Hales is saying, is that the, the which I was saying before, that the presence of this development, the hard surfaces of this development, make the existing normal rainfall off-site create more of a risk for the neighbours to this site. It used to fall and go onto soft land and be sunk. It'd be, you know, sink into the ground. But now that's caused a much faster recharge into um, natural flood flows. So I would like some advice about how that might be approached. But I would like to see those photographs from Linton Parish Council with an explanation, please. Yes. Um, so we're going back to one of our earlier uh, presenters to review the points they were making. If we can technically do that, we will. I'm not quite sure whether Karen is able to put up those photographs again. Chair, Chair I wonder with, um, whether Lawrence is able to actually show the slides because I think um, Linton Parish Council forwarded them uh, to him. Yeah, thank you. So I'd particularly like an explanation. What are we looking at on the left photograph? Chair, yes. so, uh, uh, Chair I think probably um, uh, the... Uh, Left-hand side photograph is the flood event uh, on the 20th of July. As it says, it is a picture of the basin uh, area. No, uh, it is. Uh, as no, is can, we, can we ask the people who presented the photographs? No, we're not going back to the presenters again. We've, we've done that. I think we have knowledge in the room. And the local it's member say, can tell it's, us. Right, the, the, it says it's Horseheath Road site from Lonsdale. So are we looking eastwards across the site to the development? And are we looking across the, the retention basin? Or are we looking further up? Perhaps I could ask the local member to tell you. We're, we're looking, if you, those who are on the site visit on Monday, we're looking northeast across the site, across the basin from the two gardens that we visited. So that is the basin that is full of water. That's where we are. That's 31 Lonsdale, isn't it? OK, and 36 Lonsdale is the gentleman we visited whose property had been really devastated. Okay. Thank you. Can we, can we move on through the photographs? I just wanted to see them properly. Okay. One of the concerns I had about that photograph was 
the volume, the potential volume and flow of that compared to the size of the infiltration pond. And so it says extent of properties who reported flooding directly from the site. Okay. Okay. Are you happy for us to take other speakers? Have you dealt with your concerns? You just carry on looking at the rest of the photographs because I didn't have a chance. So is the one on the left, that's saying number 36 Lonsdale, but looking from the east side? Is it looking across the bottom of the close? It's looking in the direction of the flood. Perhaps the I can the ask the local member flooded. again. The white one is uh, okay. uh, Councillor Bradman's question is the uh, perspective of those photographs. And what are the two in the middle? Uh, I mean, those of us who were present on the visit on Monday will quickly be able to see where those photographs were taken. Well, that's what uh, I'm just trying I don't... to clarify. I was there too, don't forget, and I was just trying to... Well, do you recall uh -huh. looking at that house we went into? I recognise the one on the left. Yes. Which are the two in the middle? The two photographs the, in the, the two middle. in the middle are the close of houses that we visited. So if you walk into the close, the first house we visited is on the left and the second on the right. So that's looking into and at that small close that small ring of houses in Lonsdale at the bottom of the road. So, Councillor Batchett, just so I understand, the middle two photographs is the top one looking, as it were, eastwards across the bottom of the close, or is it looking from Lonsdale as you look down the road? It's the bottom of the close looking up eastwards. towards the first house we visited. Okay. And right. the bottom uh, one Sorry, is Councillor Brandon, we have had the presentation. We've now seen the photographs as you requested. I would like the committee to be able to progress. We have not only this matter to resolve, but other matters. Are you happy for us to now progress? Thank you. Okay, does anyone else want to take part in the debate? I think we have Councillor Khan, and then Councillor Harvey, and then Councillor Milne. Right. I'll express my concern. I mean, uh, we've taken advice, obviously, about what um, we deal with the water on the site. Um, I'm concerned that, that uh, if we don't do any action, uh, we won't deal with the water that came from off the site. And I think this is probably far more important than the water actually on site. The water was coming down Porsley Throne. I've had experience myself in a different area of what happens when water falls on impacted ground uh, or hard surface like, uh, uh, like that and gathers other water. It can act as a turn basically into a river. Um, Previously, presumably, it continued on more horses road down into the village, and now it was taken off and went across the site. You also have a, co a, a compound which is a compacted ground, which is quite a considerable area, almost as much perhaps as the actual hard st standing on the site, uh, which will not be removed until the de development's uh, completed. Once it's finished, it will be removed, you'll have soft ground there, and, and, and uh, which will reduce some of it. I'm worried that we don't take action and we don't accept what we've got. Uh, we will not be able to deal with that. The, um, uh, I'm also worried that, that, that the development conditions should ensure that whatever is put in, way, uh, in place to prevent water coming off horse if road is maintained. It's, that's the most important thing of all, I think, in preventing flooding on that site. Um, whether the pond is large enough or not to contain the site does depend upon where the water comes from. And... Uh, it, the, the, what you saw in, long, uh, in last July basically is a mixture of two lots, uh, uh, and so it's difficult to judge whether that is actually the amount of water that happened after all these things have been put in place. Uh, I feel we're, I personally feel we're at risk if we don't uh, take action, uh, approve this. So if we're not, what are we going to do? We've, we've been put in a position, this is the advice we've got. We're not going to get better, at, are we going to get better advice where from? I think we're in a position we just have to accept that it, it, we have to take a decision and, and I can't really see any alternative but to accepting the best advice that we've received from experts. We're, we can't be more knowledgeable than them. That's my view. Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, oh, I suppose we, we do have to keep reminding ourselves that um, the purpose of, for example, the... the um, infiltration um, pond is, is, is to kind of equalise the situation to what it would have been had there not been any development at all. And I think um, living within the um, storm area, if you like, I mean, it, it, it was um, an exceptional 
um, amount of rain over an extended period. Um, but uh, um, having said that, I think we do really have to um, assure ourselves that this design, um, sort of as it is on the ground, um, mirrors what it is on paper. And um, I noted that um, Mr. Kell from the Parish Council picked up on the point, I think, um, that um, we've got this 10 to 1 um, safety margin uh, for the infiltration rate in the infiltration pond. And that means that, you know, at the start of its life, um, the infiltration rate is designed such that it can be degraded by a factor of 10 and it, it will still function. But, but my concern is that, and, and perhaps I've missed something in the report here, but that the last time that the infiltration rate was checked was in 2020, and that was before we had the July 21 event and, and before we had the settling tank, which kind of clears the water before it goes into the infiltration um, pond, and therefore um, has not some of that 10 to 1 safety margin already been eroded because of the July 21 event? And does it not need to be fully tested again um, before being signed off? Councillor, and then there are some technical questions that have been raised here, which is one of the problems of this debate. We are uh, making technical assessments well beyond our expertise, and I think it's important, therefore, that before we come to a decision, we invite the uh, director to just comment on the technical issues that have been raised. So um, I think we come to Councillor Milne. Yeah, I just want to make a quick point. That all of this uh, work that we're talking about for uh, flood defences relies on uh, the build uh, working specification. And um, I gave the example of a developer's site where their um, permeability, their flood scheme wasn't working to the specification. And I just wonder whether it's possible for us to include a condition here that says um, the developers should have an insurance policy and should uh, the flood uh, defences that they're, um, we're proposing here not work, that they uh, cover the cost of uh, their neighbours' uh, damage through flood. Thanks so much. I'd be hugely in favour of that, albeit I don't think they go for it. But, <laughs> but um, anyway, I mean, my, my thoughts are, um, obviously, the minimum standard things have to be built to is to stop a one in 100 year flood event. Obviously, we're being told that the proposal in front of us uh, will go above and beyond that. But the only issue with that is that is completely untested. We've, we've had a flood event in, in the last year. It has the basin, which, of, of course, wasn't there at the time, hasn't worked. Um, but of course, one of the factors we, we need to look at as a committee is before any development goes ahead, we need to make sure that the, uh, the flood amelioration works um, that go with that development shouldn't make the situation worse. Clearly, the developers started building before implementing the system, which, which obviously there are <laughs> as a different discussion altogether. Um, but we've seen that the development will increase the flood risk to that corner of the site and therefore to the neighbours. Um, so we are in a position where we have a scheme in front of us that we're being asked to approve and we're not 100% sure if it will actually do the job. We're being told by various um, consultees and experts that it will, but the simple fact on the ground is, and you know, as some of the neighbours have told us today and at previous meetings, they want absolute certainty that their, their properties aren't going to flood again. So personally, for me, um, I would prefer to see a scheme that we, we are going to get a guarantee that uh, neighbouring properties will not flood, whether that is you know, building a bigger pond or some kind of piping or some kind of pumping of the pond away, that would be my preference. Albeit, I know we're going to be advised by officers that we can't insist on that. We've been asked to judge what is in front of us today uh, and we need to do it on planning um, material considerations. But personally, for me, I wouldn't be comfortable approving something that we aren't certain will stop flooding of neighbouring properties and will therefore uh, make people's lives a lot worse. So for me, I'm at the moment leaning towards not supporting this. Okay, well, we've had a number of contributions, some of which made some 
raised some technical questions, which I think it's important we ask the director to, uh, to deal with to the extent possible. Uh, I would emphasize that it is not possible to have absolute certainty. Whatever is done will be, by its very definition, untested. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, and a number of, number of points uh, there. So the, uh, the starting point obviously has to be what was the existing position before any development um, of the site. Uh, the environment, uh, and uh, coming back to the point about uh, how much certainty um, uh, can you secure, and indeed what is the requirement, picking up on Councillor Bradnam's point around the scheme itself. So quite rightly, um, uh, and case law is absolutely clear on this point, uh, the purpose of uh, mitigating the impacts of development does not mean that it is obliged to make it any better than it was uh, and as if there were no development. So that's the, that's the reference point. Um, uh, and what level of assurance can you have around that? Well, the environment agency maps, which I know the parish contests, but the environment agency maps show that this site had, before any development, an issue about surface water being conveyed across it to the southwest corner. Uh, and that in um, uh, certain scenarios that uh, could give rise to flooding of adjoining properties. And the properties that I identified as potentially flooding uh, were those um, that experienced a flood event uh, in July last year, a, a very substantial uh, event. Um, but the, when the Planning Commission was granted for this site, um, and mindful of those provisions, um, uh, the consultants uh, engaged by the applicant at that time put forward a number of principles um, uh, which were required to be followed by the inspector in order to address that potential flooding issue and to mitigate it. Uh, some of those principles covered the issues that I think Councillor Khan's raised around uh, off-site water. So the deliberate point of raising the uh, entrance into the site was to ensure that water was not conveyed from Horse Heath Road in flood events into the site and therefore accelerated down to the bottom. Uh, and likewise, uh, principles about a, an eastern fund to the development that meant that the higher ground to the uh, east of the site uh, did not result in water being conveyed across that relatively impermeable area, captured and conveyed onto the site and thence into um, some form of attenuation or control basin. Uh, so the FRA principles uh, that existed uh, in the Grant of Planning Commission were then translated through into the surface water drainage scheme that you have got in front of you now. That surface water drainage scheme has been through a number of iterations uh, and has had a relatively cautious um, set of assumptions in terms of the ground performance of the rates of infiltration and so on. Uh, and it's also been designed with a greater safety factor than might normally be the case uh, and uh, modelled to be uh, effectively a pessimistic view about um, infiltration rates uh, and uh, the performance of, of the system to try and offer a degree of assurance to the Lead Local Flood Authority uh, that the scheme is no worse than um, if there were no development or, or mitigates the impact of the development fully. Now, what you've quite understandably heard is that in, um, before that scheme has been implemented, and midway through the construction of this site, whether that was right or wrong, uh, in a sense we need to ignore, but midway through the construction of that site, uh, a, um, an, uh, a rainfall event happened that resulted in very substantial uh, conveyance of water from off-site uh, and um, uh, travelling across that site in an unmitigated way uh, into that infiltration basin took place and it then cascaded from that basin which had a lower level than currently, but um, uh, into uh, the gardens of properties on Lonsdale. It's, it's really important, and thence to Bakers Lane and, and others. It's really important, however, not to conflate the two as uh, the absolute effect of what would happen if you granted this scheme, is that you would see a repeat of that. The assurance, the only assurance you can have uh, is that uh, there has been technical modelling and challenge and peer review of a set of um, rainfall and infiltration rate assumptions drawn by the Lead Local Flood Authority with their, with their advisors. That's the assurance that the Planning Authority is entitled to rely upon reasonably in a circumstance such as this, because across the country, uh, at, a, at the stage of approving a detail, you have no other 
form of assurance than the assurance that your experts and advisors give you on a technical set of appraisals. And it's entirely reasonable to rely upon that. Now, sadly for the residents of, of Lonsdale and, and residents in Linton, obviously they've got direct experience of a half-built scheme causing very substantial impacts upon their properties. Um, but it is important to distance yourself from that. And those residents, quite rightly, are, have asked a lot of questions over the last 12 months, or last since the event, but in fact we're asking, the Parish Council have asked questions before that, about the um, effectiveness of any surface water drainage proposal. Indeed, the Parish Council made representations at the planning appeal, I understand, uh, about the very issue of water conveyance across the site. Um, but you are entitled and seek to, your assurance should come from the, pro, from the statutory consultee and their obligation uh, to you uh, to provide sound advice on, on flood risk and the technical appraisal um, that they've undertaken. It might assist you to hear the um, uh, uh, assumptions made by uh, Capita in their peer review, which did take, my understanding is, a sceptical and pessimistic view about the performance of the system. And if you want to hear that, then obviously uh, uh, you know, there's a representative here of that peer review to, to um, uh, provide some assurance that in design terms, the, the model, the, the micro drainage model that they used um, uh, did have regard to levels of uh, water that are commensurate with what you should observe as a consequence of the scheme. But, but um, you cannot seek an insurance policy from a developer to that effect. They are effectively liable um, if, they, if they attribute and cause um, uh, off-site impacts, as any other landowner is, to uh, the effects on neighbouring properties. Um, uh, and so I wouldn't argue that, that it is reasonable to do that. It's also not reasonable in law to require the developer to remove entirely all flood risk from all properties surrounding the site. The courts are really clear that that exceeds the requirements of the planning system and cannot be uh, a reasonable uh, action on the planning authority. So you're then left with forming a judgment on does the proposal make it any worse than if there was no development there at all. Uh, and the only assurance you can, we can offer in that case is that notwithstanding the additional hard servicing, notwithstanding the um, uh, potentially increase in runoff rates to the infiltration basin that that gives rise to when compared with a vegetated greenfield, the assessment and the assumptions that have been made uh, suggests that you can conclude that the, that the site um, uh, has no greater impact than it would have done if there was no, if there was no development. Uh, and, the, and the design, picking up on Councillor Hale's um, question, why can't you just make the basin taller? Well, the, the applicants have demonstrated that the design of the basin would already accommodate an event over and above the design standard uh, that is applied across the UK. Um, across most of the UK, uh, or most of England, I should say, because Scotland has a 1 in 200 year uh, flood standard, um, but which is the design standard that your uh, councils work to. Um, just a final point to, 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 to make. Um, uh, I think Mr Fontaine raised a point around um, structural integrity of the um, uh, concrete plug. Uh, and at the site visit on uh, Monday, we were asked about the um, integrity of that uh, element of the structure because of a concern from local residents around failure. Uh, the applicants have provided detailed technical structural calculations for that concrete plug to the bund. But obviously the local planning authority, uh, those were provided yesterday. I have not had an opportunity to confirm the soundness of those technical calculations. I have no reason to doubt them. Um, but I have not had the ability to confirm from a structural engineer that their assurance. So my uh, recognising residents' concerns, particularly um, uh, those immediately adjoining the site, about that risk of failure, um, uh, I would suggest that if you are minded to um, uh, uh, go with uh, the recommendation today, that you perhaps delegate to me that that approval is only issued or agreement is only issued once I've been able to confirm from uh, the Council's Building Control Service and its structural advisors that that structure 
and the calculations for that design ought to be acceptable. Um, but I'm afraid I can't offer any further um, uh, opportunity for insurances and so on that would be reasonable in, right. in planning terms. Thank you. I'm keen to move to a vote. We've had a good debate on it, but uh, I know Councillor Toomey Hawkins wanted to contribute to the debate. Councillor uh, Harvey, you have already contributed. Do you want to have a further bash at it after Councillor yes. Hawkins? Well, you do. Like, okay. Yeah. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say thank you to um, the uh, residents that we met at the visit um, on Monday uh, for sharing their views and their concerns. Um, and obviously the site visit did help uh, to understand uh, the lie of the land and um, how things happened uh, that unfortunate July uh, last year. Um, from what um, Mr. Kelly has told us and from what we've heard, obviously the LLFA is, uh, they are the um, experts in this. And this system that has been proposed has been peer reviewed, as we've heard. Um, and I just want to refer us, if I may, to pages 258. Um, and it's under, I think it's paragraph 42 under subparagraph 4, which tells us that the system has been designed to accommodate one in a hundred year storm allowance plus 40% for climate change. And, you know, it's got uh, a 300 mil now, a free board, <laughs> which has been incorporated. It will have tank permeable paving and it's been checked with a safety factor of 10. I know that was mentioned before, but then let's bear in mind that when the rainfall event happened in July, the system wasn't fully built. What we have now has been tested, and if you go to paragraph 49 on page 259, there's a whole lot more explaining what's been done, how it's been um, modeled, but, it does say the results show that the surface water runoff will be contained within the infiltration basin for all these events with at least a hundred mil freeboard in the one in a thousand year event, which seems to indicate that even worse than what happened on that day, this thing, when it is built, as has been proposed to us, will deal with the situation. And it does say that. It does say that it will go, it will provide protection that goes well beyond the requirements of planning policy and is also well beyond the severity of the July 2021 event. And I can understand why there is um, uh, though the concern that people are thinking it will not work, it might not work. But let's just bear in mind that the experts, the LLFA, peer review, they are the ones responsible. And frankly, they are responsible for this. We can't do any more than they've done. And it's for me on that basis, I will be voting for it because I don't want to see them go through this ever again. Thank you. Uh, do you want to can, can I just clarify um, uh, that paragraph 49 is the applicant's comment, not the LLFA's comment, but uh, sorry. Okay. Right, Councillor Harvey. Yeah. Um, I did ask to speak again, Chair, because I don't think Mr. Kelly really asked the, the nub of my question, which really is, I'm not questioning the design, I'm just questioning whether as built at the moment actually corresponds to what the design is. And surely um, it would be the simplest thing to retest the infiltration rate now that it is built to check that it actually corresponds to the design rather than design um, degraded by some factor. I think... Unless I'm wrong, because uh, Councillor Hawkins seemed to imply there that it had been recently tested, but in the so only model. Well, in that case, I mean, why can we now not retest it? Because surely that is a simple experiment to run. Right. Um, my suggestion is that perhaps we propose a further condition that uh, the infiltration rate should be retested. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. Um, I think, Councillor Milnes, you wanted to come back again? Yeah. Very, no? brief, okay. very briefly. I, I, I just think I'm uh, minded um, to vote in favour of this because of the um, uh, 
uh, reservations that uh, the director has uh, told us about in terms of not making it worse than it was previously. Yes, yes. And it, it seems to me that we've got a proposal that the experts are telling us will uh, provide that protection. Actually, the, the resident that spoke to us right at the beginning of this session uh, said we want to be protected and this will allow us to do so. And I think we, we actually have to vote in that way today. Okay. I think we're ready for a vote. I'm going to ask one more speaker, which is myself. Um, I ha have thought very carefully about whether this will give us absolute certainty. Will it definitely prevent a flood? The answer is no. That is not the test, as I think the director explained earlier on. The question is, will it reduce the risk if this work is undertaken, if the four specific measures that we looked at yesterday are undertaken because of an approval of this? Um, will it ensure that the risk is less than it would have been in the absence of the development? And it's quite clear to me that it would ensure that the risk is less. We deferred consideration of this principally because we had not then seen the LLFA report or indeed the capita peer review of that report. Um, and we have clear advice now, both the LFA and CAPITA are now of the view that the design of the surface water drainage scheme is sufficient to meet local and national policy uh, and so on. In summary, the system has been designed to cater for events up to and including that 100 year plus allowance for climate change. We've now agreed that we add a condition that the infiltration, which is clearly one of the doubts, be tested and the conditions that the uh, director mentioned earlier on on that basis, it is quite clear to me that we should now accept the recommendations, which of course are not absolute. Um, thank you very much, just in time. Officers recommend that the planning committee accept the following surface water drainage details, but do not formally discharge the condition. And I won't read out all the conditions there, but I think we have now got to the point. Oh, sorry, one last thing, yes. Sorry, Chair, I'm reluctant to contra contradict you, but it, it is difficult to add a condition to, the, um, to, this, to this decision. I think what, um, uh, what I, uh, on the inf testing the infiltration, okay. because effectively it qualifies whether or not the scheme is adequate. I think um, uh, there, as a, by way of a way forwards, um, could I suggest that, um, you, I was suggesting that you delegate to me uh, a uh, agreement or acceptance of the proposals subject to the um, uh, structural integrity of the design for the concrete plug being confirmed by building control. It seems to me that um, a, a similar conclusion might be required in, in able, uh, through the confirmation of the infiltration performance uh, of, the, of the basin being within the tolerances effectively uh, used for the design parameters set out in the uh, assessment and appraisal by the Lead Local Flood Authority. I think against those terms, uh, if, it, if um, a, a subsequent test of the infiltration performance fails to fit within those design parameters in the view of the local, Lead Local Flood Authority, then um, I suspect I may well need to bring this back to you. But I think that is probably Subject the safest to those way. two they're not con conditions, those two proposals, uh, we now, I think, move to a vote. Uh, do we accept the officer's recommendation on page 263, subject to those terms. And I'm going to ask for a formal vote on this. Uh, so if we could set that up, please, Aaron. Usual. So if we're in favour of the Office of Recommendations, we vote green. Ah, right. Thank you. So there are nine of us voting, and the vote is five in favour of accepting the officer's recommendation on page 263, and therefore that is carried. It's, it's approved six to three. Right. We... Um, I propose to move on quite quickly to the uh, related item that is carried, um, which is listed as. Yeah. 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 
Yes. Uh, legal officers request a two-minute break. Um, so we will suspend the...
so we proceed now to item. Uh, we're live, yeah. Good, we're, we're live. So we proceed to what is listed as being item six. No, we don't. No, we don't. Thirteen. No, 13 thank you. <laughs> uh, there we go. Submission of details required by condition twelve in relation to foul water drainage. Um, of the same development, page 265 onwards in your papers. Um, we do have some potential uh, public speakers on this as well, but if we could just hear from the director. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Karen, if you're, if you're there, there's a, um, a, a few slides um, which, which I'll aim to very much canter through. Um, this item was deferred because of its relationship um, or members wishing to see um, the foul water uh, scheme uh, treated alongside the surface water scheme that you've just uh, uh, considered. Um, it's actually a separate system uh, and um, it's not a combined sewer uh, in this particular case. Uh, and um, when we were on site on uh, Monday, uh, you were able to see the location of the pump and storage tank. Uh, it is a pumped foul um, uh, sewer uh, scheme uh, with a connection into the existing sewage network uh, on Lonsdale, um, shown uh, on the uh, slide uh, in front of you. Uh, you can also see the pumping station um, where uh, the cursor is uh, next to plot 31, and members on site were able to see that relationship. Um, from the uh, authorities' perspective, uh, Anglian Water are satisfied with the uh, calculations uh, of the um, scheme and have confirmed that they have capacity to receive the uh, foul, uh, uh, the, the foul uh, outfall. Um, uh, there were also consultations undertaken with the um, uh, with the environmental health officer because of the proximity of the pumping installation uh, relative uh, to the house itself uh, at plot 31 and concerns about both noise and odour. As you'll see in the report, uh, those concerns uh, have been uh, resolved. Uh, and, um, uh, Chair, I, th I think uh, we're going to hear from the Parish Council uh, who have a, um, a number of concerns about the... Um, uh, foul water system in Linton uh, uh, and um, you can see there a comment set out uh, in terms of both the calculation methodology and, and so forth in the report. Uh, you can also see Anglian Water's uh, response to that um, uh, also within the report in which uh, they do not share the concerns in terms of the um, scheme design uh, with uh, the Parish Council. Uh, Chair, in the interests of, of, of time, I don't propose to uh, say any more unless there uh, are specific uh, concerns, but I think the main points there are highlighted. Thank you, Director. I think that's very clear. Can we then proceed directly to our uh, public speakers? And I think in this case, we don't have anyone from the developers. We're going straight to Councillor Kate Kell again. Uh, Councillor Kell, are you there? Yes. Hello again. Yes, I'd be most grateful uh, if you would keep to the three minutes, but um, please go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Um, if Lawrence could just sort of a minute on each slide is, is fine. I've, I've not got any points where I'm asking for next slide. So, Chair, councillors, thank you for permission to speak. Any overflow of surface water from the development will enter the foul sewer on Bartlow Road as occurred on the 20th of July 2021. This is the same foul sewer being proposed for connection. Anglian Water has not approved the on-site calculations and have refused to adopt any of the on-site elements of this foul water plan. And it's obvious why if you look at the plans, but it also means that any problems won't be publicly recorded. The plans show sharp S bends, in fact Z bends would be more accurate, uphill between the pump and Lonsdale. These are likely to cause blockages and there's no proper provision for clearing them. The foul pipes run almost exclusively through enclosed private gardens with many close to homes where future extensions would be expected. 
the flow route of sewage in the event of blockages, pump failure or downstream surcharge has not been provided. The drainage calculations document and the drawings are inconsistent. And although the flows have apparently been tested by building control, something went horribly wrong on the 3rd of February with intervention required to deal with the strong sewage smells reported on the site and on Lonsdale, and this with only seven homes occupied for less than two months. Others have pointed out that the houses are much too close and the noise and smell of the pump and the storage tank. No account has been taken of the noise and odour that neighbours have already experienced and when waiting for future breakdowns to be fixed, a tanker will be needed to empty the tank. According to the sewerage sector guidance, foul only drains can become septic in as little as six hours, so would tankers with their noise and smell be needed four times a day? When challenged about the proximity of the pump to the neighbouring dwellings, the developer states that as the pump station is private, there is no requirement to justify the distance from a habitable building to the pump. This doesn't offer reassurance regarding their attitude towards the long-term effects of the private foul or surface water drainage schemes they're proposing. The backup proposed procedure is to repeat what flooded our village eight months ago. Anglian Water comments added to the portal on the 6th of September acknowledged the foul water system is taking surface as well as foul water, yet the developer and consultees persistently fail to take this into account. As well as, uh, as the pipes are taking surface, flood and highways water as well as foul, it is a mixed system and under much greater pressure than acknowledged. The calculations must include this water. The calculations from Anglian Water also propose accepting a capacity that's only 10% of the sewer adoption guidance. Small wonder that they are inconsistent with our drainage consultant and do not explain the surcharging and flooding events experienced by residents. The wording of this condition says that no development shall take place until details of a scheme for foul water drainage have been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority and including arrangements for subsequent management. Details of these future management plans have not been submitted and this, with this application and are clearly vital. Councillors, this scheme will not protect against the risk of flooding, nor protect the amenities of neighbours and future occupiers. It is not complete in the detail provided and it should be refused. Thank you. Then I think we go to the local member again, Councillor John Batchelor. I assume the other local member will be happy to... Speaking the debate. Speaking the debate. Yes, thank you. Councillor Batchelor. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think Councillor Kell has given a, a very clear um, opinion on this, which I, I fully endorse. The only thing I want to add for the benefit of, of members is just to bear in mind that uh, your um, technical consultee is Anglian Water, and as you you no, Anglian never has any problem with uh, taking um, foul water from uh, new developments because they take the attitude there is no point doing work on things until they have approval uh, and they have a statutory obligation to take whatever comes off of those developments anyway. So um, I wouldn't take too much notice of Anglian Water and uh, particularly just to um, endorse what Councillor Kell was saying about the fact that they take no notice whatsoever of water getting into the system. They only judge whether or not the, uh, the, the system works with the foul element and the fact that um, the world is entirely different from that uh, appears to take no notice. So uh, I would also agree that this is not fit for purpose and should be refused. Thank you. Thank you um, so I think we progress straight to the debate. Does anyone have any further technical questions for the director before we do that? No? Good. So who wants to contribute to the debate? Who do we have? No? What? Uh, ah, Councillor Bradman. Um, Councillor John Batcher is right. Anglian Water never object um, because they are obliged to accept connections and flows um, so that they're not in a position to be able to do so, unfortunately. But like Councillor Batcher, I observe 
uh, and others, page 267 under paragraph 11, um, they do acknowledge that the flooding uh, was caused by surface water and surface water enters our foul only network which causes surcharging. And they then go on to say it shouldn't be in the foul system, but the fact that it does. Now, I would very much like to know, and they're not here to ask the question, but have they actually gone along and spoken to all the people whose surface water might be being directed into their foul uh, network to ask them to make sure that their rainwater goods do not go into that system? It's academic because, as I say, they're not here. But the fact that they know that it does go in, they know that it caused the flooding... It says the flooding was caused by surface water, which had entered their foul-only network. Um, and, you know, and yet they haven't apparently done anything about it. It's just a comment, really, and it's just grumpiness. I, I'm, I'm feeling grumpy about it, that they haven't taken responsibility for it. Uh, Councillor Milnes. Just quickly, uh, we know that uh, Anglian Water have problems with dealing with uh, flood water. Uh, and we also know they have difficulty dealing with capacity issues. Um, Councillor Hales will remember the uh, situation where a development had to be uh, forced to be unoccupied because the foul system could not cope with the extra demand. And this is a persistent problem. Um, the um, Anglian water system is obliged to take uh, flood water overflows. Um, they can't deny it, but that occasionally causes problems as it did in December 2019 with backflow so that people are getting uh, horrible uh, situations arising uh, through their uh, toilet and uh, sewage systems. Councillor Hales. I didn't expect to be that quick. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm surprised, Chair, that we have um, a system as alleged by the Parish Council that has an S-Bend in such a short distance to the, to the main that it connects to. Um, it would be interesting to see if there's any pictorial evidence for that because why would you put in an S-Bend pipe um, which is uh, under pressure, it's daft. And if it's anything out of any of this, I would ask that the Anglian Water or the, the, sorry, the developer comes back and they go, find the straight route to the drains rather than anything else because you have resistance. The minute you've got a bend in a pipe, you've got resistance on the pipe. And it, as, as already said, the likelihood of blockage is, is much greater. Councillor Martin Khan. I feel very lost really how to respond to this because as, as has been said frequently, Anglia Water has never objected, always has to accept. It's clear there are problems with the sewage system in Linton, generally, is being overcharged. Um, yet, in a sense, the decision whether there was going to be a problem on the general sewage system was taken when the original application was approved, because it's inevitable you're going to have to put sewage in the system. And it's going to work. Um, presumably, the system is designed, as we've been told, you won't have surface water going onto the system in the new development. So you're just adding foul sewage into a system which is overloaded, and it's just... Um, it's, it's not going to help. So what do we do? Do we refuse the, 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 the system? Um, uh, well, then what do they do? They're going to have to, are we going to put in a massive septic tank to deal with it? How are we going to handle it? Um, I don't really... So I, I, find, I find myself in a quandary because obviously there is unhappiness about it, but I don't really know what, we, what happens if we refuse. Um, so I express... Just express my concern about the conundrum that we put in, uh, situate, quandary we put in. Mm -hmm. Right, no other speakers before we come to a conclusion. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, well, just quickly, I think I do share some of the concerns of some of the speakers today. As someone who has lived in the area, I do know that that, uh, that foul water system does take water from elsewhere, not just the foul system. So I appreciate we, that is not what we can judge it on. Um, and obviously Anglian Water only base their calculations on foul water, even though they, in our own documents, do accept that the, one of the reasons for the flooding is because other water got into their system. 
Um, but I appreciate it from a planning point of view, it's very difficult to um, to to go against that, go against what our uh, our statutory consultees are saying. But uh, as someone who does know the area on a personal level, I mean, I can't hear any good conscience vote for something I know uh, it is unlikely to be um, fit for purpose. So in my, I'm sure I'll be in the minority, but I will either be abstaining or voting against you. Thank you. Um, I would add my, my own comments here. Uh, our only statutory consultees on this are, of course, Angling Water. I accept the reservations about their previous advice that have been made by a number of councillors here today, but I still think we have to take very seriously what they say. They have confirmed that there is adequate capacity within the system for the foul water flows from development of this site. Uh, the proposal would not be detrimental to the foul sewage network or the local area. Um, and it's also been confirmed that the combined impact of foul drainage from this site and the Bartlow Road site has been taken into consideration. Now, do we therefore accept the officer's recommendation that the planning committee accept the following the foul water drainage details, not formally discharge it? Um, or do we reject this, in which case we have to ask ourselves what is to happen uh, in the absence of a drainage system that has been approved? Um, has one two, three. We have some more speakers. Right. Um, so I gather that the first was Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll keep it brief. Um, so this is the situation we often find ourselves in, isn't it? That we have technical advice, we have angling water, we know we're obliged to do something, and then we have local knowledge local experts that have seen it and events have happened and we seem to be always in this sort of battle of wills of almost mind over heart um, and maybe it's the time of day chair but I've become a little bit impatient of this battle between us and having the responses and then not going with the local local views and, and local expertise so on this on this application, I'm willing, we've done it on one other, I'm willing to give, them, give my balance in favour of local people who have seen the damage. I've heard from both local members, and I'm going to vote against. Right, I think we still have other speakers. Uh, Councillor Braddon, you have spoken before. Did you have something new to add? Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am looking at the drainage plan, and I remember uh, the case officer showed us very briefly on her laptop yesterday when we, uh, when we were on site. And the S-Bend people are referring to is that the plan takes the sewage directly, if this plan is running north, but north up the main access road, west between two properties, then north again to the rear of the garden of plot 35 and then into the manhole at Lonsdale. Now I have local and immediate and experience of this sort of right angle bend getting blocked in sewers. And I'm just wondering if there's any room to ask the developer to recreate those corners. I know that there are people already on site, there's already usage of this, but I'm just wondering if there's any mileage in which we could ask for those right angle bends to be made gentler curves so that they don't block. Question. Yeah, but it's, uh, and it's already in use, so. Uh, Chair you're, Chair, you're right. The scheme it, um, before you is the, is, is the one that you need to consider. Um, if you're unhappy with the um, orientation and alignment of the, of the drainage system, um, then you need to express that view by not supporting the proposals. Um, the, uh, I would just add that the system has been inspected by the building control team, but obviously I can't comment on uh, individual very localised elements of that, of that um, a drainage scheme, but uh, I don't think it's within the gift of the committee to condition effectively a, an adjustment to a very specific element of, of the scheme in front of you right now. Um, you'd need to reject the proposal. So the proposal we are 
now about to vote on is the recommendation. Does Councillor Hales want to speak again? Super quick, Chair. It was something you said earlier, you were reading out the Anglian Water. You said there was plenty of capacity or slack in the system. Um, the same thing happened in Melbourne. Anglian Water said exactly the same thing. They said there was 50% slack in the system. When they did the hydraulic test that we held them to account, there was the system at 100% capacity, and therefore they added capacity to the system. I would probably say no more other than I think we have another similar situation. Okay, well, I think we now proceed to the formal vote. Uh, if you could set it up for us. Uh, usual thing, if we accept the recommendation of paragraph 40, then we vote green. If we reject it, then we vote red. Well, that is clearly... That's six to one... One more to vote? Yes. That is clearly uh, refused by seven votes to two, one abstaining. Um, so we now move on to, I promised we would get there in the end. Uh, Chair, and yes. can I just clarify for the, with the committee the reason for mm. refusal of the um, drainage, um, uh, the foul drainage scheme? Because I've heard, I've heard um, two broad threads. The first one relates to capacity in the local network to receive the foul drainage detail, uh, the, the, the effluent from the site. Um, and then I've also heard a conversation around the um, alignment of the um, uh, foul drainage system um, uh, on site. Um, but it would be helpful to clarify. My only concern is that obviously um, uh, any planning inspector looking at this is going to ask the uh, Foul Water Receiving Authority um, for a position in respect of the foul sewer, and you have that in front of you. But um, uh, is it that the alignment of the um, foul water sewer on site is the reason for your rejection, or is it both? And I'd be grateful if you could clarify that for me, please. I think it is both, isn't it? Um, let's see who put the, I think Councillor Bradnam, you were the one who was concerned particularly about the alignment. Uh, and I think others, let's not debate it, but I think others were concerned about uh, the, the capacity. If you remember, um, Chair, so I, think I did make a point things. that you might find useful. One of them was um, the alignment of the sewer and the suggestion that it looks wise to maybe make sure that right-angled bends are, are made so that they're not right-angled, so that they're small curved and they're less likely to block. That's my personal view. I'm not a sewage expert. But we're talking I just, about the reasons for refusal here. Yes, and that's what I'm doing. The second one is that Anglian Water admit at paragraph number 11, yes. the second part of it, that surface water enters our foul-only network. And that... Um, I think they should be required Does to that cover it, director? address that. I would say you cannot cite Anglian Water as a reason for refusal when they have not objected and indicated that they have no objection to the proposals. So uh, you, you are, um, I'm afraid, uh, you cannot cite a statutory consultee saying something that it is not saying. Um, uh, no, they, no, they no, have considered I, you would need me, to director, indicate. What I was saying was that they have a I, I quite take your point. They have not objected to the, you know, they've, they've proposed the application, so of course they're for it. But they are saying that surface water enters their foul only network. And, and I'm just saying it would seem wise to ask them to address the matter of surface water entering their foul water network. No. Okay, I'm not proposing to open a debate here. All we're seeking to do is to find for the director one or two reasons uh, which he can cite as the reason for refusal. The decision has already been taken on this one. And I think, uh, so far as is possible, the director has a clear understanding of our reasons for refusing this. I think, um, if you can delegate to me, I think there are two elements. Um, you're, you're not cite, but you are maintaining a concern which the parish council have identified about the ability of the foul 
drainage in Linton to receive the outputs from this site. Uh, I mean, that is a problematical reason for refusal because it's got planning permission, as I think Councillor Khan highlighted. Um, but then the um, other element is that the horizontal and vertical alignment of the foul sewer detailed in the drawings um, gives rise to a concern in terms of potential for blockages. Can we delegate it to the director to describe it in broadly those terms? We don't need to dictate the exact wording to him. We can then move on to the next item. Is that okay? If the director is... Uh, Right. Well, that's my next point. Is um, we're now uh, at five past five. Um, I believe the, our legal advisor has kindly agreed to defer some other matter so that he can stay with us, and I believe our director is able to stay with us. Uh, we have no further meetings until June. I think it is important that uh, we deal with the matters before us. So, if we could respond to the chat to that effect, and if members will agree, we proceed. Thank you. So we come to listed as item seven, land to the northeast of Childerley Farm, Childerley Estate, page one, two, three in your papers. Um, it's a renewable energy led generation station. Um, applicant, Mr. Hawkins, on behalf of Solar Century. Um, the recommendation is approval. The presenting officer, Tom Gray, is Tom Gray still with us or? Will the director? Yes. Tom, sorry to have held you up so long. Thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you, Chair. Please give us your, your, your presentation. Bear in mind that we have seen the papers before us. And we will okay, be I'll keep, from it, witnesses, I'll keep it so short. I'll keep it short. Too much detail. Thank you. Um, just, a, just a couple of things in terms of clarification. First, the first point is um, in uh, paragraph one of the report, it refers to. Um, uh, solar arrays and ancillary structures covering an area of approximately 80 hectares. It should refer to 23.6 hectares of land. Um, that is the the, 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 the the area of land covered by the structures. The 80 hectares of land actually refers to the red line area of the site, which also includes landscape enhancements and, and biodiversity enhancements. Um, a couple of, of updates. Um, uh, the, the recently the the um, planning portal was, portal has been updated with um, new plans. Uh, just clarifying the uh, CCTV layout um, of the proposal. Um, in addition to uh, the inclusion of the AC combiners uh, within the energy farm compound. Um, so this is just a matter of clarification. Um, uh, a third party representation has been received um, in the last couple of days. Um, uh, I can summarise uh, what they said. Um, they are strongly in favour of the proposal. They uh, live fairly close to the application site along Battlegate Road. Um, uh, there's a limited number of uh, places where solar farms of this size can be located because um, uh, of the limitations and the location of the power line infrastructure. Um, the loss of the agricultural output um, from these eight hectares of land would be outweighed by the use of the land in meeting the urgent need for, to cut CO2 emissions. Um, and it would also enable diversification of the farm business. Uh, this um, third party representation is available on the website. I will now go into my presentation. Can you confirm that you can see my screen, Chair? Thank you. So the proposal is for a solar farm um, and then salute structures located um, to the north of the Childerly Estate. I'm going to change my pointer. So this is the, the village of Childerly and the estate here, and to the north of that, is the application site. The site access is gained from the A428 um, uh, to the south 
um, by an access road. The um, the proposal seeks a 37 year temporary consent for the solar farm. Um, this is uh, 50 megawatts of power will be generated, which would could power up to 14,200 homes. Um, so in terms of the site constraints, the site is bounded on three sides by uh, public right-of-ways. Uh, to the east is a bridleway and the others are footpaths. Um, there's also a historic park and garden to the south and also listed buildings, which are displayed on your screen now, these hatched uh, pink lines. As a previous application for the site in 2015, there's two reasons for refusal. Uh, the first one being the siting, the, the size and scale of the development um, and the impact upon the landscape character and the visual impact upon the footpaths. And uh, the other one being the lack of evidence. So the proposal um, is uh, for a solar farm, as I just mentioned, with solar arrays and a um, solar generation generating um, ancillary structures um, here. Um, the point of connection would be to the west and it'd only be 0.7 kilometers away. The um, solar arrays would um, have a height of approximately three meters in height with um, a gap of approximately 3.5 meters between the arrays. Um, the ancillary structures would be quite modest structures. Um, I would range from about three meters to up to 6.75 meters in height, uh, but there would be a significant distance from any public uh, right of ways. Um, the landscape impact, there's been a lot of work done in terms of the mitigation of landscaping. The landscape officer is, is content that there's um, more, there's enough uh, planting um, along the public foot, footpaths um, to mitigate any impact um, and substantial biodiversity improvements. In terms of landscape visual impact, um, the top um, image shows it currently, what it looks like. Um, after one year, um, the middle um, picture shows what it would look like, and then after ten years, that is the the, the bottom uh, uh, bottom picture, and this is from the northeast of the application site. Again, same sort of pictures. This is from the southwest of the or west of the site. And this is from the south of the site. And these are some other photos and some photos of my site visit. In terms of the agricultural land use uh, classification of the, of the area, um, as members would know from previous um, committee items that the South, South Cambridgeshire is, um, has high, good high quality agricultural land. Um, and this picture, this is from the DEFRA um, land classification website, which demonstrates that there is a lot of um, grade two agricultural land, which is um, described as very good quality. Um, in terms of um, the grid connection, it would be, um, uh, connected to the grid, to the grid line between uh, Little Barford and the Histon um, points of connection um, at a point, as I said, of 0.7 kilometres away from the application site. So the actual site itself um, is a mixture of mainly grade, subgrade 3A, which is regarded as good quality land. Um, there is some grade two, very good quality land, and also some subgrade three B, moderate quality. So grades one to uh, subgrade three A are regarded as the best and most versatile agricultural land, or BMVAL for short. 
Um, anything below subgrade 3B is regarded as non BM val land. So in total, the area is uh, has 83 uh, percent of, of the land uh, as BM val. There has been cons there's considered alternative sites um, using um, uh, they provided sequential analysis um, showing that, that there's no better developed land, previously developed land, um, as well as no poorer quality land available um, for the for the foot solar farm. Um, so officers consider the compelling evidence test has been met in this instance. The key differences between uh, this and the previously refused application um, you can see the site area has been reduced. Uh, the grades to land, the quantity of that has been reduced, a portion of that down to from 37% to 22%. The area of land developed, actual developed, is from 90 hectares to down to 23 hectares. There's more uh, planting um, and there's actually a reduction in solar rays due to technological advances um, during the, um, the, part, the recent years. Um, and also sort of more setback distances from the pass itself. Um, so the, the top um, image here shows the previous application. So this is the um, field to the east, which is included in um, this application. And you can show, you can see that the northern area has been omitted from the most recent application. So in terms of the planning balance, um, although there would be some landscape character impacts, um, uh, the loss of arable farming, um, this is obviously for a temporary period of 37 years. Um, there would be some minor harm to the heritage assets during construction operation phase, but officers consider the public benefits outweigh this. Um, there would be a temporary loss of um, best and most um, best and most versatile agricultural land in terms of food production. Um, but given that the um, area, the farm, it only contributes 4.8% of the agricultural, um, of the actual land um, in the possession of the applicant, um, this is considered to be fairly minor. Um, the benefits, obviously, of the renewable energy uh, considerations, um, uh, continued agricultural use being the sheep grazing, that the um, applicant intends to um, utilise and biodiversity enhancements of approximately 141% uh, biodiversity net gain. The key considerations are as far as uh, the principle of development impact upon heritage assets and natural assets, the impact upon agricultural land itself, upon the countryside, the landscape character, cumulative impact of other solar farm developments in the area, residential immunity, highway and public rights of way safety, and the flood risk and drainage. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tom. Um, right. I, I'm not keen that we take questions in view of the hour, but uh, Councillor Bradnam. Chair, thank you. It's just occurred to me um, that I was on the planning committee that refused this on a previous occasion, and I just wanted to check whether, given that I personally, before it occurred to me, was coming to this matter afresh, I just want to take advice on, on whether I can yeah. take part in this. My advice is you can. Thank you very much. Councillor Hales. Oh, sorry, there was one other thing. Councillor Hales, Thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to check. We had a comparison slide of the key differences between the previous application and this one with a diagrammatic plan. And the difference in area is mirrored in the update that Mr. the, the case officer gave us in paragraph one, where it went from 80 hectares down to 23.6. But the visual representation doesn't look like it's dropping from eight, 90 hectares to 23. Do you see what I mean? That's a, that's 
about, let's say, it's, it, sh it should be that this new application is less than one third of the old one, and yet the diagrammatic representation doesn't look like a third of the old one. Mr. Gray, are you still there? Are you able to uh, clarify that? Yes, uh, it's understood that the, the because of being using less solar arrays, um, almost half the amount um, there um, of solar arrays, so the, the actual distances between the solar arrays would be more in this application compared to the previous application. So although it didn't look like it from the proposal, the actual area that's, that's covered, the gaps, would be more well, kind of acknowledging that it doesn't actually look like it's less. Mm -hmm. Could we have some explanation? Is uh, the director can um, explain. I, I, I think, Chair, that the site uh, the, the site area is the same, um, but the actual area of coverage, effectively the surface area of the uh, panels, is uh, 23 hectares rather than 80. The site area is 80 or so. I think is the point. Um, uh, and the, um, as a consequence of the density of the panels being reduced, uh, there is less site coverage. I think. So, Mr. Kelly, are you saying that there are bigger gaps between the panels? I think that's the point. And obviously, the scheme also provides for um, grazing. I'm sure the applicant can actually yeah, clarify just, this point. It was just that the two um, pictures didn't seem to marry up with the two, 90 and 23. It may become clearer. Um, Councillor Hales. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question. Is there an S106 um, agreement attached to this at all, which would benefit the local community, as has happened in other schemes? Thanks. Uh, no, there isn't. There isn't one. Is there consideration for one, then? Uh, Perhaps uh, Stephen can answer that question. <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Tom. Um, uh, I don't. I don't think the. I, I, I don't think the, the proposal attracts an obligation in, in in particular through through policy. Is my understanding at this moment in time, um, uh, and that's why there isn't a section one hundred six obligation for community payments. In fact. More recently, there's been um, judicial reviews challenging the veracity of local community cash payments, effectively in lieu of um, uh, 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 wind generation schemes on the principle that it's not mitigating the impact of the development. And indeed, regardless of the Secretary of State's position uh, on um, uh, that matter, it cannot, the Secretary of State's statement on that cannot replace government policy. I recall reading recent case law in the last few weeks on, on the point. So I don't think it's um, necessary to mitigate the impact of the development uh, and therefore it's not required. So if we were to agree to the recommendation and approve this, would it then not be possible to negotiate section 106 even if it was shown to be benefiting the, the community affected? You couldn't give any weight to a section 106 agreement. Purposes of um, section 106 agreements in accordance with the SIL regulations are to mitigate the impact of a development. Yes. Uh, and the courts have determined that cash payments to local residents is not a mitigation for the planning impact of a development. Even though you, you will be familiar, the Secretary of State has advocated that approach in previous cases. Right. Um, do we have any other? Uh, Councillor Khan. Quick question. Um, it talks about generating and storing electricity, 50 megawatts. Well, megawatts is a power, it's not a quantity. How much actual quantity of electricity will be able to be stored and, and what sort of delay will it uh, use? Was that perhaps a question for more than a day's use? <laughs> perhaps you could hold on to that question and see if you try your luck later, see if you can get that answer. I don't guarantee an answer, but it may be something that can work with. Um, on that basis, I'd like to proceed to our public speakers who have been extremely patient in waiting for us a long debate earlier on, which we're most appreciative. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, Mike Barnard. Uh, Mr. Barnard, you have... Th uh, uh, right, we don't have Mike Barnard then. Uh, what we have instead is, okay, a short statement which I shall read to you. Uh, 
as to what he would have said, and he will certainly not get a chance to ask any questions of this one. Right, I object to this planning application on the grounds that it runs counter to national policy, which for large-scale solar farms clearly states that best and most versatile agricultural land should not be used unless there is the most co compelling evidence that justifies the selection of the site. This is a very high planning hurdle. The consequences of allowing it to be circumvented means that the thrust of government policy for solar generation to be on roofs, brownfield land, and lower grade agricultural land is completely compromised. Why have a national planning policy if you're going to ignore it? If this application is allowed, it will be quoted as a precedent in all future solar farm planning applications on best and most fertile on BMAV. Um, justifying future breaches of the national planning policy. How am I doing on time? Ask yourselves if the applicant has shown the most compelling evidence that this site is vital. The argument that Cambridgeshire has very little low-grade agricultural land and therefore high-grade agricultural land must be used is spurious. If there is little low-grade land in Cambridgeshire, then the potential for large-scale solar farms in the county will be limited and that is perfectly acceptable. Not every council will be able to accommodate every source of renewable energy to the same extent. The lack of alternative sites was justified on a limited appraisal that only looked along the line of the overhead power lines because the only reason this site has been put forward is that commercially it makes more money to be closer to the grid. And so what if there are limited local alternative sites? Renewable energy can be generated nationally, not along one power line. The other argument put forward was the fact that although the land is classified as mainly grade 2 and grade 3A, it's not that good really. But no evidence was provided. This is good arable land, and the current situation in Ukraine shows that food security is just as important as energy security. So no most compelling evidence has been provided and the planning application must fail. In addition, a previous application was unanimously refused by the authority on the grounds of the impact on landscape, amenity and character. Whilst the size of the farm has been reduced slightly, this proposal introduces large shipping container sized energy storage units into a highly attractive landscape. This represents significant industrialization and much greater visual impact um, than the previous scheme. So if that was unacceptable, then this scheme must, by definition, be more so. <coughs> uh, Mr. Barnard says he has been told by the applicant that the scheme is commercially viable without the energy storage. In other words, the electricity provided, produced, flows straight into the grid. The reason for storage is so that the developer can maximize income by supplying electricity when the wholesale price is high. If you are minded to approve, I ask that you do so without the storage element to reduce visual impact. Um, and he concludes, you refused a similar scheme before, and now with much greater visual intrusion, I ask you to make the same decision again. So that is from Mr. Barnard, who wasn't able to stay on and present that in person. Um, we now proceed to Gareth Hawkins, who is the applicant who is here with us today. Thank you. Please, the uh, floor is yours for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Gareth Hawkins. I'm a UK business development manager with Stackcraft. Now, Stackcraft acquired Solar Century in 2021, and that was to add the solar expertise to Stackcraft's, you know, 100 years of hydro, decades of wind and newer technologies like hydrogen and greener grid. Um, and Stackcraft is actually the largest renewable energy producer in Europe at the moment. Um, we're at the forefront of a low energy economy. Uh, we currently have investment plans of something around 670 million in the UK for clean energy projects. Um, and we're just trying you know, the two things really are energy security and uh, trying to achieve 
uh, net zero in carbon. So this project, um, which we call Star Goose, is 50 megawatts of solar coupled with 40 megawatts of batteries. And it's one of the first co-located projects, um, you know, batteries and solar in the UK. Um, these are sort of complementary technologies. It allows us to create electricity from the solar, put it into the batteries, and then put the batteries into the grid because the demands in the UK grid are in early in the morning and early in the evening. Um, it, it, it's just a smart, it's just a smart move. Um, we at Stackcraft, I realise there's no Section 106, but we do do a, a community benefit fund, and we do try and separate ourselves for that. And I understand Cambridgeshire has some kind of facility for dealing with that kind of distribution to worthy causes. Um, the, the sizes of the site, we are much, much smaller than the 2015 application because whereas they use three full fields, we're now using two part fields. Um, we've actually given 26 hectares that we are leasing from the landowner and the 26 hectares are just for biodiversity. Um, so I think there's, if you lose a field, you put the 26 hectares on, the modules have moved from sort of 250 watts to 620 watts. So you, you've reduced the number of panels on site, they're a bit more spread out. And I think that's where you see the, the sort of difference in those hectares. Um, and I think the big thing is, why have we chosen this site? You know, people think it's great agricultural land. If you speak to the farmer, he'll tell you that the yields on these two fields is terrible. Um, the actual farming operation at Childerley is over 4,000 acres. Uh, we're taking less than 4% of that um, entire farm, farming business. Um, Martin Jenkins, the landowner, will tell you that these are his two worst fields. Um, the fact that we can put the solar on it, leave it fallow for 37 years, graze sheep on it in the summer, will probably do more good to the land than trying to farm it and eke every last sort of half a ton of grain out of it for the next 40 years. Um, the other reason we are there is the, the pylon line that crosses the site is the Burwell Little Barford line. Um, it's a 132 line, um, and there's capacity there. Now, it's the reason there was an application in 2015. There's a reason it's an application now. There's always going to be an application to try and do something with that line because grid capacity is very, very difficult to find. Um, what we like I said, we're trying to get to net zero. And I'll wind it up now, sort of, Chairman. I'm trying to get to net zero. And there's no sort of one big switch, one magic bullet. This, to get there, is lots and lots of steps, big steps and small steps. And I think this project is just another step to get to net zero. And I, I hope you can approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I rather let the time go over there. But uh, you've... In, in going on a bit longer, you've answered some of the questions as well that were raised earlier on. Um, we have no representation here from the parish council. Uh, we could, if necessary, take additional questions in addition to those already answered. Uh, okay, I have additional. Sorry? We haven't got to that yet. Um, so we have, I think, some questions the applicant from, uh, forgive me, I'm going to start with Councillor Hales, who was first to ask. If we could keep the questions brief, that would be helpful, given the time today. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just very, very quick. Um, the applicant made, Mr Hawkins, made reference to um, making a contribution to uh, the local grant funding thing in Cambridge here. Is that right? 
Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the Cambridgeshire facility that... The CCF, I think, is the usual one. Cambridge well Community be. Fund, yeah. yeah. I, just, I was just interested to know what kind of level of contribution that might be, particularly from this site. Sorry, it's not material consideration. OK, then we have Councillor Mills. Yeah, just a couple of uh, quick questions on uh, the battery technology. Lithium um, uh, is uh, problematic uh, for fire co uh, causes. The, uh, several instances where um, they've been uh, causing problems and whether you've considered alternative uh, storage such, such as the iron uh, batteries that have just been recently introduced. Um, and then uh, just a, a question on the variance, so 50 megawatt capacity, but what's the variance between summer and winter outputs, please? Sorry, I missed the last part of your question. Yeah, I'm just interested in understanding how, how the capacity of the site will change between uh, summer and winter. Take account of obviously the greater uh, solar. In, in some, I suspect that is probably also not a um, material consideration. I, I suspect probably that one or two of us ought to email you afterwards with, with interesting questions that um, maybe will not enable us to determine its application. Is that fair, Councillor Mills? The, the safety of the, uh, the installation certainly is a uh, Can you deal with the, the safety question that was raised by Councillor Mills in relation to possible fire risk? I'm sorry, I'm not getting the question. I, I, I... Yes, the fire safety. Um, so you can see like a lithium ion battery and you can see how dangerous they are. The technology's moved on from that and the battery's now an inherently safe. Um, I don't know the chemical composition of them, but I know it's not the original lithium ion. Um, and obviously, you can imagine that there's huge safety considerations when we build these sites. We're dealing with 132,000 volts of electricity. We're dealing with quite a large number of batteries. You know, there's, there's fire safety. There's, there's an awful lot of HSSE stuff that goes into this that um, I'm not qualified to discuss, to be honest. Right, thank you. I think Councillor Bradley, you had a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. So, um, Mr. Walkins, the, one of the reasons the previous application was refused was because there wasn't um, sufficient evidence of the sequential test which justifies, which is required in order to justify putting this sort of development in the green belt. And I have the sequential report prepared by Isabel Holland. Uh, and I note in that under two material alterations compared to the previous application, there is again this comparator between the two site, the, the two applications, the 2015 one and the 2021 one. And if um, the officer would kindly put back on the screen that comparison of the key differences, in the material alterations in the sequential site analysis, but not on this one, um, it says that the original area of land proposed by the panels in the 2015 application was 90.78 hectares and the area of land used by panels in the 2021 proposal is 62.93 hectares whereas here it says 90 and 23 and, and it reiterates my question earlier on um, that the areas that are being displayed on our screen here the, the reduction in area, part of the reason we, that was a reason for our objection was because of the huge impact on three public rights of way which run across the southern boundary, the eastern boundary, and um, close by. And, and yet this current application, although it purports to be a third of the size, it still covers pretty much a, a very similar area compared to the previous application and, and I just don't understand how those numbers work out I, I just wondered sure, if you sure, could sorry could we ask I have asked a question of Mr. Hawkins 
Yeah, um, if you look at the figure for 23 hectares against the figure for 62 hectares, the 62 hectares would be the land encompassed by the fence line. The 23 hectares is the developed land, which would be the net footprint of the equipment, the roads, um, the HV compound, the transformers, and the footprint they take up, which is a measure that's normally used in a planning application for, for a built environment like this. Right, are you satisfied with that answer? Um, I hear the answer. Okay, uh, that's the best we can hope for, I think. Uh, then we have a question from Councillor Khan. I come back again to the issue of power and, uh, and capacity of the batteries. Uh, you said batteries have 40 megawatts. Uh, that's a power. So is that the power they're giving out? How much are they going to store and how much time? Um, I mean, there's a great use in me out of chance uh, only discharge your renewable energy, which is variable in its uh, generation, into a, a, a very useful time when it's peak, uh, in other words, covering peaking. But uh, I want to know exactly how effective that will be, um, because uh, 40 megawatts tells me just what you can generate, not how much you're going to store and how long it's going to last for. Yeah, I think it's a difficult one because battery financial modelling is quite complex. And what you might do is start off with 20 megawatts for two hours, and then you may convert that at a later date to 40 megawatts for an hour. And it all runs around whether you're doing frequency response or arbitrage or just play in the markets. Um, it's a difficult thing to predict. And what we're applying for planning permission for is essentially the number of containers rather than the, the amount of power. But the usefulness of it is to us, from our point of view, is the extent to which you can actually um, provide electricity at the most useful time. So it's useful to know that. Um, from the, uh, um, so you're basically saying it's 40 megawatt hours that it stores, or you're, how much does it actually store? Yeah, essentially 40 megawatt hours, but it's 40 megawatts for one hour. So you, what I'm saying is you could use it for 20 megawatts for two hours. Councillor Khan, do you note that answer? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Right, um, I think that is, thank you very much, not only for your presentation, for your patience, and for answering our questions in such detail. And we will, in a moment, start to consider this. We have one more speaker to hear. Um, so thank you. Um, we have no representation from the parish councils, but I, I note that the, you'll see section 13, page 125. Ride Drayton supports the application, but they want to limit the development to the scale proposed. Bar Hill will take the same view. Children, there's no parish council, no comments received there. Boxworth broadly support the application. But in any case, I'm glad to say we have also the local member online who will no doubt be able to uh, tell us about local views. Councillor Nick Wright, again, thank you for your patience. And uh, you know the, the rules. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. And before I start, can I declare a non-pecuniary interest uh, that in that I know the landowners and that I attended the open meeting that Boxworth Parish Council threw for the developers to speak. Um, so let me note that before I start. Um, I think this is a really difficult decision for the planning committee. Um, like all these, there's a difficult balance here between the need for power and power security and the need for food and food security. The report deals very well with the power issues uh, and we've heard a lot about that. I'm more concerned with the loss of agricultural land, 80 hectares. Make no bones about this. This is taking 80 hectares out of agricultural production. We saw some pictures of the land, which um, contrary to the landowners' views, showed some very good high quality crops on the land uh, at the time they were photographed. Um, we need to be aware that this land is best found, you know, it is best and most versatile of 
some of our most agricultural land, it's, it's the best quality. And it is the best quality grade one and, sorry, grade two and grade three, A and B, for growing wheat on. It is its particular importance. You know, it's not grade one because that's vegetables and that sort of thing. This is the, some of the best land we have in South Cams. And the, the reason this site is chosen is because the power line goes across the site and it doesn't cost so much, you know, to, to get the power to the, the grid, you know, the national grid. If, you know, we don't have to have this site because we have a national grid, we have a lot of land in this country of lower grades that could be used for this. And the power bought to us by the national grid. Um, food security, I've said, is so important to us. Within a 50 mile radius of Cambridge, we produce at least 50% of the wheat that's needed for U the UK. Um, and, I, you know, we need to think in South Cams already, we've lost 600 acres, 600 hectares to the A14 upgrade. We're going to lose a lot more than that to the A428 upgrade. And that's before we even think of the Oxford Cambridge arc and the amount of land lost there. And when you put house building on top of that, you see the large amounts of agricultural land we're consistently losing in the breadbasket of this country. Land is a diminishing resource that we have. And as I said before, this application is 80 hectares. Um, we need to look at what that 80 hectares can produce. And it is, it is for, if you look at the average human consumption of wheat, it's about 150 pounds a year um, would be sufficient. So on my rough calculations, um, I would say that we would um, we would be losing, you know, enough wheat off that 80 hectares to feed 10 and a half thousand people. Um, so it's again this need, the balance between food and the need for energy. And also, I would like to add that, you know, we have seen energy prices over the crisis months that we've had recently increase substantially, but we've also seen food prices increase substantially and the price That's of wheat. All right. could, you, um, could you start to wrap up, please? I'm getting there, I'm getting there, but I'm aware you've been slightly generous to some of the others. I so... think I might have noticed. Yes, fair enough. <laughs> so the price of wheat has doubled since last harvest. And that hasn't reached the food chain probably yet. Um, and the reason it's doubled is because it's in short supply. Russia and Ukraine produce 25% of the world's exportable wheat. And we need to import 40% of our food into this country because we can only produce 60% among our farming stock. So my concerns are the loss of agricultural land, there's nothing in this for the local community on offer, apart from a vague promise. Um, but I would like to see something as the government are recommending for the local community. It's against national policy on this high quality land. It's in the green belt, which is there to protect agricultural land. And I would like the committee to take note of those comments. Thank you very much, everyone. Right, thank you very much. Um, we have, of course, some questions. Uh, and if you could keep it brief, that would be appreciated. Uh, who is we starting with? Councillor Hawkins, yeah. I think that pin's a car. Yeah, it's, not, it's not a question. Ah, I, I'm sorry, I made the mistake. I, I had a thought that uh, the Councillor Wright was the local member. My sincere apologies. Um, Councillor Hawkins, as the local member, do you want to uh, start the debate? And would you like to uh, ask any questions of your neighbouring member? <laughs> this kind I, of... I am a local member for Boxwood. Ah, you see. <laughs> 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 
So we have two local members. We often have this. Um, did, did you want to ask any questions as well? Or we'll come to you as local member in a minute. Can we just take questions to this local member then? Um, Councillor Khan. Actually, all I wanted to comment is to uh, felicit uh, Councillor Wright for attending, who has been a long time member. This will be his last appearance at committee, and I want to thank him for his service over the years. Yes. Quite right. Um, so, uh, Councillor Toomey Hawkins, would you like to kick off the debate as, as local member? Actually, before you do that, can I just uh, make a personal statement, which is that um, I am aware that the consortium of which I'm a member does occasionally give advice to farmers on renewable energy issues. I'm not currently involved in that, and indeed I don't think we have any projects underway, uh, and therefore I propose to carry on in the chair, but I will not vote. Um, so, Councillor Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And three, I just want to say, yeah, thank you to um, Councillor Nick Wright uh, for his views. And I appreciate his concerns about the amount of land um, and uh, production of wheat that might be lost. But I'm coming to this from the opposite viewpoint. And actually, <laughs> I don't have concerns about that. Um, I will be supporting this. Uh, because for me, looking at the information that we've got, um, the land that's been used for this is, as I understand it, about 5% of uh, Childerly Farm Estate, really. Um, so it's not that big a loss. Now, I'm not sure how the, um, the quality of the production is less than average, but that's 